Introduction to 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, An Underwater Tour of the World by Jules Verne, published 1871. This recording is the English translation by Frederick P. Walter, published 1991, containing the unabridged text from the original French and offered up into the public domain. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. For those wishing to skip this introduction and the description of the units of measure added by the translator, please proceed to Chapter 1. Editor's Note on Verne's Title the French title of this novel is accurately translated as 20,000 Leagues Under the Seas, rather than The Sea, as with many English editions. Verne's novel features a tour of the major oceans, and the term leagues in its title is used as a measure not of depth, but of distance. Introduction by F. P. Walter, University of Houston the deepest parts of the ocean are totally unknown to us, admits Professor Aranax early in this novel. What goes on in those distant depths? What creatures inhabit or could inhabit those regions twelve or fifteen miles beneath the surface of the water? It's almost beyond conjecture. Jules Verne, 1828-1905, through 1905, published the French equivalents of these words in 1869, and little has changed since. 126 years later, a time cover story on deep-sea exploration made much the same admission. We know more about Mars than we know about the oceans. This reality begins to explain the dark power and otherworldly fascination of 20,000 leagues under the seas. Born in the French river town of Nantes, Verne had a lifelong passion for the sea. First as a Paris stockbroker, later as a celebrated author and yachtsman, he went on frequent voyages to Britain, America, the Mediterranean. But the specific stimulus for this novel was an 1865 fan letter from a fellow writer, Madame George Sand. She praised Verne's two early novels, Five Weeks in a Balloon, 1863, and Journey to the Center of the Earth, 1864, then added, Soon I hope you'll take us to the ocean depths, your characters traveling in diving equipment perfected by your science and your imagination. Thus inspired, Verne created one of literature's great rebels, a freedom fighter who plunged beneath the waves to wage a unique form of guerrilla warfare. Initially, Verne's narrative was influenced by the 1863 uprising of Poland against Tsarist Russia. The Poles were quashed with a violence that appalled not only Verne, but all of Europe. As originally conceived, Verne's Captain Nemo was a Polish nobleman whose entire family had been slaughtered by Russian troops. Nemo builds a fabulous futuristic submarine, the Nautilus, then conducts an underwater campaign of vengeance against his imperialist oppressor. But in the 1860s, France had to treat the Tsar as an ally, and Verne's publisher, Pierre Hetzel, pronounced the book unprintable. Verne reworked its political content, devising new nationalities for Nemo and his great enemy, information revealed only in a later novel, The Mysterious Island, 1875. In the present work, Nemo's background remains a dark secret. In all, the novel had a difficult gestation. Verne and Hetzel were in constant conflict, and the book went through multiple drafts. Struggles reflected in its several working titles over the period 1865 through 69. Early on, it was variously called Voyage Under the Waters, 25,000 Leagues Under the Waters, 20,000 Leagues Under the Waters, and 1,000 Leagues Under the Oceans. Verne is often dubbed, in Isaac Asimov's phrase, the world's first science fiction writer. And it's true. Many of his 60-odd books do anticipate future events and technologies. From the Earth to the Moon, 1865, and Hector Servadac, 1877, deal in space travel, while Journey to the Center of the Earth features travel to the Earth's core. But with Verne, the operative word is travel, and some of his best-known titles don't really qualify as sci-fi. 
around the world in eighty days eighteen seventy two and michael strogoff eighteen seventy six are closer to travelogues adventure yarns in faraway places these observations partly apply here the subtitle of the present book is an underwater tour of the world so in good travelogue style the nautilus's exploits supply an episodic storyline shark attacks giant squid cannibals hurricanes whale hunts and other rip-roaring adventures erupt almost at random yet this loose structure gives the novel an air of documentary realism What's more, Verne adds backbone to the action by developing three recurring motifs, the deepening mystery of Nemo's past life and future intentions, the mounting tension between Nemo and the hot-tempered harpooner Ned Land, and Ned's ongoing schemes to escape from the Nautilus. These unifying threads tighten the narrative and accelerate its momentum. Other subtleties occur inside each episode, the textures sparkling with wit, information, and insight. Verne regards the sea from many angles. In the domain of marine biology, he gives us thumbnail sketches of fish, seashells, coral, sometimes in great catalogs that swirl past like musical cascades. In the realm of geology, he studied volcanoes, literally inside and out. In the world of commerce, he celebrates the high-energy entrepreneurs who lay the Atlantic cable or dig the Suez Canal. And Verne's marine engineering proves especially authoritative. His specifications for an open-sea submarine and a self-containing diving suit were decades before their time, yet modern technology bears them out triumphantly. True, today's scientists know a few things he didn't. The South Pole isn't at the water's edge, but far inland. Sharks don't flip over before attacking. Giant squids sport ten tentacles, not eight. Sperm whales don't prey on their whalebone cousins. This notwithstanding, Verne furnishes the most evocative portrayal of the ocean depths before the arrival of Jacques Cousteau and Technicolor film. Lastly, the book has stature as a novel of character. Even the supporting cast is shrewdly drawn. Professor Aranax, the career scientist caught in an ethical conflict. Conseil, the compulsive classifier who supplies humorous taglines for Verne's fast facts. The harpooner Ned Land, a creature of constant appetites, man as heroic animal. But much of the novel's brooding power comes from Captain Nemo, inventor, musician, renaissance genius. He's a trailblazing creation, the prototype not only for countless renegade scientists in popular fiction, but even for such varied figures as Sherlock Holmes or Wolf Larsen. However, Verne gives his hero's brilliance and benevolence a dark underside, the man's obsessive hate for his old enemy. This compulsion leads Nemo into ugly contradictions. He is a fighter for freedom, yet all who board his ship are imprisoned there for good. He works to save lives, both human and animal, yet he himself creates a holocaust. He detests imperialism, yet he lays personal claim to the South Pole. And in this last action he falls into the classic sin of pride. He is swiftly punished. The Nautilus nearly perishes in the Antarctic, and Nemo sinks into a growing depression. Like Shakespeare's King Lear, he courts death and madness in a great storm, then commits mass murder, collapses in catatonic paralysis, and suicidally runs his ship into the ocean's most dangerous whirlpool. Hate swallows him whole. For many, then, this book has been a source of fascination, surely one of the most influential novels ever written, an inspiration for such scientists and discoverers as engineer Simon Lake, oceanographer William B.B., polar traveler Sir Ernest Shackleton. Likewise, Dr. Robert D. Ballard, finder of the sunken Titanic, confesses that this was his favorite book as a teenager, and Cousteau himself, most renowned of marine explorers, called it his shipboard Bible. The present translation is a faithful yet communicative rendering of the original French texts, published in Paris by J. Hetzel A.C., the hardcover first edition issued in the autumn of 1871, 
collated with the soft cover editions of the first and second parts issued separately in the autumn of 1869 and the summer of 1870 although prior english versions have often been heavily abridged this new translation is complete to the smallest substantive detail because as that time cover story suggests we still haven't caught up with verne even in our era of satellite dishes and video games the seas keep their secrets we've seen progress in sonar torpedoes and other belligerent machinery but sailors and scientists to say nothing of tourists have yet to voyage in a submarine with the luxury and efficiency of the nautilus end of introduction units of measure cable length in verne's context 600 feet centigrade zero degrees centigrade equals freezing water 37 degrees centigrade equals human body temperature 100 degrees centigrade equals boiling water fathom six feet gram roughly one twenty eighth of an ounce milligram roughly one twenty eight thousandth of an ounce kilogram or kilo roughly two point two pounds hectare roughly two point five acres not 1.15 miles per hour league in verne's context 2.16 miles liter roughly one quart meter roughly one yard three inches millimeter roughly one twenty-fifth of an inch centimeter roughly two-fifths of an inch decimeter roughly four inches kilometer roughly six-tenths of a mile Myriameter, roughly 6.2 miles. Ton, metric, roughly 2,200 pounds. End of units of measure. End of section. Part 1, Chapter 1 of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, An Underwater Tour of the World by Jules Verne, translated from the French by F. P. Walter read by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana this librivox recording is in the public domain first part chapter one a runaway reef the year eighteen sixty six was marked by a bizarre development an unexplained and downright inexplicable phenomenon that surely no one has forgotten without getting into those rumors that upset civilians in the seaports and deranged the public mind even far inland it must be said that professional seamen were especially alarmed traders ship owners captains of vessels skippers the master mariners from europe and america naval officers from every country and at their heels the various national governments on these two continents were all extremely disturbed by the business in essence over a period of time several ships had encountered an enormous thing at sea a long spindle-shaped object sometimes giving off a phosphorescent glow infinitely bigger and faster than any whale the relevant data on this apparition as recorded in various log books agreed pretty closely as to the structure of the object or creature in question its unprecedented speed of movement its startling locomotive power and the unique vitality with which it seemed to be gifted if it was cetacean it exceeded in bulk any whale previously classified by science no naturalist neither cuvier nor lacepede neither professor de Merrill nor professor de quatrefage would have accepted the existence of such a monster sight unseen specifically unseen by their own scientific eyes striking an average of observations taken at different times rejecting those timid estimates that gave the object a length of two hundred feet and ignoring those exaggerated views that saw it as a mile wide and three long you could still assert that this phenomenal creature greatly exceeded the dimensions of anything then known to ichthyologists if it existed at all now then it did exist this was an undeniable fact and since the human mind dotes on objects of wonder you can understand the world-wide excitement caused by this unearthly apparition as for relegating it to the realm of fiction that charge had to be dropped 
in essence on july 20 1866 the steamer governor higginson from the calcutta and burnash steam navigation company encountered this moving mass five miles off the eastern shores of australia captain baker at first thought he was in the presence of an unknown reef he was even about to fix its exact location when two water spouts shot out of this inexplicable object and sprang hissing into the air some one hundred and fifty feet so unless this reef was subject to the intermittent eruptions of a geyser the governor higginson had fair and honest dealings with some aquatic mammal until then unknown that could spurt from its blowholes water spouts mixed with air and steam similar events were likewise observed in pacific seas on july twenty third of the same year by the christopher columbus from the west india and pacific steam navigation company consequently this extraordinary cetacean could transfer itself from one locality to another with startling swiftness since within an interval of just three days the governor higginson and the christopher columbus had observed it at two positions on the charts separated by a distance of more than seven hundred nautical leagues fifteen days later and two thousand leagues farther the Helvetia from the Campania Nationale and the Shannon from the Royal Mail Line, running on opposite tacks in that part of the Atlantic lying between the United States and Europe, respectively signaled each other that the monster had been sighted in latitude 42 degrees 15 minutes north and longitude 60 degrees 35 minutes west of the meridian of Greenwich from their simultaneous observations they were able to estimate the mammal's minimum length at more than three hundred and fifty english feet author's note about one hundred and six meters this was because both the shannon and the helvetia were of smaller dimensions although each measured one hundred meters stem to stern now then the biggest whales those roarquail whales that frequent the waterways of the Aleutian islands have never exceeded a length of fifty-six meters if they reach even that one after another reports arrived that would profoundly affect public opinion new observations taken by the transatlantic liner perrier the inman lines etna running afoul of the monster an official report drawn up by officers on the french frigate normandy dead earnest reckonings obtained by the general staff of commodore fitz james aboard the lord clyde in light-hearted countries people joked about this phenomenon but such serious practical countries as england america and germany were deeply concerned in every big city the monster was the latest rage they sang about it in the coffee-houses they ridiculed it in the newspapers they dramatized it in the theatres the tabloids found it a fine opportunity for hatching all sorts of hoaxes in those newspapers short of copy you saw the reappearance of every gigantic imaginary creature from moby dick that dreadful white whale from the high arctic regions to the stupendous kraken whose tentacles could entwine a five hundred ton craft and drag it into the ocean depths they even reprinted reports from ancient times the views of aristotle and pliny accepting the existence of such monsters then the norwegian stories of bishop pantopidan the narratives of paul egide and finally the reports of captain harrington whose good faith is above suspicion in which he claims he saw while aboard the castilian in 1857 one of those enormous serpents that until then had frequented only the seas of france's old extremist newspaper the constitutionalist an interminable debate then broke out between believers and skeptics in the scholarly societies and scientific journals the monster question inflamed all minds during this memorable campaign journalists making a profession of science battled with those making a profession of wit spilling waves of ink and some of them even two or three drops of blood since they went from sea serpents to the most offensive personal remarks for six months the war seesawed with inexhaustible zest the popular press took pot shots at feature articles from the geographic institute of brazil the royal academy of science in berlin the british association the smithsonian institution in washington d c at discussions in the indian archipelago 
in Cosmos, published by Father Moigno, in Peterman's Mituel Lungen, German for Bulletin, and at Scientific Chronicles in the great French and foreign newspapers. When the monster's detractors cited a saying by the botanist Linnaeus that nature doesn't make leaps, witty writers in the popular periodicals parodied it, maintaining in essence that nature doesn't make lunatics and ordering their contemporaries never to give the lie to nature by believing in krakens sea serpents moby dicks and other all-out efforts from drunken seamen finally in a much feared satirical journal an article by its most popular columnist finished off the monster for good spurning it in the style of hippolytus repulsing the amorous advances of his stepmother phaedra and giving the creature its quietus amid a universal burst of laughter wit had defeated science during the first months of the year eighteen sixty seven the question seemed to be buried and it didn't seem due for resurrection when new facts were brought to the public's attention but now it was no longer an issue of a scientific problem to be solved but a quite real and serious danger to be avoided the question took an entirely new turn the monster again became an islet rock or reef but a runaway reef unfixed and elusive on march fifth eighteen sixty seven the moravian from the montreal ocean company lying during the night in latitude twenty seven degrees thirty minutes and longitude seventy two degrees fifteen minutes ran its starboard quarter afoul of a rock marked on no charts of these waterways under the combined efforts of wind and four hundred horsepower steam it was traveling at a speed of thirteen knots without the high quality of its hull the moravian would surely have split open from this collision and gone down together with those two hundred and thirty seven passengers it was bringing back from canada this accident happened around five o'clock in the morning just as day was beginning to break the officers on watch rushed to the craft's stern they examined the ocean with most scrupulous care they saw nothing except a strong eddy breaking three cable lengths out as if those sheets of water had been violently churned the site's exact bearings were taken and the moravian continued on course apparently undamaged had it run afoul of an underwater rock or the wreckage of some enormous derelict ship they were unable to say but when they examined its undersides in the service yard they discovered that part of its keel had been smashed this occurrence extremely serious in itself might perhaps have been forgotten like so many others if three weeks later it hadn't been reenacted under identical conditions only thanks to the nationality of the ship victimized by this new ramming and thanks to the reputation of the company to which this ship belonged the event caused an immense uproar no one is unaware of the name of that famous english ship owner cunard in 1840 this shrewd industrialist founded a postal service between liverpool and halifax featuring three wooden ships with four hundred horsepower paddle wheels and a burden of one thousand one hundred and sixty two metric tons eight years later the company's assets were increased by four six hundred and fifty horsepower ships at one thousand eight hundred and twenty metric tons and in two more years by two other vessels of still greater power and tonnage in eighteen fifty three the cunard company whose mail carrying charter had just been renewed successively added to its assets the arabia the persia the china the scotia the java and the russia all ships of top speed and after the great eastern the biggest ever to plow the seas so in eighteen sixty seven this company owned twelve ships eight with paddle wheels and four with propellers if i give these highly condensed details it is so everyone can fully understand the importance of this maritime transportation company known the world over for its shrewd management no transoceanic navigational undertaking has been conducted with more ability no business dealings have been crowned with greater success in twenty-six years cunard ships have made two thousand atlantic crossings without so much as a voyage cancelled a delay recorded a man a craft or even a letter lost 
accordingly despite strong competition from france passengers still choose the cunard line in preference to all others as can be seen in a recent survey of official documents given this no one will be astonished at the uproar provoked by this accident involving one of its finest steamers on april thirteenth eighteen sixty seven with a smooth sea and a moderate breeze the scotia lay in longitude fifteen degrees twelve minutes and latitude forty five degrees thirty seven minutes it was traveling at a speed of thirteen point four three knots under the thrust of its thousand horsepower engines its paddle wheels were churning the sea with perfect steadiness it was then drawing six point seven meters of water and displacing six thousand six hundred and twenty four cubic meters at four seventeen in the afternoon during a high tea for passengers gathered in the main lounge a collision occurred scarcely noticeable on the whole affecting the scotia's hull in that quarter a little astern of its port paddle wheel the scotia hadn't run afoul of something it had been fouled and by a cutting or perforating instrument rather than a blunt one this encounter seemed so minor that nobody on board would have been disturbed by it had it not been for the shouts of crewmen in the hold who climbed on deck yelling we're sinking we're sinking at first the passengers were quite frightened but captain anderson hastened to reassure them in fact there could be no immediate danger divided into seven compartments by watertight bulkheads the scotia could brave any leak with impunity captain anderson immediately made his way into the hold he discovered that the fifth compartment had been invaded by the sea and the speed of this invasion proved that the leak was considerable fortunately this compartment didn't contain the boilers because their furnaces would have been abruptly extinguished captain anderson called an immediate halt and one of his sailors dived down to assess the damage within moments they had located a hole two meters in width on the steamer's underside such a leak could not be patched and with its paddle wheels half swamped the scotia had no choice but to continue its voyage by then it lay three hundred miles from cape clear and after three days of delay that filled liverpool with acute anxiety it entered the company docks the engineers then proceeded to inspect the scotia which had been put in dry dock they couldn't believe their eyes two and a half meters below its water line there gaped a symmetrical gash in the shape of an isosceles triangle this breach in the sheet iron was so perfectly formed no punch could have done a cleaner job of it consequently it must have been produced by a perforating tool of uncommon toughness plus after being launched with prodigious power and then piercing four centimeters of sheet iron this tool had needed to withdraw itself by a backward motion truly inexplicable this was the last straw and it resulted in arousing public passions all over again indeed from this moment on any maritime casualty without an established cause was charged to the monster's account this outrageous animal had to shoulder responsibility for all derelict vessels whose numbers are unfortunately considerable since out of those three thousand ships whose losses are recorded annually at the marine insurance bureau the figure for steam or sailing ships supposedly lost with all hands in the absence of any news amounts to at least two hundred now then justly or unjustly it was the monster who stood accused of their disappearance and since thanks to it travel between the various continents had become more and more dangerous the public spoke up and demanded straight out that at all cost the seas be purged of this fearsome cetacean End of chapter 1part one chapter two of twenty thousand leagues under the sea an underwater tour of the world by jules verne this librivox recording is in the public domain read by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana chapter two the pros and cons during the period in which these developments were occurring i had returned from a scientific undertaking organized to explore the nebraska badlands in the united states 
in my capacity as assistant professor at the paris museum of natural history i had been attached to this expedition by the french government after spending six months in nebraska i arrived in new york laden with valuable collections near the end of march my departure for france was set for early may in the meantime then i was busy classifying my mineralogical botanical and zoological treasures when that incident took place with the scotia i was perfectly abreast of this question which was the big news of the day and how could i not have been I had read and reread every American and European newspaper without being any farther along. This mystery puzzled me. Finding it impossible to form any views, I drifted from one extreme to the other. Something was out there, that much was certain, and any doubting Thomas was invited to place his finger on the Scotia's wound. When I arrived in New York, the question was at the boiling point. The hypothesis of the drifting islet, or the elusive reef, put forward by people not quite in their right minds, was completely eliminated. And indeed, unless this reef had an engine in its belly, how could it move about with such prodigious speed? Also discredited was the idea of a floating hull, or some other enormous wreckage, and again because of this speed of movement. So only two possible solutions to the question were left creating two very distinct groups of supporters. On one side, those favoring a monster of colossal strength. On the other, those favoring an underwater boat of tremendous motor power. Now then, although the latter hypothesis was completely admissible, it couldn't stand up to inquiries conducted in both the New World and the Old. That a private individual had such a mechanism at his disposal was less than probable. Where and when had he built it, and how could he have built it in secret? Only some government could own such an engine of destruction, and in these disaster-filled times, when men taxed their ingenuity to build increasingly powerful, aggressive weapons, it was possible that, unknown to the rest of the world, some nation could have been testing such a fearsome machine. The Chassapot rifle led to the torpedo, and the torpedo has led to this underwater battering ram, which in turn will lead to the world putting its foot down. At least I hope it will. But this hypothesis of a war machine collapsed in the face of formal denials from the various governments. Since the public interest was at stake and transoceanic travel was suffering, the sincerity of these governments could not be doubted. Besides, how could the assembly of this underwater boat have escaped public notice? Keeping a secret under such circumstances would be difficult enough for an individual, and certainly impossible for a nation whose every move is under constant surveillance by rival powers. So, after inquiries conducted in England, France, Russia, Prussia, Spain, Italy, America, and even Turkey, the hypothesis of an underwater monitor was ultimately rejected. And so the monster surfaced again, despite the endless witticisms heaped on it by the popular press, and the human imagination soon got caught up in the most ridiculous ichthyological fantasies. After I arrived in New York, several people did me the honor of consulting me on the phenomenon in question. In France, I had published a two-volume work, in quarto, entitled The Mysteries of the Great Ocean Depths. Well received in scholarly circles, this book had established me as a specialist in this pretty obscure field of natural history. My views were in demand. As long as I could deny the reality of the business, I confined myself to a flat no comment. But soon, pinned to the wall, I had to explain myself straight out. And in this vein, the Honorable Pierre Aranax, professor at the Paris Museum, was summoned by the New York Herald to formulate his views, no matter what. I complied. Since I could no longer hold my tongue, I let it wag. I discussed the question in its every aspect, both political and scientific, and this is an excerpt from the well-padded article I published in the issue of April 30th. Therefore, I wrote, after examining these different hypotheses one by one, we are forced, every other supposition having been refuted, to accept the existence of an extremely powerful marine animal. 
the deepest parts of the ocean are totally unknown to us no soundings have been able to reach them what goes on in those distant depths what creatures inhabit or could inhabit those regions twelve or fifteen miles beneath the surface of the water what is the constitution of these animals it's almost beyond conjecture however the solution to this problem submitted to me can take the form of a choice between two alternatives either we know every variety of creature populating our planet or we do not if we do not know every one of them if nature still keeps ichthyological secrets from us nothing is more admissible than to accept the existence of fish or cetaceans of new species or even new genera animals with basically cast-iron constitution that inhabit strata beyond the reach of our soundings and which some development or other an urge or whim if you prefer can bring to the upper level of the ocean for long intervals if on the other hand we do know every living species we must look for the animal in question among those marine creatures already catalogued and in this event i would be inclined to accept the existence of a giant narwhal the common narwhal or sea unicorn often reaches a length of sixty feet increase its dimensions five-fold or even tenfold then give this cetacean a strength in proportion to its size while enlarging its offensive weapons and you have the animal we are looking for it would have the proportions determined by the officers of the shannon the instrument needed to perforate the scotia and the power to pierce a steamer's hull in essence the narwhal is armed with a sort of ivory sword or lance as certain naturalists have expressed it it's a king-sized tooth as hard as steel some of these teeth have been found buried in the bodies of baleen whales which the narwhal attacks with invariable success others have been wrenched not without difficulty from the undersides of vessels that narwhals have pierced clean through as a gimlet pierces a wine barrel the museum at the faculty of medicine in paris owns one of these tusks with a length of two point two five meters and a width at its base of forty eight centimeters all right then imagine this weapon to be ten times stronger and the animal ten times more powerful launch it at a speed of twenty miles per hour multiply its mass times its velocity and you get just the collision we need to cause the specified catastrophe so until information becomes more abundant i plumb for the sea unicorn of colossal dimensions no longer armed with a mere lance but with an actual spur like ironclad frigates or those warships called rams whose mass and motor power it would possess simultaneously this inexplicable phenomenon is thus explained away unless it's something else entirely which despite everything that has been cited studied explored and experienced is still possible these last words were cowardly of me but as far as i could i wanted to protect my professorial dignity and not lay myself open to laughter from the americans who when they do laugh laugh raucously i had left myself a loophole yet deep down i had accepted the existence of the monster my article was hotly debated causing a fine old uproar it rallied a number of supporters moreover the solution it proposed allowed for free play of the imagination the human mind enjoys impressive visions of unearthly creatures now then the sea is precisely their best medium the only setting suitable for the breeding and growing of such giants next to which such land animals as elephants or rhinoceroses are mere dwarves the liquid masses support the largest known species of mammals and perhaps conceal mollusks of incomparable size or crustaceans too frightful to contemplate such as one hundred meter lobsters or crabs weighing two hundred metric tons why not formerly in prehistoric days land animals quadrupeds apes reptiles birds were built on a gigantic scale our creator cast them using a colossal mold that time has gradually made smaller with its untold depths couldn't the sea keep alive such huge specimens of life from another age this sea that never changes while the land masses undergo almost continuous alteration couldn't the heart of the ocean hide the last remaining varieties of these titanic species for whom years are centuries and centuries millennia 
but i mustn't let these fantasies run away with me enough of these fairy tales that time has changed for me into harsh realities i repeat opinion had crystallized as to the nature of this phenomenon and the public accepted without argument the existence of a prodigious creature that had nothing in common with the fabled sea serpent yet if some saw it purely as a scientific problem to be solved more practical people especially in america and england were determined to purge the ocean of this daunting monster to ensure the safety of transoceanic travel the industrial and commercial newspapers dealt with the question chiefly from this viewpoint the shipping and mercantile gazette the lloyd's list france's packet boat and maritime and colonial review all the rags devoted to insurance companies who threatened to raise their premium rates were unanimous on this point public opinion being pronounced the states of the union were the first in the field in new york preparations were under way for an expedition designed to chase this narwhal a high-speed frigate the abraham lincoln was fitted out for putting to sea as soon as possible the naval arsenals were unlocked for commander farragut who pressed energetically forward with the arming of his frigate but as it always happens just when a decision had been made to chase the monster the monster put in no further appearances for two months nobody heard a word about it not a single ship encountered it apparently the unicorn had gotten wise to these plots being woven around it people were constantly babbling about the creature even by the atlantic cable accordingly the wags claimed that this slippery rascal had waylaid some passing telegram and was making the most of it so the frigate was equipped for a far-off voyage and armed with fearsome fishing gear but nobody knew where to steer it and impatience grew until on june the second word came that the tampico a steamer on the san francisco line sailing from california to shanghai had sighted the animal again three weeks before in the northerly seas of the pacific this news caused intense excitement not even a twenty-four hour breather was granted to commander farragut his provisions were loaded on board his coal bunkers were overflowing not a crewman was missing from his post to cast off he needed only to fire and stoke his furnaces half a day's delay would have been unforgivable but commander farragut wanted nothing more than to go forth i received a letter three hours before the abraham lincoln left its brooklyn pier the letter read as follows pierre aranax professor at the paris museum fifth avenue hotel new york sir if you would like to join the expedition on the abraham lincoln the government of the union will be pleased to regard you as france's representative in this undertaking commander farragut has a cabin at your disposal very cordially yours j b hobson secretary of the navy author's note a pier is a type of wharf expressly set aside for an individual vessel end of chapter two part one chapter three of twenty thousand leagues under the sea an underwater tour of the world by jules verne this librivox recording is in the public domain read by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana chapter three as master wishes three seconds before the arrival of j b hobson's letter i no more dreamed of chasing the unicorn than of trying for the northwest passage three seconds after reading this letter from the honorable secretary of the navy i understood at last that my true vocation my sole purpose in life was to hunt down this disturbing monster and rid the world of it even so i had just returned from an arduous journey exhausted and badly needing a rest i wanted nothing more than to see my country again my friends my modest quarters by the botanical gardens my dearly beloved collections but now nothing could hold me back i forgot everything else and without another thought of exhaustion friends or collections i accepted the american government's offer besides i mused all roads lead home to europe and our unicorn may be gracious enough to take me toward the coast of france that fine animal may even let itself be captured in european seas as a personal favor to me and i'll bring back to the museum of natural history at least half a meter of its ivory lance 
but in the meantime i would have to look for this narwhale in the northern pacific ocean which meant returning to france by way of the antipodes conseil i called in an impatient voice conseil was my manservant a devoted lad who went with me on all of my journeys a gallant flemish boy whom i genuinely liked and who returned the compliment a born stoic punctilious on principle habitually hard-working rarely startled by life's surprises very skillful with his hands efficient in his every duty and despite his having a name that means counsel never giving advice not even the unsolicited kind from rubbing shoulders with scientists in our little universe by the botanical gardens the boy had come to know a thing or two in conseil i had a seasoned specialist in biological classification an enthusiast who could run with acrobatic agility up and down the whole ladder of branches groups classes subclasses orders families genera subgenera species and varieties but there his science came to a halt classifying was everything to him so he knew nothing else well versed in the theory of classification he was poorly versed in its practical application and i doubt that he could tell a sperm whale from a baleen whale and yet what a fine gallant lad for the past ten years conseil had gone with me wherever science beckoned not once did he comment on the length or the hardships of the journey never did he object to buckling up his suitcase for any country whatever china or the congo no matter how far off it was he went here there and everywhere in perfect contentment moreover he enjoyed excellent health that defied all ailments owned solid muscles but hadn't a nerve in him not a sign of nerves the mental type i mean the lad was thirty years old and his age to that of his employer was as fifteen is to twenty please forgive me for this underhanded way of admitting that i had turned forty but conseil had one flaw he was a fanatic on formality and he only addressed me in the third person to the point where it got tiresome conseil i repeated while feverishly beginning my preparations for departure to be sure i had confidence in this devoted lad ordinarily i never asked whether or not it suited him to go with me on my journeys but this time an expedition was at issue that could drag on indefinitely a hazardous undertaking whose purpose was to hunt an animal that could sink a frigate as easily as a walnut shell there was good reason to stop and think even for the world's most emotionless man what would conseil say conseil i called a third time conseil appeared did master summon me he said entering yes my boy get my things ready get yours ready we're departing in two hours as master wishes conseil replied serenely we haven't a moment to lose pack as much into my trunk as you can my traveling kit my suits shirts and socks don't bother counting just squeeze it all in and hurry what about master's collections conseil ventured to observe We'll deal with them later. What? The Archaeotherium, Hyracotherium, Oreodons, Chiriopotamus, and Master's other fossil skeletons? The hotel will keep them for us. What about Master's live Barbarossa? They'll feed it during our absence. Anyhow, we'll leave instructions to ship the whole menagerie to France. Then we aren't returning to Paris? Conseil asked yes we are certainly i replied evasively but after we make a detour whatever detour master wishes oh it's nothing really a route slightly less direct that's all we're leaving on the abraham lincoln as master thinks best conseil replied placidly you see my friend it's an issue of the monster the notorious narwhal we're going to rid the seas of it the author of a two-volume work in quarto on the mysteries of the great ocean depths has no excuse for not setting sail with commander farragut it's a glorious mission but also a dangerous one we don't know where it will take us these beasts can be quite unpredictable but we're going just the same we have a commander who's game for anything what master does i'll do conseil replied but think it over because i don't want to hide anything from you this is one of those voyages from which people don't always come back as master wishes a quarter of an hour later our trunks were ready 
conseil did them in a flash and i was sure the lad hadn't missed a thing because he classified shirts and suits as expertly as birds and mammals the hotel elevator dropped us off in the main vestibule on the mezzanine i went down a short stair leading to the ground floor i settled my bill at that huge counter that was always under siege by a considerable crowd i left instructions for shipping my containers of stuffed animals and dried plants to paris france i opened a line of credit sufficient to cover the barbarossa and conseil at my heels i jumped into a carriage for a fare of twenty francs the vehicle went down broadway to union square took fourth avenue to its junction with bowery street turned into katrin street and halted at pier thirty four there the katrin ferry transferred men horses and carriage to brooklyn that great new york annex located on the left bank of the east river and in a few minutes we arrived at the wharf next to which the abraham lincoln was vomiting torrents of black smoke from its two funnels our baggage was immediately carried to the deck of the frigate i rushed aboard i asked for commander farragut one of the sailors led me to the after-deck where i stood in the presence of a smart-looking officer who extended his hand to me professor pierre aronnax he said to me the same i replied commander farragut in person welcome aboard professor your cabin is waiting for you i bowed and letting the commander attend to getting under way i was taken to the cabin that had been set aside for me the abraham lincoln had been perfectly chosen and fitted out for its new assignment it was a high-speed frigate furnished with superheating equipment that allowed the tension of its steam to build to seven atmospheres under this pressure the abraham lincoln reached an average speed of eighteen point three miles per hour a considerable speed but still not enough to cope with our gigantic cetacean the frigate's interior accommodations complemented its nautical virtues i was well satisfied with my cabin which was located in the stern and opened into the officer's mess we'll be quite comfortable here i told conseil with all due respect to master conseil replied as comfortable as a hermit crab inside the shell of a whelk i left conseil to the proper stowing of our luggage and climbed on deck to watch the preparations for getting under way just then commander farragut was giving orders to cast off the last moorings holding the abraham lincoln to its brooklyn pier and so if i had been delayed by a quarter of an hour or even less the frigate would have gone without me and i would have missed out on this unearthly extraordinary and inconceivable expedition whose true story might well meet with some skepticism but commander farragut did not want to waste a single day or even a single hour in making for those seas where the animal had just been sighted he summoned his engineer are we up to pressure he asked the man aye sir the engineer replied go ahead then commander farragut called at this order which was relayed to the engine by means of a compressed air device the mechanics activated the start-up wheel steam rushed whistling into the gaping valves long horizontal pistons groaned and pushed the tie rods of the drive shaft the blades of the propeller churned the waves with increasing speed and the abraham lincoln moved out majestically amid a spectator laden escort of some one hundred ferries and tenders author's note tenders are small steamboats that assist the big liners the wharves of brooklyn and every part of new york bordering the east river were crowded with curiosity seekers departing from five hundred thousand throats three cheers burst forth in succession thousands of handkerchiefs were waving above these tightly packed masses hailing the abraham lincoln until it reached the waters of the hudson river at the tip of the long peninsula that forms new york city the frigate then went along the new jersey coast the wonderful right bank of this river all loaded down with country homes and passed by the forts to salutes from their biggest cannons the abraham lincoln replied by three times lowering and hoisting the american flag whose thirty-nine stars gleamed from the gaff of the mizzen sail then changing speed to take the buoy marked channel that curved into the inner bay formed by the spit of sandy hook it hugged this sand-covered strip of land where thousands of spectators acclaimed us one more time 
the escort of boats and tenders still followed the frigate and only left us when we came abreast of the lightship whose two signal lights marked the entrance of the narrows to upper new york bay three o'clock then sounded the harbor pilot went down in his dinghy and rejoined a little schooner waiting for him to leeward the furnaces were stoked the propeller churned the waves more swiftly the frigate skirted the flat yellow coast of long island and at eight o'clock in the evening after the lights of fire island had vanished into the northwest we ran at full steam onto the dark waters of the atlantic end of chapter three Part 1, Chapter 4 of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, An Underwater Tour of the World, by Jules Verne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Chapter 4, Ned Land. Commander Farragut was a good seaman, worthy of the frigate he commanded. His ship and he were one. He was its very soul. On the cetacean question, no doubts arose in his mind, and he did not allow the animal's existence to be disputed aboard his vessel. He believed in it as certain pious women believe in the Leviathan from the Book of Job, out of faith, not reason. The monster existed, and he had vowed to rid the seas of it. The man was a sort of knight of Rhodes, a latter-day Sir Dutenay of Gonzo, on his way to fight an encounter with the dragon devastating the island. Either Commander Farragut would slay the narwhal, or the narwhal would slay Commander Farragut. No middle of the road for these two. The ship's officers shared the views of their leader. They could be heard chatting, discussing, arguing, calculating the different chances of an encounter, and observing the vast expanse of the ocean. Voluntary watches from the cross-trees of the top gallant sail were self-imposed by more than one who would have cursed such toil under any other circumstances. As often as the sun swept over its daily arc, the masts were populated with sailors whose feet itched and couldn't hold still on the planking of the deck below, and the Abraham Lincoln's stem post hadn't even cut the suspected waters of the Pacific. As for the crew, they only wanted to encounter the unicorn, harpoon it, haul it on board, and carve it up. They surveyed the sea with scrupulous care. Besides, Commander Farragut had mentioned that a certain sum of $2,000 was waiting for the man who first sighted the animal, be he cabin boy or sailor, mate or officer. I'll let the reader decide whether eyes got proper exercise aboard the Abraham Lincoln. As for me, I didn't lag behind the others, and I yielded to no one my share in these daily observations. Our frigate would have had five score good reasons for renaming itself the Argus after that mythological beast with one hundred eyes. The lone rebel among us was Conseil, who seemed utterly uninterested in the question exciting us and was out of step with the general enthusiasm on board. As I said, Commander Farragut had carefully equipped his ship with all the gear needed to fish for the gigantic cetacean. No whaling vessel could have been better armed. We had every known mechanism, from the hand-hurled harpoon, to the blunderbuss firing barbed arrows, to the duck gun with exploding bullets. On the forecastle was mounted the latest model breech-loading cannon, very heavy of barrel and narrow of bore, a weapon that would figure in the Universal Exhibition of 1867. Made in America, this valuable instrument could fire a 4-kilogram conical projectile an average distance of 16 kilometers without the least bother. So the Abraham Lincoln wasn't lacking in means of destruction, but it had better still. It had Ned Land, the king of harpooners. Gifted with uncommon manual ability, Ned Land was a Canadian who had no equal in his dangerous trade. Dexterity, coolness, bravery, and cunning were virtues he possessed to a high degree, and it took a truly crafty baleen whale or an exceptionally astute sperm whale to elude the thrusts of his harpoon. Ned Land was about forty years old a man of great height, over six English feet. He was powerfully built, serious in manner, not very sociable, sometimes headstrong, and quite ill-tempered when crossed. 
his looks caught the attention and above all the strength of his gaze, which gave a unique emphasis to his facial appearance. Commander Farragut, to my thinking, had made a wise move in hiring on this man. With his eye and his throwing arm, he was worth the whole crew all by himself. I can do no better than to compare him with a powerful telescope that could double as a cannon always ready to fire. To say Canadian is to say French, and as unsociable as Ned Land was, I must admit he took a definite liking to me. No doubt it was my nationality that attracted him. It was an opportunity for him to speak, and for me to hear, that old Rabelaisian dialect still used in some Canadian provinces. The Harpooner's family originated in Quebec, and they were already a line of bold fishermen back in the days when this town still belonged to France. Little by little, Ned developed a taste for chatting, and I loved hearing the tales of his adventures in the polar seas. He described his fishing trips and his battles with great natural lyricism. His tales took on the form of an epic poem, and I felt I was hearing some Canadian Homer reciting his Iliad of the high Arctic regions. I'm writing of this bold companion as I currently know him, because we've become old friends united in that permanent comradeship born and cemented during only the most frightful crises ah my gallant ned i ask only to live one hundred years more the longer to remember you and now what were ned land's views on this question of the marine monster i must admit that he flatly didn't believe in the unicorn and alone on board he didn't share the general conviction he avoided even dealing with the subject, for which one day I felt compelled to take him to task. During the magnificent evening of June 25th, in other words, three weeks after our departure, the frigate lay abreast of Cabo Blanco, 30 miles to leeward of the coast of Patagonia. We had crossed the Tropic of Capricorn, and the Strait of Magellan opened less than 700 miles to the south. Before eight days were out, the Abraham Lincoln would plow the waves of the Pacific. Seated on the afterdeck, Ned Land and I chatted about one thing and another, staring at that mysterious sea whose depths to this day are beyond the reach of human eyes. Quite naturally, I led our conversation around to the giant unicorn, and I weighed our expedition's various chances for success or failure. Then, seeing that Ned just let me talk without saying much himself, I pressed him more closely. Ned, I asked him, how can you still doubt the reality of this cetacean we're after? Do you have any particular reasons for being so skeptical? The harpooner stared at me a while before replying, slapped his broad forehead in one of his standard gestures, closed his eyes as if to collect himself, and finally said, Just maybe, Professor Aronnax. But Ned, you're a professional whaler a man familiar with all the great marine mammals. Your mind should easily accept this hypothesis of an enormous cetacean, and you ought to be the last one to doubt it under these circumstances. That's just where you're mistaken, Professor, Ned Land replied. The common man may still believe in fabulous comets crossing outer space, or in prehistoric monsters living at the Earth's core. But astronomers and geologists don't swallow such fairy tales. It's the same with whalers. I've chased plenty of cetaceans. I've harpooned a good number. I've killed several. But no matter how powerful and well-armed they were, neither their tails or their tusks could puncture the sheet-iron plates of a steamer. Even so, Ned, people mention vessels that narwhal tusks have run clean through. Wooden ships, maybe, the Canadian replied. But I've never seen the like. So till I have proof to the contrary, I'll deny that baleen whales, sperm whales, or unicorns can do any such thing. Listen to me, Ned. No, no, Professor. I'll go along with anything you want except that. Some gigantic devilfish, maybe. Even less likely, Ned. The devilfish is merely a mollusk, and even this name hints at its semi-liquid flesh because it's Latin, meaning soft one. The devilfish doesn't belong to the vertebrate branch, and even if it were 500 feet long, it would still be utterly harmless to ships like the Scotia or the Abraham Lincoln. Consequently, the feats of krakens or other monsters of that ilk must be relegated to the realm of fiction. So, Mr. Naturalist, Ned Land continued in a bantering tone, you'll just keep on believing in the existence of some enormous cetacean? 
yes ned i repeat it with a conviction backed by factual logic i believe in the existence of a mammal with a powerful constitution belonging to the vertebrate branch like baleen whales sperm whales or dolphins and armed with a tusk made of horn that has tremendous penetrating power ha huh, the harpooner put in shaking his head with an attitude of a man who doesn't want to be convinced note well my fine canadian i went on if such an animal exists if it lives deep in the ocean if it frequents the liquid strata located miles beneath the surface of the water it needs to have a constitution so solid it defies all comparison and why this powerful constitution ned asked because it takes incalculable strength just to live in those deep strata and withstand their pressure oh really ned said tipping me a wink oh really and i can prove it to you with a few simple figures bosh ned replied you can make figures do anything you want in business ned but not in mathematics listen to me let's accept that the pressure of one atmosphere is represented by the pressure of a column of water thirty-two feet high in reality such a column of water wouldn't be quite so high because here we're dealing with salt water which is denser than fresh water well then when you dive under the waves ned for every thirty-two feet of water above you your body is tolerating the pressure of one more atmosphere in other words one more kilogram per each square centimeter on your body's surface so it follows that at 320 feet down this pressure is equal to 10 atmospheres to 100 atmospheres at 3200 feet and to 1000 atmospheres at 32000 feet that is at about two and a half vertical leagues down which is tantamount to saying that if you could reach such a depth in the ocean each square centimeter on your body's surface would be experiencing 1000 kilograms of pressure now my gallant ned do you know how many square centimeters you have on your bodily surface i haven't the foggiest notion professor aronnax about seventeen thousand as many as that yes and since the atmosphere's pressure actually weighs slightly more than one kilogram per square centimeter your seventeen thousand square centimeters are tolerating seventeen thousand five hundred and sixty eight kilograms at this very moment without my noticing it without your noticing it and if you aren't crushed by so much pressure it's because the air penetrates the interior of your body with equal pressure when the inside and outside pressures are in perfect balance they neutralize each other and allow you to tolerate them without discomfort but in the water it's another story yes i see ned replied growing more interested because the water surrounds me but doesn't penetrate me precisely ned so at thirty-two feet beneath the surface of the sea you'll undergo a pressure of seventeen thousand five hundred and sixty eight kilograms at 320 feet or 10 times greater pressure it's 175,680 kilograms at 3,200 feet or 100 times greater pressure it's 1,756,800 kilograms finally at 32,000 feet or 1,000 times greater pressure it's 17 million 568,000 kilograms in other words you'd be squashed as flat as if you'd just been yanked from between the plates of a hydraulic press fire and brimstone ned put in all right then my fine harpooner if vertebrates several hundred meters long and proportionate in bulk live at such depths their surface areas make up millions of square centimeters and the pressure they undergo must be assessed in billions of kilograms calculate then how much resistance of bone structure and strength of constitution they'd need in order to withstand such pressures they'd need to be manufactured ned land replied from sheet iron plates eight inches thick like ironclad frigates right ned and then picture the damage such a mass could inflict if it were launched with the speed of an express train against a ship's hull yes indeed maybe the canadian replied staggered by these figures but still not willing to give in well have i convinced you you've convinced me of one thing mr naturalist 
that deep in the sea, such animals would need to be just as strong as you say, if they exist. But if they don't exist, my stubborn harpooner, how do you explain the accident that happened to the Scotia? It's maybe, Ned said, hesitating. Go on. Because it just couldn't be true, the Canadian replied, unconsciously echoing a famous catchphrase of the scientist Arago. But this reply proved nothing other than how bullheaded the harpooner could be. That day I pressed him no further. The Scotia's accident was undeniable. Its hole was real enough that it had to be plugged up, and I don't think a hole's existence can be more emphatically proven. Now then, this hole did not make itself, and since it hadn't resulted from underwater rocks or underwater machines, it must have been caused by the perforating tool of some animal. Now, for all the reasons put forward to this point, I believed that this animal was a member of the branch vertebrata, class Mammalia, group Pisciforma, and finally, order Cetacea. As for the family in which it would be placed, baleen whale, sperm whale, or dolphin, the genus to which it belonged, and the species in which it would find its proper home, these questions had to be left for later. To answer them called for dissecting this unknown monster. To dissect it called for catching it. To catch it called for harpooning it, which was Ned Land's business. To harpoon it called for sighting it, which was the crew's business. And to sight it called for encountering it, which was a chancy business. End of Part 1, Chapter 4Part 1, Chapter 5 of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, An Underwater Tour of the World by Jules Verne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Chapter 5, At Random. For some while, the voyage of the Abraham Lincoln was marked by no incident. But one circumstance arose that displayed Ned Land's marvelous skills and showed just how much confidence we could place in him. Off the Falkland Islands on June the 30th, the frigate came in contact with a fleet of American whalers, and we learned that they had not seen the Norwal. But one of them, the captain of the Monroe, knew that Ned Land had shipped aboard the Abraham Lincoln and asked his help in hunting a baleen whale that was in sight. Anxious to see Ned Land at work, Commander Farragut authorized him to make his way aboard the Monroe. And the Canadian had such good luck that with a right and left shot, he harpooned not one whale but two, striking the first straight to the heart and catching the other after a few minutes' chase. Assuredly, if the monster ever had to deal with Ned Land's harpoon, I wouldn't bet on the monster. The frigate sailed along the east coast of South America with prodigious speed. By July 3rd, they were at the entrance to the Strait of Magellan, abreast of Cabo de las Virginis. But Commander Farragut was unwilling to attempt this tortuous passageway and maneuvered instead to double Cape Horn. The crew sided with him unanimously. Indeed, were we likely to encounter the narwhal in such a cramped strait? Many of our sailors swore that the monster couldn't negotiate this passageway, simply because he is too big for it. Near three o'clock in the afternoon on July 6th, 15 miles south of shore, the Abraham Lincoln doubled that solitary islet at the tip of the South American continent, that stray rock Dutch seamen had named Cape Horn after their hometown of Horn. Our course was set for the northwest, and the next day our frigate's propeller finally churned the waters of the Pacific. Open your eyes! Open your eyes! repeated the sailors of the Abraham Lincoln, and they opened amazingly wide. Eyes and spyglasses, a bit dazzled, it is true, by the vista of two thousand dollars, didn't remain at rest for an instant. Day and night we observed the surface of the ocean, and those with nyctalopic eyes, whose ability to see in the dark increased their chances by 50%, had an excellent shot at winning the prize. 
as for me i was hardly drawn by the lure of money and yet was far from the least attentive on board snatching only a few minutes for meals and a few hours for sleep come rain or come shine i no longer left the ship's deck sometimes bending over the forecastle railings sometimes leaning against the stern rail i eagerly scouted that cotton-colored wake that whitened the ocean as far as the eye could see and how many times i shared the excitement of general staff and crew when some unpredictable whale lifted its blackish back above the waves in an instant the frigate's deck would become densely populated the cowls over the companionways would vomit a torrent of sailors and officers with panting chests and anxious eyes we each would eye the cetacean's movements i stared i stared until i nearly went blind from a worn-out retina while conseil as stoic as ever kept repeating to me in a calm tone if master's eyes would kindly stop bulging master will see farther but what a waste of energy the abraham lincoln would change course and race after the animal sighted only to find an ordinary baleen whale or a common sperm whale that soon disappeared amid a chorus of curses however the weather held good our voyage was proceeding under the most favorable conditions by then it was the bad season in these southernmost regions because july in this zone corresponds to our january in europe but the sea remained smooth and easily visible over the vast perimeter ned land still kept up the most tenacious skepticism beyond his spells on watch he pretended that he never even looked at the surface of the waves at least while no whales were in sight and yet the marvelous power of his vision could have performed yeoman service but this stubborn canadian spent eight hours out of every twelve reading or sleeping in his cabin a hundred times i chided him for his unconcern bah he replied nothing's out there professor aronnax and if there is some animal what chance would we have of spotting it can't you see we're just wandering around at random people say they've sighted this slippery beast again in the pacific high seas i'm truly willing to believe it but two months have already gone by since then and judging by your narwhal's personality it hates growing moldy from hanging out too long in the same waterways it's blessed with a terrific gift for getting around now professor you know even better than i that nature doesn't violate good sense and she wouldn't give some naturally slow animal the ability to move swiftly if it hadn't a need to use that talent so if the beast does exist it's already long gone i had no reply to this obviously we were just groping blindly but how else could we go about it all the same our chances were automatically pretty limited yet everyone still felt confident of success and not a sailor on board would have bet against the narwhals appearing and soon on july twentieth we cut the tropic of capricorn at longitude one hundred and five degrees and by the twenty seventh of the same month we had cleared the equator on the hundred and tenth meridian these bearings determined the frigate took a more decisive westward heading and tackled the seas of the central pacific commander farragut felt and with good reason that it was best to stay in deep waters and keep his distance from continents or islands whose neighborhoods the animal always seemed to avoid no doubt our boatswain said because there isn't enough water for him so the frigate kept well out when passing the tuamotu marquesas and hawaiian islands then cut the tropic of cancer at longitude one hundred and thirty two degrees and headed for the seas of china we were finally in the area of the monster's latest antics and in all honesty shipboard conditions became life-threatening hearts were pounding hideously gearing up for futures full of incurable aneurysms the entire crew suffered from a nervous excitement that is beyond me to describe nobody ate nobody slept twenty times a day some error in perception or the optical illusions of some sailor perched in the cross trees would cause intolerable anguish and this emotion repeated twenty times over kept us in a state of irritability so intense that a reaction was bound to follow and this reaction wasn't long in coming 
for three months during which each day seemed like a century the abraham lincoln plowed all the northerly seas of the pacific racing after whales sighted abruptly veering off course swerving sharply from one tack to another stopping suddenly putting on steam and reversing engines in quick succession at the risk of stripping its gears and it didn't leave a single point unexplored from the beaches of japan to the coasts of america and we found nothing nothing except an immenseness of deserted waves nothing remotely resembling a gigantic narwhal or an underwater islet or a derelict shipwreck or a runaway reef or anything the least bit unearthly so the reaction set in at first discouragement took hold of people's minds opening the door to disbelief a new feeling appeared on board made up of three-tenths shame and seven-tenths fury the crew called themselves out and out fools for being hoodwinked by a fairy tale then grew steadily more furious the mountains of arguments amassed over a year collapsed all at once and each man now wanted only to catch up on his eating and sleeping to make up for the time he had so stupidly sacrificed with typical human fickleness they jumped from one extreme to the other inevitably the most enthusiastic supporters of the undertaking became its most energetic opponents this reaction mounted upward from the bowels of the ship from the quarters of the bunker hands to the mess room of the general staff and for certain if it hadn't been for commander farragut's characteristic stubbornness the frigate would ultimately have put back to that cape in the south but this futile search couldn't drag on much longer the abraham lincoln had done everything it could to succeed and had no reason to blame itself never had the crew of an american naval craft shown more patience and zeal they weren't responsible for this failure there was nothing to do but go home a request to this effect was presented to the commander the commander stood his ground his sailors couldn't hide their discontent and their work suffered because of it i'm unwilling to say that there was mutiny on board but after a reasonable period of intransigence commander farragut like christopher columbus before him asked for a grace period of just three days more after this three-day delay if the monster hadn't appeared our helmsman would give three turns of the wheel and the abraham lincoln would chart a course toward european seas this promise was given on november the second it had the immediate effect of reviving the crew's failing spirits the ocean was observed with renewed care each man wanted one last look with which to sum up his experience spy glasses functioned with feverish energy a supreme challenge had been issued to the giant narwhal and the latter had no acceptable excuse for ignoring this summons to appear two days passed the abraham lincoln stayed at half steam on the off chance that the animal might be found in these waterways a thousand methods were used to spark its interest or rouse it from its apathy enormous sides of bacon were trailed in our wake to the great satisfaction i must say of assorted sharks while the abraham lincoln heaved to its longboats radiated in every direction around it and didn't leave a single point of the sea unexplored but the evening of november the fourth arrived with this underwater mystery still unsolved at noon the next day november the fifth the agreed-upon delay expired after a position fix true to his promise commander farragut would have to set his course for the southeast and leave the northerly regions of the pacific decisively behind by then the frigate lay in latitude 31 degrees 15 minutes north and longitude 136 degrees 42 minutes east the shores of japan were less than 200 miles to our leeward night was coming on eight o'clock had just struck huge clouds covered the moon's disk then in its first quarter the sea undulated placidly beneath the frigate's stem post just then i was in the bow leaning over the starboard rail conseil stationed beside me stared straight ahead roosting in the shrouds the crew examined the horizon which shrank and darkened little by little officers were probing the increasing gloom with their night glasses sometimes the murky ocean sparkled beneath moonbeams that darted between the fringes of two clouds 
then all traces of light vanished into the darkness observing conseil i discovered that just barely the gallant lad had fallen under the general influence at least so i thought perhaps his nerves were twitching with curiosity for the first time in history come on conseil i told him here's your last chance to pocket that two thousand dollars if master will permit me saying so conseil replied i never expected to win that prize and the union government could have promised one hundred thousand dollars and been none the poorer you're right conseil it turned out to be a foolish business after all and we jumped into it too hastily what a waste of time what a futile expense of emotion six months ago we could have been back in france in master's little apartment conseil answered in master's museum and by now i would have classified master's fossils and master's barbarossa would be ensconced in its cage at the zoo in the botanical gardens and it would have attracted every curiosity seeker in town quite so conseil and what's more i imagine that people will soon be poking fun at us to be sure conseil replied serenely i do think they'll have fun at master's expense and must it be said it must be said conseil well then it will serve master right how true when one has the honor of being an expert as master is one mustn't lay himself open to conseil didn't have time to complete the compliment in the midst of a general silence a voice became audible it was ned land's voice and it shouted ahoy there's the thing in question abreast of us to leeward end of chapter five part one chapter six of twenty thousand leagues under the sea an underwater tour of the world by jules verne this librivox recording is in the public domain read by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana chapter six at full steam at this shout the entire crew rushed toward the harpooner commander officers mates sailors cabin boys down to engineers leaving their machinery and stokers neglecting their furnaces the order was given to stop and the frigate merely coasted by then the darkness was profound and as good as the canadian's eyes were i still wondered how he could see and what he had seen my heart was pounding fit to burst but ned land was not mistaken and we all spotted the object his hand was indicating two cable lengths off the abraham lincoln's starboard quarter the sea seemed to be lit up from underneath this was no mere phosphorescent phenomena that much was unmistakable submerged some fathoms below the surface of the water the monster gave off that very intense but inexplicable glow that several captains had mentioned in their reports this magnificent radiance had to come from some force with a great illuminating capacity the edge of its light swept over the sea in an immense highly elongated oval condensing at the center into a blazing core whose unbearable glow diminished by degrees outward it's only a cluster of phosphorescent particles exclaimed one of the officers no sir i answered with conviction not even angel wing clams or salops have ever given off such a powerful light that glow is basically electric in nature besides look look it's shifting it's moving back and forth it's darting at us a universal shout went up from the frigate quiet commander farragut said helm hard to leeward reverse engines sailors rushed to the helm engineers to their machinery under reverse steam immediately the abraham lincoln beat to port sweeping in a semicircle right your helm engines forward commander farragut called these orders were executed and the frigate swiftly retreated from this core of light my mistake it wanted to retreat but the unearthly animal came at us with a speed double our own we gasped more stunned than afraid we stood mute and motionless the animal caught up with us played with us 
it made a full circle around the frigate then doing fourteen knots and wrapped us in sheets of electricity that were like luminous dust then it retreated two or three miles leaving a phosphorescent trail comparable to those swirls of steam that shoot behind the locomotive of an express train suddenly all the way from the dark horizon where it had gone to gather momentum the monster abruptly dashed toward the abraham lincoln with frightening speed stopped sharply twenty feet from our side plates and died out not by diving under the water since its glow did not recede gradually but all at once as if the source of this brilliant emanation had suddenly dried up then it reappeared on the other side of the ship either by circling around us or by gliding under our hull at any instant a collision could have occurred that would have been fatal to us meanwhile i was astonished at the frigate's maneuvers it was fleeing not fighting built to pursue it was being pursued and i commented on this to commander farragut his face ordinarily so emotionless was stamped with indescribable astonishment professor aronnax he answered me i don't know what kind of fearsome creature i'm up against and i don't want my frigate running foolish risks in all this darkness besides how should we attack this unknown creature how should we defend ourselves against it let's wait for daylight and then we'll play a different role you've no further doubts commander as to the nature of this animal no sir it's apparently a gigantic narwhal and an electric one to boot maybe i added it's no more approachable than an electric eel or an electric ray right the commander replied and if it has the power to electrocute it's surely the most dreadful animal ever conceived by our creator that's why i'll keep on my guard sir the whole crew stayed on their feet all night long no one even thought of sleeping unable to compete with the monster's speed the abraham lincoln slowed down and stayed at half steam for its part the narwhal mimicked the frigate simply rode with the waves and seemed determined not to forsake the field of battle however near midnight it disappeared or to use a more appropriate expression it went out like a huge glow-worm had it fled from us we were duty-bound to fear so rather than hope so but at twelve fifty three in the morning a deafening hiss became audible resembling the sound made by a water spout expelled with tremendous intensity by then commander farragut ned land and i were on the after deck peering eagerly into the profound gloom ned land the commander asked you've often heard whales bellowing often sir but never a whale like this whose sighting earned me two thousand dollars correct the prize is rightfully yours but tell me isn't that the noise cetaceans make when they spout water from their blowholes the very noise sir but this one's way louder so there can be no mistake there's definitely a whale lurking in our waters with your permission sir the harpooner added tomorrow at daybreak we'll have words with it if it's in the mood to listen to you mr land i replied in a tone far from convinced let me get within four harpoon lengths of it the canadian shot back and it had better listen but to get near it the commander went on i'd have to put a whaleboat at your disposal certainly sir that would be gambling with the lives of my men and with my own the harpooner replied simply near two o'clock in the morning the core of light reappeared no less intense five miles to windward of the abraham lincoln despite the distance despite the noise of wind and sea we could distinctly hear the fearsome thrashings of the animal's tail and even its panting breath seemingly the moment this enormous narwhal came up to breathe at the surface of the ocean air was sucked into its lungs like steam into the huge cylinders of a two thousand horsepower engine hmm i said to myself a cetacean as powerful as a whole cavalry regiment now that's a whale of a whale we stayed on the alert until daylight getting ready for action whaling gear was set up along the railings our chief officer loaded the blunderbusses which can launch harpoons as far as a mile and long duck guns with exploding bullets that can mortally wound even the most powerful animals ned land was content to sharpen his harpoon a dreadful weapon in his hands at six o'clock day began to break and with the dawn's early light the narwhal's electric glow disappeared 
at seven o'clock the day was well along but a very dense morning mist shrank the horizon and our best spyglasses were unable to pierce it the outcome disappointment and anger i hoisted myself up to the cross trees of the mizzen sail some officers were already perched on the mastheads at eight o'clock the mist rolled ponderously over the waves and its huge curls were lifting little by little the horizon grew wider and clearer all at once suddenly just as on the previous evening ned land's voice was audible there's the thing in question astern to port the harpooner shouted every eye looked toward the point indicated there a mile and a half from the frigate a long blackish body emerged a meter above the waves quivering violently its tail was creating a considerable eddy never had caudal equipment thrashed the sea with such power an immense wake of glowing whiteness marked the animal's track sweeping in a long curve our frigate drew nearer to the cetacean i examined it with a completely open mind those reports from the shannon and the helvetia had slightly exaggerated its dimensions and i put its length at only two hundred and fifty feet its girth was more difficult to judge but all in all the animal seemed to be wonderfully proportioned in all three dimensions while i was observing this phenomenal creature two jets of steam and water sprang from its blowholes and rose to an altitude of forty meters which settled for me its mode of breathing from this i finally concluded that it belonged to the branch vertebrata class mammalia subclass monodelphia group pisciforma order cetacea family but here i couldn't make up my mind the order cetacea consists of three families baleen whales sperm whales dolphins and it's in this last group that narwhals are placed each of these families is divided into several genera each genus into species each species into varieties so i was still missing variety species genus and family but no doubt i would complete my classifying with the aid of heaven and commander farragut the crew were waiting impatiently for orders from their leader the latter after carefully observing the animal called for his engineer the engineer raced over sir the commander said are you up to pressure aye sir the engineer replied fine stoke your furnaces and clap on full steam three cheers greeted this order the hour of battle had sounded a few moments later the frigate's two funnels vomited torrents of black smoke and its deck quaked from the trembling of its boilers driven forward by its powerful propeller the abraham lincoln headed straight for the animal unconcerned the latter let us come within half a cable length then not bothering to dive it got up a little speed retreated and was content to keep its distance this chase dragged on for three-quarters of an hour without the frigate gaining two fathoms on the cetacean at this rate it was obvious that we would never catch up with it infuriated commander farragut kept twisting the thick tuft of hair that flourished below his chin ned land he called the canadian reported at once well mr land the commander asked do you still advise putting my longboats to sea no sir ned land replied because that beast won't be caught against its will then what should we do stoke up more steam sir if you can as for me with your permission i'll go perch on the bobstays under the bowsprit and if we can get within a harpoon length i'll harpoon the brute go to it ned commander farragut replied engineer he called keep the pressure mounting ned land made his way to his post the furnaces were urged into greater activity our propeller did forty-three revolutions per minute and steam shot from the valves heaving the log we verified that the abraham lincoln was going at the rate of eighteen point five miles per hour but that damned animal also did a speed of eighteen point five for the next hour our frigate kept up this pace without gaining a fathom this was humiliating for one of the fastest racers in the american navy the crew were working up into a blind rage sailor after sailor heaved insults at the monster which couldn't be bothered with answering back commander farragut was no longer content simply to twist his goatee he chewed on it the engineer was summoned once again you're up to maximum pressure the commander asked him aye sir the engineer replied 
and your valves are charged to to six and a half atmospheres charge them to ten atmospheres a typical american order if i ever heard one it would have sounded just fine during some mississippi paddle wheeler race to outstrip the competition conseil i said to my gallant servant now at my side you realize that we'll probably blow ourselves sky high as master wishes conseil replied all right i admit it i did wish to run this risk the valves were charged more coal was swallowed by the furnaces ventilators shot torrents of air over the braziers the abraham lincoln's speed increased its masts trembled down to their blocks and swirls of smoke could barely squeeze through the narrow funnels we heaved the log a second time well helmsman commander farragut asked nineteen point three miles per hour sir keep stoking the furnaces the engineer did so the pressure gauge marked ten atmospheres but no doubt the cetacean itself had warmed up because without the least trouble it also did nineteen point three what a chase no i can't describe the excitement that shook my very being ned land stayed at his post harpoon in hand several times the animal let us approach we're overhauling it the canadian would shout then just as he was about to strike the cetacean would steal off with a swiftness i could estimate at no less than thirty miles per hour and even at our maximum speed it took the liberty of thumbing its nose at the frigate by running a full circle around us a howl of fury burst from every throat by noon we were no farther along than at eight o'clock in the morning commander farragut then decided to use more direct methods bah he said so that animal is faster than the abraham lincoln all right we'll see if it can outrun our conical shells mate man the gun in the bow our forecastle cannon was immediately loaded and leveled the cannoneer fired a shot but his shell passed some feet above the cetacean which stayed a half mile off over to somebody with better aim the commander shouted and five hundred dollars to the man who can pierce that infernal beast calm of eye cool of feature an old gray-bearded gunner i can see him to this day approached the cannon put it in position and took aim for a good while there was a mighty explosion mingled with cheers from the crew the shell reached its target it hit the animal but not in the usual fashion it bounced off that rounded surface and vanished into the sea two miles out oh drat said the old gunner in his anger that rascal must be covered with six-inch armor plate curse the beast commander farragut shouted the hunt was on again and commander farragut leaned over to me saying i'll chase that animal till my frigate explodes yes i replied and nobody would blame you we could still hope that the animal would tire out and not be as insensitive to exhaustion as our steam engines but no such luck hour after hour went by without it showing the least sign of weariness however to the abraham lincoln's credit it must be said that we struggled on with tireless persistence i estimated that we covered a distance of at least five hundred kilometers during this ill-fated day of november the sixth but night fell and wrapped the surging ocean in its shadows by then i thought our expedition had come to an end that we would never see this fantastic animal again i was mistaken at ten fifty in the evening that electric light reappeared three miles to windward of the frigate just as clear and intense as the night before the narwhal seemed motionless it was asleep perhaps weary from its work day just riding with the waves this was our chance and commander farragut was determined to take full advantage of it he gave his orders the abraham lincoln stayed at half steam advancing cautiously so as not to awaken its adversary in mid-ocean it's not unusual to encounter whales so sound asleep they can successfully be attacked and ned land had harpooned more than one in its slumber the canadian went to resume his post on the bobstays under the bowsprit the frigate approached without making a sound stopped two cable lengths from the animal and coasted not a soul breathed on board a profound silence reigned over the deck we were not one hundred feet from the blazing core of light whose glow grew stronger and dazzled the eyes just then leaning over the forecastle railings i saw ned land below me 
one hand grasping the martingale the other brandishing his dreadful harpoon barely twenty feet separated him from the motionless animal all at once his arm shot forward and the harpoon was launched i heard the weapon collide resonantly as if it had hit some hard substance the electric light suddenly went out and two enormous water spouts crashed onto the deck of the frigate racing like a torrent from stem to stern toppling crewmen breaking spare masts and yard arms from their lashings a hideous collision occurred and thrown over the rail with no time to catch hold of it i was hurled into the sea End of chapter 6 Part 1, Chapter 7 of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, An Underwater Tour of the World by Jules Verne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Chapter 7, A Whale of Unknown Species. Although I was startled by this unexpected descent, I at least have a very clear recollection of my sensations during it. At first, I was dragged about twenty feet under. I'm a good swimmer, without claiming to equal such other authors as Byron and Edgar Allan Poe, who were master divers, and I didn't lose my head on the way down. With two vigorous kicks of the heel, I came back to the surface of the sea. My first concern was to look for the frigate. Had the crew seen me go overboard? Was the Abraham Lincoln tacking about? Would Commander Farragut put a longboat to sea? Could I hope to be rescued? The gloom was profound. I glimpsed a black mass disappearing eastward, where its running lights were fading out in the distance. It was the frigate. I felt I was done for. Help! Help! I shouted, swimming desperately toward the Abraham Lincoln. My clothes were weighing me down. The water glued them to my body. They were paralyzing my movements. I was sinking. I was suffocating help this was the last shout i gave my mouth was filling with water i struggled against being dragged into the depths suddenly my clothes were seized by energetic hands i felt myself pulled abruptly back to the surface of the sea and yes i heard these words pronounced in my ear if master would oblige me by leaning on my shoulder master will swim with much greater ease with one hand I seized the arm of my loyal conseil. You, I said, you. Myself, conseil replied, and at master's command. That collision threw you overboard along with me? Not at all, but being in master's employ, I followed master. The fine lad thought this was only natural. What about the frigate, I asked. The frigate, Conseil replied, rolling over on his back. I think Master had best not depend on it to any great extent. What are you saying? I'm saying that just as I jumped overboard, I heard the men at the helm shout, Our propeller and rudder are smashed. Smashed? Yes, smashed by the monster's tusk. I believe it's the sole injury that Abraham Lincoln has sustained but most inconveniently for us the ship can no longer steer then we're done for perhaps conseil replied serenely however we still have a few hours before us and in a few hours one can do a great many things conseil's unflappable composure cheered me up i swam more vigorously but hampered by clothes that were as restricting as a cloak made of lead, I was managing with only the greatest difficulty. Conseil noticed as much. Master will allow me to make an incision, he said, and he slipped an open clasp knife under my clothes, slitting them from top to bottom with one swift stroke. Then he briskly undressed me while I swam for us both. I then did Conseil the same favor, and we continued to navigate side by side. But our circumstances were no less dreadful. Perhaps they hadn't seen us go overboard, and even if they had, the frigate, being undone by its rudder, couldn't return to leeward after us, so we could count only on its longboats. 
conseil had coolly reasoned out this hypothesis and laid his plans accordingly an amazing character this boy in mid-ocean this stoic lad seemed right at home so having concluded that our sole chance for salvation lay at being picked up by the abraham lincoln's longboats we had to take steps to wait for them as long as possible consequently i decided to divide our energies so we wouldn't both be worn out at the same time and this was the arrangement while one of us lay on his back staying motionless with arms crossed and legs outstretched the other would swim and propel his partner forward this towing roll was to last no longer than ten minutes and by relieving each other in this way we could stay afloat for hours perhaps even until daybreak slim chance but hope springs eternal in the human breast besides there were two of us lastly i can vouch as improbable as it seems that even if i had wanted to destroy all my illusions even if i had been willing to give in to despair i could not have done so the cetacean had rammed our frigate at about eleven o'clock in the evening i therefore calculated on eight hours of swimming until sunrise a strenuous task but feasible thanks to our relieving each other the sea was pretty smooth and barely tired us sometimes i tried to peer through the dense gloom which was broken only by the phosphorescent flickers coming from our movements i stared at the luminous ripples breaking over my hands shimmering sheets spattered with blotches of bluish gray it seemed as if we'd plunged into a pool of quicksilver near one o'clock in the morning i was overcome with tremendous exhaustion my limbs stiffened in the grip of intense cramps conseil had to keep me going and attending to our self-preservation became his sole responsibility i soon heard the poor lad gasping his breathing became shallow and quick i didn't think he could stand such exertions for much longer go on go on i told him leave master behind he replied never i'll drown before he does just then past the fringes of a large cloud that the wind was driving eastward the moon appeared the surface of the sea glistened under its rays that kindly light rekindled our strength i held up my head again my eyes darted to every point of the horizon i spotted the frigate it was five miles from us and formed no more than a dark barely perceptible mass but as for longboats not a one in sight i tried to call out what was the use at such a distance my swollen lips wouldn't let a single sound through conseil could still articulate a few words and i heard him repeat at intervals help help ceasing all movement for an instant we listened and it may have been a ringing in my ear from this organ filling with impeded blood but it seemed to me that conseil's shout had received an answer back did you hear that i muttered yes yes and conseil hurled another desperate plea into space this time there could be no mistake a human voice had answered us was it the voice of some poor devil left behind in mid-ocean some other victim of that collision suffered by our ship or was it one of the frigate's longboats hailing us out of the gloom conseil made one final effort and bracing his hands on my shoulders while i offered resistance with one supreme exertion he raised himself half out of the water then fell back exhausted what did you see i saw he muttered i saw but we mustn't talk save our strength what had he seen then lord knows why the thought of the monster came into my head for the first time but even so that voice gone are the days when jonas took refuge in the bellies of whales nevertheless conseil kept towing me sometimes he looked up stared straight ahead and shouted a request for directions which was answered by a voice that was getting closer and closer i could barely hear it i was at the end of my strength my fingers gave out my hands were no help to me my mouth opened convulsively filling with brine its coldness ran through me i raised my head one last time then i collapsed 
just then something hard banged against me i clung to it then i felt myself being pulled upward back to the surface of the water my chest caved in and i fainted for certain i came to quickly because someone was massaging me so vigorously it left furrows in my flesh i half opened my eyes conseil i muttered did master ring for me conseil replied just then in the last light of a moon setting on the horizon i spotted a face that wasn't conseil's but which i recognized at once ned i exclaimed in person sir and still after his prize the canadian replied you were thrown overboard after the frigate's collision yes professor but i was luckier than you and right away i was able to set foot on this floating islet islet or in other words on our gigantic narwhal explain yourself ned it's just that i soon realized why my harpoon got blunted and couldn't puncture its hide why ned why because professor this beast is made of boilerplate steel at this point in my story i need to get a grip on myself reconstruct exactly what i experienced and make doubly sure of everything i write the canadian's last words caused a sudden upheaval in my brain i swiftly hoisted myself to the summit of this half-submerged creature or object that was serving as our refuge i tested it with my foot obviously it was some hard impenetrable substance not the soft matter that makes up the bodies of our big marine mammals but this hard substance could have been a bony carapace like those that covered some prehistoric animals and i might have left it at that and classified this monster among such amphibious reptiles as turtles or alligators well no the blackish back supporting me was smooth and polished with no overlapping scales on impact it gave off a metallic sonority and as incredible as this sounds it seemed i swear to be made up of riveted plates no doubts were possible this animal this monster this natural phenomenon that had puzzled the whole scientific world that had muddled and misled the minds of seamen in both hemispheres was there could be no escaping it an even more astonishing phenomenon a phenomenon made by the hand of man even if i had discovered that some fabulous mythological creature really existed it wouldn't have given me such a terrific mental jolt it's easy enough to accept that prodigious things can come from our creator but to find all at once right before your eyes that the impossible had been mysteriously achieved by man himself this staggers the mind but there was no question now we were stretched out on the back of some kind of underwater boat that as far as i could judge boasted the shape of an immense steel fish ned land had clear views on the issue conseil and i could only line up behind him but then i said does this contraption contain some sort of locomotive mechanism and a crew to run it apparently the harpooner replied and yet for the three hours i've lived on this floating island it hasn't shown a sign of life this boat hasn't moved at all no professor aronnax it just rides with the waves but otherwise it hasn't stirred but we know that it's certainly gifted with great speed now then since an engine is needed to generate that speed and a mechanic to run that engine i conclude we're saved ha huh, ned land put in his tone denoting reservations just then as if to take my side in the argument a bubbling began astern of this strange submersible whose drive mechanism was obviously a propeller and the boat started to move we barely had time to hang on to its topside which emerged about eighty centimeters above water fortunately its speed was not excessive so long as it navigates horizontally ned land muttered i've no complaints but if it gets the urge to dive i wouldn't give two dollars for my hide the canadian might have quoted a much lower price so it was imperative to make contact with whatever beings were confined inside the plating of this machine I searched its surface for an opening or a hatch a manhole to use the official term but the lines of rivets had been firmly driven into the sheet iron joints and were straight and uniform 
moreover the moon then disappeared and left us in profound darkness we had to wait for daylight to find some way of getting inside this underwater boat so our salvation lay totally in the hands of the mysterious helmsman steering this submersible and if it made a dive we were done for but aside from this occurring i didn't doubt the possibility of our making contact with them in fact if they didn't produce their own air they inevitably had to make periodic visits to the surface of the ocean to replenish their oxygen supply hence the need for some opening that put the boat's interior in contact with the atmosphere as for any hope of being rescued by commander farragut that had to be renounced completely we were being swept westward and i estimate that our comparatively moderate speed reached twelve miles per hour the propeller churned the waves with mathematical regularity sometimes emerging above the surface and throwing phosphorescent spray to great heights near four o'clock in the morning the submersible picked up speed we could barely cope with this dizzying rush and the waves battered us at close range fortunately ned's hands came across a big mooring ring fastened to the top side of this sheet iron back and we all held on for dear life finally this long night was over my imperfect memories won't let me recall my every impression of it a single detail comes back to me several times during various lulls of wind and sea i thought i heard indistinct sounds a sort of elusive harmony produced by distant musical chords what was the secret behind this underwater navigating whose explanation the whole world had sought in vain what beings lived inside this strange boat what mechanical force allowed it to move about with such prodigious speed daylight appeared the morning mists surrounded us but they soon broke up i was about to proceed with a careful examination of the hull whose top side formed a sort of horizontal platform when i felt it sinking little by little oh damnation ned land shouted stamping his foot on the resonant sheet iron open up there you antisocial navigators but it was difficult to make yourself heard above the deafening beats of the propeller fortunately this submerging movement stopped from inside the boat there suddenly came noises of iron fastenings pushed roughly aside one of the steel plates flew up a man appeared gave a bizarre yell and instantly disappeared a few moments later eight strapping fellows appeared silently their faces like masks and dragged us down into their fearsome machine End of chapter 7part one chapter eight of twenty thousand leagues under the sea an underwater tour of the world by jules verne this librivox recording is in the public domain read by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana chapter eight mobilis in mobili this brutally executed capture was carried out with lightning speed my companions and i had no time to collect ourselves i don't know how they felt about being shoved inside this aquatic prison but as for me i was shivering all over with whom were we dealing surely with some new breed of pirates exploiting the sea after their own fashion the narrow hatch had barely closed over me when i was surrounded by profound darkness saturated with the outside light my eyes couldn't make out a thing I felt my naked feet clinging to the steps of an iron ladder. Forcibly seized, Ned Land and Conseil were behind me. At the foot of the ladder, a door opened and instantly closed behind us with a loud clang. We were alone. Where? I couldn't say, could barely even imagine. All was darkness, but such utter darkness that after several minutes my eyes were still unable to catch a single one of those hazy gleams that drift through even the blackest nights. Meanwhile, furious at these goings-on, Ned Land gave free rein to his indignation. Damnation! he exclaimed. These people are about as hospitable as the savages of New Caledonia. All that's lacking is for them to be cannibals i wouldn't be surprised if they were but believe you me they won't eat me without my kicking up a protest 
calm yourself ned my friend conseil replied serenely don't flare up so quickly we aren't in a kettle yet in a kettle no the canadian shot back but in an oven for sure it's dark enough for one Luckily, my bowie knife hasn't left me, and I can still see well enough to put it to use. The first one of these bandits who lays a hand on me. Author's note, a bowie knife is a wide-bladed dagger that Americans are forever carrying around. Don't be so irritable, Ned, I then told the harpooner, and don't ruin things for us with pointless violence. Who knows whether they might be listening to us? Instead, let's try to find out where we are. I started moving, groping my way. After five steps, I encountered an iron wall made of riveted boilerplate. Then, turning around, I bumped into a wooden table next to which several stools had been set. The floor of this prison lay hidden beneath thick, hempen matting that deadened the sound of footsteps. Its naked walls didn't reveal any trace of a door or window. Going around the opposite way, Conseil met up with me, and we returned to the middle of this cabin, which had to be twenty feet long by ten wide. As for its height, not even Ned Land, with his great stature, was able to determine it. Half an hour had already gone by without our situation changing, when our eyes were suddenly spirited from utter darkness into blinding light. Our prison lit up all at once. In other words, it filled with luminescent matter, so intense that at first I couldn't stand the brightness of it. From its glare and whiteness, I recognized the electric glow that had played around this underwater boat like some magnificent phosphorescent phenomenon. After involuntarily closing my eyes, I reopened them and saw that this luminous force came from a frosted half-globe curving out of the cabin's ceiling. Finally, it's light enough to see, Ned Land exclaimed, knife in hand, staying on the defensive. Yes, I replied, then ventured the opposite view. But as for our situation, we are still in the dark. Master must learn patience, said the emotionless Conseil. This sudden illumination of our cabin enabled me to examine its tiniest details. It contained only a table and five stools. Its invisible door must have been hermetically sealed. Not a sound reached our ears. Everything seemed dead inside this boat. Was it in motion, or stationary on the surface of the ocean, or sinking into the depths? I couldn't tell. But this luminous globe hadn't been turned on without good reason. Consequently, I hoped that some crewman would soon make an appearance. If you want to consign people to oblivion, you don't light up their dungeons. I was not mistaken. Unlocking noises became audible, a door opened, and two men appeared. One was short and stocky, powerfully muscled, broad-shouldered, robust of limbs, the head squat, the hair black and luxuriant, the mustache heavy, the eyes bright and penetrating and his whole personality stamped with that southern-blooded zest that in France typifies the people of Provence. The philosopher Diderot has very aptly claimed that a man's bearing is the clue to his character, and this stocky little man was certainly a living proof of this claim. You could sense that his everyday conversation must have been packed with such vivid figures of speech as personification, symbolism, and misplaced modifiers. But I was never in a position to verify this, because, around me, he used only an odd and utterly incomprehensible dialect. The second stranger deserves a more detailed description. A disciple of such character-judging anatomists as Gratiolet or Engel could have read this man's features like an open book. Without hesitation, I identified his dominant qualities— Self-confidence, since his head reared like a nobleman's above the arc formed by the lines of his shoulders, and his black eyes gazed with icy assurance. Calmness, since his skin, pale rather than ruddy, indicated tranquility of blood. Energy, shown by the swiftly knitting muscles of his brow. And finally, courage, since his deep breathing denoted tremendous reserves of vitality. I might add that this was a man of great pride, 
that his calm, firm gaze seemed to reflect thinking on an elevated plane, and that the harmony of his facial expressions and bodily movements resulted in an overall effect of unquestionable candor. According to the findings of physiognomists, those analysts of facial character, I felt involuntarily reassured in his presence, and this boded well for our interview. Whether this individual was thirty-five or fifty years of age, I could not precisely state. He was tall, his forehead broad, his nose straight, his mouth clearly etched, his teeth magnificent, his hands refined, tapered, and to use a word from psalmistry, highly psychic, in other words, worthy of serving a lofty and passionate spirit. This man was certainly the most wonderful physical specimen I had ever encountered. One unusual detail. His eyes were spaced a little far from each other, and could instantly take in nearly a quarter of the horizon. This ability, as I later verified, was strengthened by a range of vision even greater than Ned Land's. When this stranger focused his gaze on an object, his eyebrow lines gathered into a frown, his heavy eyelids closed around his pupils to contract his huge field of vision, and he looked. What a look! as if he could magnify objects shrinking into the distance, as if he could probe your very soul, as if he could pierce those sheets of water so opaque to our eyes and scan the deepest seas. Wearing caps made of sea otter fur and shod in sealskin fishing boots, these two strangers were dressed in clothing made from some unique fabric that flattered the figure and allowed great freedom of movement. The taller of the two, apparently the leader on board, examined us with the greatest care but without pronouncing a word. Then, turning to his companion, he conversed with him in a language I didn't recognize. It was a sonorous, harmonious, flexible dialect, whose vowels seemed to undergo a highly varied accentuation. The other replied with a shake of the head and added two or three utterly incomprehensible words. Then he seemed to question me directly with a long stare. I replied in clear French that I wasn't familiar with his language, but he didn't seem to understand me, and this situation grew rather baffling. Still, Master should tell our story, Conseil said to me. Perhaps these gentlemen will grasp a few words of it. I tried again, telling the tale of our adventures, clearly articulating my every syllable and not leaving out a single detail. I stated our names and titles. Then, in order, I introduced Professor Aronnax, his manservant Conseil, and Mr. Ned Land, Harpooner. The man with calm, gentle eyes listened to me serenely, even courteously, and paid remarkable attention. But nothing in his facial expression indicated that he understood my story. When I finished, he didn't pronounce a single word. One resource still left was to speak English. Perhaps they would be familiar with this nearly universal language. But I only knew it, as I did the German language, well enough to read it fluently, but not well enough to speak it correctly. Here, however, our overriding need was to make ourselves understood. Come on, it's your turn, I told the harpooner. Over to you, Mr. Land. Pull out your bag of tricks, the best English ever spoken by an Anglo-Saxon, and try for a more favorable result than mine. Ned needed no persuading and started our story all over again, most of which I could follow. Its content was the same, but the form differed. Carried away by his volatile temperament, the Canadian put great animation into it. He complained vehemently about being imprisoned in defiance of his civil rights, asked by virtue of which law he was hereby detained, invoked writs of habeas corpus, threatened to press charges against anyone holding him in illegal custody, ranted, gesticulated, shouted, and finally conveyed by an expressive gesture that we were dying of hunger. This was perfectly true, but we had nearly forgotten the fact. Much to his amazement, the harpooner seemed no more intelligible than I had been. Our visitors didn't bat an eye. 
apparently they were engineers who understood the languages of neither the french physicist arago nor the english physicist faraday thoroughly baffled after vainly exhausting our philological resources i no longer knew what tactic to pursue when conseil told me if master will authorize me i'll tell the whole business in german what you know german i exclaimed like most flemish people with all due respect to master on the contrary my respect is due you go to it my boy and conseil in his serene voice described for the third time the various vicissitudes of our story but despite our narrator's fine accent and stylish turns of phrase the german language met with no success finally as a last resort i hauled out everything i could remember from my early school days and i tried to narrate our adventures in latin cicero would have plugged his ears and sent me to the scullery but somehow i managed to pull through with the same negative result this last attempt ultimately misfiring the two strangers exchanged a few words in their incomprehensible language and withdrew not even favoring us with one of those encouraging gestures that are used in every country in the world the door closed again this is outrageous dead land shouted exploding for the twentieth time i ask you we speak french english german and latin to these rogues and neither of them has the decency to even answer back calm down ned i told the seething harpooner anger won't get us anywhere but professor our irascible companion went on can't you see that we could die of hunger in this iron cage bah conseil put in philosophically we can hold out a good while yet my friends i said we mustn't despair we've gotten out of tighter spots so please do me the favor of waiting a bit before you form your views on the commander and crew of this boat my views are fully formed ned land shot back they are rogues oh good and from what country roguedom my gallant ned as yet that country isn't clearly marked on maps of the world but i admit that the nationality of these two strangers is hard to make out neither english french nor german that's all we can say but i'm tempted to think that the commander and his chief officer were born in the low latitudes there must be southern blood in them but as to whether they are spaniards turks arabs or east indians their physical characteristics don't give me enough to go on and as for their speech it's utterly incomprehensible that's the nuisance in not knowing every language conseil replied or the drawback in not having one universal language which would all go out the window ned land replied don't you see these people have a language all to themselves a language they've invented just to cause despair in decent people who ask for a little dinner why in every country on earth when you open your mouth snap your jaws smack your lips and teeth isn't that the world's most understandable message from quebec to the Tamotu islands from paris to the antipodes doesn't it mean i'm hungry give me a bite to eat oh conseil put in there are some people so unintelligent by nature as he was saying these words the door opened a steward entered he brought us some clothes jackets and sailors pants made out of a fabric whose nature i didn't recognize i hurried to change into them and my companions followed suit author's note a steward is a waiter on board a steamer meanwhile our silent steward perhaps a deaf mute set the table and laid three place settings there's something serious afoot conseil said and it bodes well bah replied the rancorous harpooner what the devil do you suppose they eat around here turtle livers loin of shark dogfish steaks we'll soon find out conseil said overlaid with silver dish covers various platters had been neatly positioned on the tablecloth and we sat down to eat assuredly we were dealing with civilized people and if it hadn't been for this electric light flooding over us i would have thought we were in the dining room of the hotel adelphi in liverpool or the grand hotel in paris 
however i feel compelled to mention that bread and wine were totally absent the water was fresh and clear but it was still water which wasn't what ned land had in mind among the foods we were served i was able to identify various daintily dressed fish but i couldn't make up my mind about certain otherwise excellent dishes and i couldn't even tell whether their contents belonged to the vegetable or the animal kingdom as for the tableware it was elegant and in perfect taste each utensil spoon fork knife and plate bore on its reverse a letter encircled by a latin motto and here is its exact duplicate mobilis in mobili n moving within the moving element it was a highly appropriate motto for this underwater machine so long as the preposition in is translated as within and not upon the letter n was no doubt the initial of the name of that mystifying individual in command beneath the seas ned and conseil had no time for such musings they were wolfing down their food and without further ado i did the same by now i felt reassured about our fate and it seemed obvious that our hosts didn't intend to let us die of starvation but all earthly things come to an end all things must pass even the hunger of people who haven't eaten for fifteen hours our appetites appeased we felt an urgent need for sleep a natural reaction after that interminable night of fighting for our lives he gods i'll sleep soundly conseil said me i'm out like a light ned land replied my two companions lay down on the cabin's carpeting and were soon deep in slumber as for me i gave in less readily to this intense need for sleep too many thoughts had piled up in my mind too many insoluble questions had arisen too many images were keeping my eyelids open where were we what strange power was carrying us along i felt or at least i thought i did the submersible sinking toward the sea's lower strata intense nightmares besieged me in these mysterious marine sanctuaries i envisioned hosts of unknown animals and this underwater boat seemed to be a blood relation of theirs living breathing just as fearsome then my mind grew calmer my imagination melted into hazy drowsiness and i soon fell into an uneasy slumber end of chapter eight part one chapter nine of twenty thousand leagues under the sea an underwater tour of the world by jules verne this librivox recording is in the public domain recorded by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana chapter nine the tantrums of ned land i have no idea how long this slumber lasted but it must have been a good while since we were completely over our exhaustion i was the first one to wake up my companions weren't yet stirring and still lay in their corners like inanimate objects i had barely gotten up from my passably hard mattress when i felt my mind clear my brain go on the alert so i began a careful re-examination of our cell nothing had changed in its interior arrangements the prison was still a prison and its prisoners still prisoners but taking advantage of our slumber the steward had cleared the table consequently nothing indicated any forthcoming improvement in our situation and i seriously wondered if we were doomed to spend the rest of our lives in this cage this prospect seemed increasingly painful to me because even though my brain was clear of its obsessions from the night before i was feeling an odd short-windedness in my chest it was becoming hard for me to breathe the heavy air was no longer sufficient for the full play of my lungs although our cell was large we obviously had used up most of the oxygen it contained in essence over an hour's time a single human being consumes all the oxygen found in one hundred liters of air at which point that air has become charged with a nearly equal amount of carbon dioxide and is no longer fit for breathing 
so it was now urgent to renew the air in our prison and no doubt the air in this whole underwater boat as well here a question popped into my head how did the commander of this aquatic residence go about it did he obtain air using chemical methods releasing the oxygen contained in potassium chlorate by heating it meanwhile absorbing the carbon dioxide with potassium hydroxide if so he would have to keep up some kind of relationship with the shore to come by the materials needed for such an operation did he simply limit himself to storing the air in high-pressure tanks and then dispense it according to his crew's needs perhaps or proceeding in a more convenient more economical and consequently more probable fashion was he satisfied with merely returning to breathe at the surface of the water like a cetacean renewing his oxygen supply every twenty-four hours in any event whatever his method was it seemed prudent to me that he used this method without delay in fact i had already resorted to speeding up my inhalations in order to extract from the cell what little oxygen it contained when suddenly i was refreshed by a current of clean air scented with a salty aroma it had to be a sea breeze life-giving and charged with iodine i opened my mouth wide and my lungs glutted themselves on the fresh particles at the same time i felt a swaying a rolling of moderate magnitude but definitely noticeable this boat this sheet-iron monster had obviously just risen to the surface of the ocean there to breathe in good whale fashion so the ship's mode of ventilation was finally established when i had absorbed a chestful of this clean air i looked for the conduit the air carrier if you prefer that allowed this beneficial influx to reach us and i soon found it above the door opened an air vent that let in the fresh current of oxygen renewing the thin air in our cell i had gotten to this point in my observations when ned and conseil woke up almost simultaneously under the influence of this reviving air purification they rubbed their eyes stretched their arms and sprang to their feet did master sleep well conseil asked me with his perennial good manners extremely well my gallant lad i replied and how about you mr ned land like a log professor but i must be imagining things because it seems like i'm breathing a sea breeze a seaman couldn't be wrong on this topic and i told the canadian what had gone on while he slept good he said that explains perfectly all that bellowing we heard when our so-called narwhal lay in sight of the abraham lincoln perfectly mr land it was catching its breath only i've no idea what time it is professor aronnax unless maybe it's dinner time dinner time my fine harpooner i'd say at least breakfast time because we've certainly woken up to a new day which indicates conseil replied that we've spent twenty-four hours in slumber that's my assessment i replied i won't argue with you ned land answered but dinner or breakfast that steward will be plenty welcome whether he brings the one or the other the one and the other conseil said well put the canadian replied we deserve two meals and speaking for myself i'll do justice to them both all right ned let's wait and see i replied it's clear that these strangers don't intend to let us die of hunger otherwise last evening's dinner wouldn't make any sense unless they're fattening us up ned shot back i have jacked i replied we have not fallen into the hands of cannibals just because they don't make a habit of it the canadian replied in all seriousness doesn't mean they don't indulge from time to time who knows maybe these people have gone without fresh meat for a long while and in that case three healthy well-built specimens like the professor the manservant and me get rid of those ideas mr land i answered the harpooner and above all don't let them lead you to flare up against our hosts which would only make our situation worse anyhow the harpooner said i'm as hungry as all hades and dinner or breakfast not one puny meal has arrived mr land i answered 
we have to adapt to the schedule on board and i imagine our stomachs are running ahead of the chief cook's dinner bell well then we'll adjust our stomachs to the chef's timetable conseil replied serenely there you go again conseil my friend the impatient canadian shot back you never allow yourself any displays of bile or attacks of nerves you're everlastingly calm you'd say your after meal grace even if you didn't get any food for your before meal blessing and you'd starve to death rather than complain what good would it do conseil asked complaining doesn't have to do good it just feels good and if these pirates i say pirates out of consideration for the professor's feelings since he doesn't want us to call them cannibals if these pirates think they're going to smother me in this cage without hearing my cuss words spice up my outbursts they've got another thing coming look here professor aronnax speak frankly how long do you figure they'll keep us in this iron box to tell the truth friend land i know little more about it than you do but in a nutshell what do you suppose is going on my supposition is that sheer chance has made us privy to an important secret now then if the crew of this underwater boat have a personal interest in keeping that secret and if their personal interest is more important than the lives of three men i believe that our very existence is in jeopardy if such is not the case then at the first available opportunity this monster that has swallowed us will return us to the world inhabited by our own kind unless they recruit us to serve on the crew conseil said and keep us here till the moment ned land answered when some frigate that's faster or smarter than abraham lincoln captures this den of buccaneers then hangs all of us by the neck from the tip of the mainmast yardarm well thought out mr land i replied but as yet i don't believe we've been tendered any enlistment offers consequently it's pointless to argue about what tactics we should pursue in such a case i repeat let's wait let's be guided by events and let's do nothing since right now there's nothing we can do on the contrary professor the harpooner replied not wanting to give in there is something we can do oh and what mr land break out of here breaking out of a prison on shore is difficult enough but with an underwater prison it strikes me as completely unworkable come now ned my friend conseil asked how would you answer master's objection i refuse to believe that an american is at the end of his tether visibly baffled the harpooner said nothing under the conditions in which fate had left us it was absolutely impossible to escape but a canadian's wits is half french and mr ned land made this clear in his reply so professor aronnax he went on after thinking for a few moments you haven't figured out what people do when they can't escape from their prison no my friend easy they fix things so they stay there of course conseil put in since we're deep in the ocean being inside this boat is vastly preferable to being above it or below it but we fix things by kicking out all the jailers guards and wardens ned land added what's this ned i asked you'd seriously consider taking over this craft very seriously the canadian replied it's impossible and why is that sir some promising opportunity might come up and i don't see what could stop us from taking advantage of it if there are only about twenty men on board this machine i don't think they can stave off two frenchmen and a canadian it seemed wiser to accept the harpooner's proposition than to debate it accordingly i was content to reply let such circumstances come mr land and we'll see but until then i beg you to control your impatience we need to act shrewdly and your flare-ups won't give rise to any promising opportunities so swear to me that you'll accept our situation without throwing a tantrum over it i give you my word professor ned land replied in an unenthusiastic tone no vehement phrases will leave my mouth no vicious gestures will give my feelings away not even when they don't feed us on time i have your word ned i answered the canadian 
then our conversation petered out and each of us withdrew into his own thoughts for my part despite the harpooner's confident talk i admit that i entertained no illusions i had no faith in those promising opportunities that ned land mentioned to operate with such efficiency this underwater boat had to have a sizable crew so if it came to a physical contest we would be facing an overwhelming opponent besides before we could do anything we had to be free and that we definitely were not i didn't see any way out of this sheet iron hermetically sealed cell and if the strange commander of this boat did have a secret to keep which seemed rather likely he would never give us freedom of movement aboard his vessel now then would he resort to violence in order to be rid of us or would he drop us off one day on some remote coast there lay the unknown all these hypotheses seemed extremely plausible to me and to hope for freedom through use of force you had to be a harpooner i realized moreover that ned land's brooding was getting him madder by the minute little by little i heard those aforesaid cuss words welling up in the depths of his gullet and i saw his movements turn threatening again he stood up pacing in circles like a wild beast in a cage striking the walls with his foot and fist meanwhile the hours passed our hunger nagged unmercifully and this time the steward did not appear which amounted to forgetting our castaway status for much too long if they really had good intentions toward us tortured by the growling of his well-built stomach ned land was getting more and more riled and despite his word of honor i was in real dread of an explosion when he stood in the presence of one of the men on board for two more hours ned land's rage increased the canadian shouted and pleaded but to no avail the sheet iron walls were deaf i didn't hear a single sound inside this dead seeming boat the vessel hadn't stirred because i obviously would have felt its hull vibrating under the influence of the propeller it had undoubtedly sunk into the watery deep and no longer belonged to the outside world all this dismal silence was terrifying as for our neglect our isolation in the depths of this cell i was afraid to guess at how long it might last little by little hopes i had entertained after our interview with the ship's commander were fading away the gentleness of the man's gaze the generosity expressed in his facial features the nobility of his bearing all vanished from my memory i saw this mystifying individual anew for what he inevitably must be cruel and merciless i viewed him as outside humanity beyond all feelings of compassion the implacable foe of his fellow man toward whom he must have sworn an undying hate but even so was the man going to let us die of starvation locked up in this cramped prison exposed to those horrible temptations to which people are driven by extreme hunger this grim possibility took on a dreadful intensity in my mind and fired by my imagination i felt an unreasoning terror run through me conseil stayed calm ned land bellowed just then a noise was audible outside footsteps rang on the metal tiling the locks were turned the door opened the steward appeared before i could make a single movement to prevent him the canadian rushed at the poor man threw him down held him by the throat the steward was choking in the grip of those powerful hands Conseil was already trying to loosen the harpooner's hands from his half-suffocated victim, and I had gone to join in the rescue when I was abruptly nailed to the spot by these words pronounced in French. Calm down, Mr. Land, and you, Professor, kindly listen to me. End of chapter 9「Part 1 Chapter 10 of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea – An Underwater Tour of the World » by Jules Verne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Chapter 10 – The Man of the Waters It was the ship's commander who had just spoken. At these words, Ned Land stood up quickly nearly strangled the steward staggered out at the signal from his superior 
but such was the commander's authority aboard his vessel not one gesture gave away the resentment that this man must have felt toward the canadian in silence we waited for the outcome of this scene conseil in spite of himself seemed almost fascinated i was stunned arms crossed leaning against a corner of the table the commander studied us with great care was he reluctant to speak further did he regret those words he had just pronounced in french you would have thought so after a few moments of silence which none of us would have dreamed of interrupting gentlemen he said in a calm penetrating voice i speak french english german and latin with equal fluency hence i could have answered you as early as our initial interview but first i wanted to make your acquaintance and then think things over your four versions of the same narrative perfectly consistent by and large established your personal identities for me i now know that sheer chance has placed in my presence professor pierre aranax specialist in natural history at the paris museum and entrusted with a scientific mission abroad his manservant conseil and ned land a harpooner of canadian origin aboard the abraham lincoln a frigate in the national navy of the united states of america i bowed in agreement the commander hadn't put a question to me so no answer was called for this man expressed himself with perfect ease and without a trace of an accent his phrasing was clear his words well chosen his facility in elocution remarkable and yet to me he didn't have the feel of a fellow countryman he went on with the conversation as follows no doubt sir you've felt i waited rather too long before paying you this second visit after discovering your identities i wanted to weigh carefully what policy to pursue towards you i had great difficulty deciding some extremely inconvenient circumstances have brought you into the presence of a man who has cut himself off from humanity your coming has disrupted my whole existence unintentionally i said unintentionally the stranger replied raising his voice a little was it unintentionally that the abraham lincoln hunted me on every sea was it unintentionally that you traveled aboard that frigate was it unintentionally that your shells bounced off my ship's hull was it unintentionally that mr ned land hit me with his harpoon i detected a controlled irritation in these words but there was a perfectly natural reply to these charges and i made it sir i said you're surely unaware of the discussions that have taken place in europe and america with yourself as the subject you don't realize that various accidents caused by collisions with your underwater machine have aroused public passions on those two continents i'll spare you the innumerable hypotheses with which we've tried to explain this inexplicable phenomenon whose secret is yours alone but please understand that the abraham lincoln chased you over the pacific high seas in belief it was hunting some powerful marine monster which had to be purged from the ocean at all cost a half smile curled the commander's lips then in a calmer tone professor aranax he replied do you dare claim that your frigate wouldn't have chased and cannonaded an underwater boat as readily as a monster this question baffled me since commander farragut would certainly have shown no such hesitation he would have seen it as his sworn duty to destroy a contrivance of this kind just as promptly as a gigantic narwhal so you understand sir the stranger went on that i have a right to treat you as my enemy i kept quiet with good reason what was the use of debating such a proposition when superior force can wipe out the best arguments it took me a good while to decide the commander went on nothing obliged me to grant you hospitality if i were to part company with you i'd have no personal interest in ever seeing you again i could put you back on the platform of this ship that has served as your refuge i could sink under the sea and i could forget you ever existed wouldn't that be my right perhaps it would be the right of a savage i replied but not that of a civilized man professor the commander replied swiftly 
i'm not what you term a civilized man i've severed all ties with society for reasons that i alone have the right to appreciate therefore i obey none of its regulations and i insist that you never invoke them in front of me this was plain speaking a flash of anger and scorn lit up the stranger's eyes and i glimpsed a fearsome past in this man's life not only had he placed himself beyond human laws he had rendered himself independent out of all reach free in the strictest sense of the word for who would dare chase him to the depths of the sea when he thwarted all attacks on the surface what ship could withstand a collision with his underwater monitor what armor plate no matter how heavy could bear the thrusts of his spur no man among men could call him to account for his actions god if he believed in him his conscience if he had one these were the only judges to whom he was answerable these thoughts swiftly crossed my mind while this strange individual fell silent like someone completely self-absorbed i regarded him with a mixture of fear and fascination in the same way no doubt that oedipus regarded the sphinx after a fairly long silence the commander went on with our conversation so i had difficulty deciding he said but i concluded that my personal interests could be reconciled with that natural compassion to which every human being has a right since fate has brought you here you'll stay aboard my vessel you'll be free here and in exchange for that freedom moreover totally related to it i'll lay on you just one condition your word that you'll submit to it will be sufficient go on sir i replied i assume this condition is one an honest man can accept yes sir just this it's possible that certain unforeseen events may force me to confine you to your cabins for some hours or even for some days as the case may be since i prefer never to use violence i expect from you in such a case even more than in any other your unquestioning obedience by acting in this way i shield you from complicity i absolve you of all responsibility since i myself make it impossible for you to see what you aren't meant to see do you accept this condition so things happened on board that were quite odd to say the least things never to be seen by people not placing themselves beyond society's laws among all the surprises the future had in store for me this would not be the mildest we accept i replied only i'll ask your permission sir to address a question to you just one go ahead sir you said we'd be free aboard your vessel completely then i would ask what you mean by this freedom why the freedom to come go see and even closely observe everything here except under certain rare circumstances in short the freedom we ourselves enjoy my companions and i it was obvious that we did not understand each other pardon me sir i went on but that's merely the freedom that every prisoner has the freedom to pace his cell that's not enough for us nevertheless it will have to do what we must give up seeing our homeland friends and relatives ever again yes sir but giving up that intolerably earthly yoke that some men call freedom is perhaps less painful than you think by thunder ned land shouted i'll never promise i won't try getting out of here i didn't ask for such a promise mr land the commander replied coldly sir i replied flaring up in spite of myself you're taking unfair advantage of us this is sheer cruelty no sir it is an act of mercy you are my prisoners of war i've cared for you when with a single word i could plunge you back into the ocean depths you attacked me you've just stumbled on a secret no living man must probe the secret of my entire existence do you think i'll send you back to a world that must know nothing more of me never by keeping you on board it isn't you whom i care for it's me these words indicated that the commander pursued a policy impervious to arguments then sir i went on you give us quite simply a choice between life and death quite simply 
my friends i said to a question couched in these terms our answer can be taken for granted but no solemn promises bind us to the commander of this vessel none sir the stranger replied then in a gentler voice he went on now allow me to finish what i have to tell you i've heard of you professor aronnax you if not your companions won't perhaps complain too much about the stroke of fate that has brought us together among the books that make up my favorite reading you'll find the work you've published on the great ocean depths i've pored over it you've taken your studies as far as terrestrial science can go but you don't know everything because you haven't seen everything let me tell you professor you won't regret the time you spend aboard my vessel you're going to voyage through a land of wonders stunned amazement will probably be your habitual state of mind it will be a long while before you tire of the sights constantly before your eyes i'm going to make another underwater tour of the world perhaps my last who knows and i'll review everything i've studied in the depths of these seas that i've crossed so often and you can be my fellow student starting this very day you'll enter a new element you'll see what no human being has ever seen before since my men and i no longer count and thanks to me you're going to learn the ultimate secrets of our planet i can't deny it the commander's words had a tremendous effect on me he had caught me on my weak side and i momentarily forgot that not even this sublime experience was worth the loss of my freedom besides i counted on the future to resolve this important question so i was content to reply sir even though you've cut yourself off from humanity i can see that you haven't disowned all human feeling we're castaways whom you've charitably taken aboard we'll never forget that speaking for myself i don't rule out that the interests of science could override even the need for freedom which promises me that in exchange our encounter will provide great rewards i thought the commander would offer me his hand to seal our agreement he did nothing of the sort i regretted that one last question i said just as this inexplicable being seemed ready to withdraw ask it professor by what name am i to call you sir the commander replied to you i'm simply captain nemo to me you and your companions are simply passengers on the nautilus editor's note in latin nemo means no one captain nemo called out a steward appeared the captain gave him his orders in that strange language i couldn't even identify then turning to the canadian at conseil a meal is waiting for you in your cabin he told him kindly follow this man that's an offer i can't refuse the harpooner replied after being confined for over thirty hours he and conseil were finally out of this cell and now professor aronnax our own breakfast is ready allow me to lead the way yours to command captain i followed captain nemo and as soon as i passed through the doorway i went down a kind of electrically lit passageway that resembled a gangway on a ship after a stretch of some ten meters a second door opened before me i then entered a dining room decorated and furnished in austere good taste inlaid with ebony trim tall oaken sideboards stood at both ends of this room and sparkling on their shelves were staggered rows of earthenware porcelain and glass of incalculable value there silver-plated dinnerware gleamed under rays pouring from light fixtures in the ceiling whose glare was softened and tempered by delicately painted designs in the center of this room stood a table richly spread captain nemo indicated the place i was to occupy be seated he told me and eat like the famished man you must be our breakfast consisted of several dishes whose contents were all supplied by the sea and some foods whose nature and derivation were unknown to me they were good i admit but with a peculiar flavor to which i would soon grow accustomed these various food items seemed to be rich in phosphorus and i thought that they too must have been of marine origin captain nemo stared at me i had asked him nothing 
but he read my thoughts and on his own he answered the questions i was itching to address him most of these dishes are new to you he told me but you can consume them without fear they're healthy and nourishing i renounced terrestrial foods long ago and i'm none the worse for it my crew are strong and full of energy and they eat what i eat so i said all these foods are products of the sea yes professor the sea supplies all my needs sometimes i cast my nets in our wake and i pull them up ready to burst sometimes i go hunting right in the midst of this element that has long seemed so far out of man's reach and i corner the game that dwells in my underwater forests like the flocks of old proteus king neptune's shepherd my herds graze without fear on the ocean's immense prairies there i own vast properties that i harvest myself and which are forever sown by the hand of the creator of all things i stared at captain nemo in definite astonishment and i answered him sir i understand perfectly how your nets can furnish excellent fish for your table i understand less how you can chase aquatic game in your underwater forests but how a piece of red meat no matter how small can figure in your menu that i don't understand at all nor i sir captain nemo answered me i never touch the flesh of land animals nevertheless this i went on pointing to a dish where some slices of loin were still left what you believe to be red meat professor is nothing other than loin of sea turtle similarly here are some dolphin livers you might mistake for stewed pork my chef is a skillful food processor who excels at pickling and preserving these various exhibits from the ocean feel free to sample all of these foods here are some preserves of sea cucumber that a malaysian would declare to be unrivaled in the entire world here's cream from milk furnished by the udders of the cetacean and sugar from the huge fucus plants in the north sea and finally allow me to offer you some marmalade of sea anemone equal to that from the tastiest fruits so i sampled away more as a curiosity seeker than an epicure while captain nemo delighted me with his incredible anecdotes but this sea professor aronnax he told me this prodigious inexhaustible wet nurse of a sea not only feeds me she dresses me as well that fabric covering you was woven from the masses of filaments that anchor certain seashells as the ancients were wont to do it was dyed with purple ink from the murex snail and shaded with violet tints that i extract from a marine slug the mediterranean sea hare the perfumes you find on the washstand in your cabin were produced from the oozings of marine plants your mattress was made from the ocean's softest eel grass your quill pen will be a whalebone your ink a juice secreted by cuttlefish or squid everything comes to me from the sea just as some day everything will return to it you love the sea captain yes i love it the sea is the be-all and end-all it covers seven-tenths of the planet earth its breath is clean and healthy it's an immense wilderness where a man is never lonely because he feels life astir on every side the sea is simply the vehicle for a prodigious unearthly mode of existence it's simply movement and love it's living infinity as one of your poets put it and in essence professor nature is here made manifest by all three of her kingdoms mineral vegetable and animal the last of these is amply represented by the four zoophyte groups three classes of articulates five classes of mollusks and three vertebrate classes mammals reptiles and those countless legions of fish an infinite order of animals totaling more than thirteen thousand species of which only one-tenth belong to fresh water the sea is a vast pool of nature our globe began with the sea so to speak and who can say we won't end with it here lies supreme tranquillity the sea doesn't belong to tyrants on its surface they can still exercise their iniquitous claims battle each other devour each other haul every earthly horror but thirty feet below sea level their dominion ceases their influence fades their power vanishes ah sir live live in the heart of the seas here alone lies independence here i recognize no superiors here i am free 
captain nemo suddenly fell silent in the midst of this enthusiastic outpouring he had let himself get carried away past the bounds of his habitual reserve had he said too much for a few moments he strolled up and down all a quiver then his nerves grew calmer his facial features recovered their usual icy composure and turning to me now professor he said if you'd like to inspect the nautilus i'm yours to command End of chapter 10part one chapter eleven of twenty thousand leagues under the sea an underwater tour of the world by jules verne this librivox recording is in the public domain recorded by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana chapter eleven the nautilus captain nemo stood up i followed him contrived at the rear of the dining room a double door opened and i entered a room whose dimensions equaled the one i had just left it was a library tall black rosewood bookcases inlaid with copperwork held on their wide shelves a large number of uniformly bound books these furnishings followed the contours of the room their lower parts leading to huge couches upholstered in maroon leather and curved for maximum comfort light movable reading stands which could be pushed away or pulled near as desired allowed books to be positioned on them for easy study in the center stood a huge table covered with pamphlets among which some newspapers long out of date were visible electric light flooded this whole harmonious totality falling from four frosted half globes set in the scroll work of the ceiling i stared in genuine wonderment at this room so ingeniously laid out and i couldn't believe my eyes captain nemo i told my host who had just stretched out on the couch this is a library that would do credit to more than one continental palace and i truly marvel to think it can go with you into the deepest seas where could one find greater silence or solitude professor captain nemo replied did your study at the museum afford you such a perfect retreat no sir and i might add that it's quite a humble one next to yours you own six thousand or seven thousand volumes here twelve thousand professor aronnax they are my sole remaining ties with dry land but i was done with the shore the day my nautilus submerged for the first time under the waters that day i purchased my last volumes my last pamphlets my last newspapers and ever since i've chosen to believe that humanity no longer thinks or writes in any event professor these books are at your disposal and you may use them freely i thanked captain nemo and approached the shelves of this library written in every language books on science ethics and literature were there in abundance but i didn't see a single work on economics they seemed to be strictly banned on board one odd detail all these books were shelved indiscriminately without regard to the language in which they were written and this jumble proved that the nautilus's captain could read fluently whatever volumes he chanced to pick up among these books i noted masterpieces by the greats of ancient and modern times in other words all of humanity's finest achievements in history poetry fiction and science from homer to victor hugo from xenophon to michelet from rabelais to madame georges sand but science in particular represented the major investment of this library books on mechanics ballistics hydrography meteorology geography geology etc held a place there no less important than works on natural history and i realized that they made up the captain's chief reading there i saw the complete works of humboldt the complete arago as well as works by foucault henri st clair de ville chassels milne edwards quatrefage john tyndall faraday berthelot father secchi peterman commander maury louis agassiz etc plus the transactions of france's academy of sciences bulletins from the various geographical societies etc and in a prime location those two volumes on the great ocean depths that had perhaps earned me this comparatively charitable welcome from captain nemo 
among the works of joseph bertrand his book entitled the founders of astronomy even gave me a definite date and since i knew it had appeared in the course of eighteen sixty five i concluded that the fitting out of the nautilus hadn't taken place before then accordingly three years ago at the most captain nemo had begun his underwater existence moreover i hoped some books even more recent would permit me to pinpoint the date precisely but i had plenty of time to look for them and i didn't want to put off any longer our stroll through the wonders of the nautilus sir i told the captain thank you for placing this library at my disposal there are scientific treasures here and i'll take advantage of them this room isn't only a library captain nemo said it's also a smoking room a smoking room i exclaimed then one may smoke on board surely in that case sir i'm forced to believe that you've kept up relations with havana none whatever the captain replied try this cigar professor aronnax and even though it doesn't come from havana it will satisfy you if you're a connoisseur i took the cigar offered me whose shape recalled those from cuba but it seemed to be made of gold leaf i lit it at a small brazier supported by an elegant bronze stand and i inhaled my first whiffs with the relish of a smoker who hasn't had a puff in days it's excellent i said but it's not from the tobacco plant right the captain replied this tobacco comes from neither havana nor the orient it's a kind of nicotine-rich seaweed that the ocean supplies me, albeit sparingly. Do you still miss your Cubans, sir? Captain, I scorn them from this day forward. Then smoke these cigars whenever you like, without debating their origin. They bear no government seal of approval, but I imagine they're none the worse for it. On the contrary. Just then Captain Nemo opened a door facing the one by which I had entered the library, and I passed into an immense, splendidly lit lounge. It was a huge quadrilateral with canted corners, ten meters long, six wide, five high. A luminous ceiling, decorated with delicate arabesques, distributed a soft, clear daylight over all the wonders gathered in this museum for a museum it truly was in which clever hands had spared no expense to amass every natural and artistic treasure displaying them with the helter-skelter picturesqueness that distinguishes a painter's studio some thirty pictures by the masters uniformly framed and separated by gleaming panoplies of arms adorned walls on which were stretched tapestries of austere design there i saw canvases of the highest value the likes of which i had marveled at in private european collections and art exhibitions the various schools of the old masters were represented by a raphael madonna a virgin by leonardo da vinci a nymph by correggio a woman by titan an adoration of the magi by veronese an assumption of the virgin by murillo a holbein portrait a monk by Velasquez a martyr by ribera a village fair by rubens two flemish landscapes by tenier three little genre paintings by gerard dow metsu and paul potter two canvases by gericault and proudhon plus seascapes by backhusen and vernet among the works of modern art were pictures signed by delacroix angre de camp troyon meissonnier d'avigny etc and some wonderful miniature statues in marble or bronze modeled after antiquity's finest originals stood on their pedestals in the corners of this magnificent museum as the nautilus's commander had predicted my mind was already starting to fall into that promised state of stunned amazement professor this strange man then said you must excuse the informality with which i receive you and the disorder reigning in this lounge sir i replied without prying into who you are might i venture to identify you as an artist a collector sir nothing more formerly i loved acquiring these beautiful works created by the hand of man i sought them greedily ferreted them out tirelessly and i've been able to gather some objects of great value they are my last mementos of those shores that are now dead for me 
in my eyes your modern artists are already as old as the ancients they've existed for two thousand or three thousand years and i mix them up in my mind the masters are ageless what about these composers i said pointing to sheet music by weber rossini mozart beethoven haydn meyerbeer harold wagner auber gunod victor masse and a number of others scattered over a full-size piano organ which occupied one of the wall panels in this lounge these composers captain nemo answered me are the contemporaries of orpheus because in the annals of the dead all chronological differences fade and i'm dead professor quite as dead as those friends of yours sleeping six feet under captain nemo fell silent and seemed lost in reverie i regarded him with intense excitement silently analyzing his strange facial expression leaning his elbow on the corner of a valuable mosaic table he no longer saw me he had forgotten my very presence i didn't disturb his meditations but continued to pass in review the curiosities that enriched this lounge after the works of art natural rarities predominated they consisted chiefly of plants shells and other exhibits from the ocean that must have been captain nemo's own personal findings in the middle of the lounge a jet of water electrically lit fell back into a basin made from a single giant clam the delicately festooned rim of this shell supplied by the biggest mollusk in the class acephala measured about six meters in circumference so it was even bigger than those fine giant clams given to king francois the first by the republic of venice and which the church of saint sulpice in paris had made into two gigantic holy water fonts around this basin inside elegant glass cases fastened with copper bands there were classified and labeled the most valuable marine exhibits ever put before the eyes of a naturalist my professorial glee may easily be imagined the zoophyte branch offered some very unusual specimens from its two groups the polyps and the echinoderms in the first group organ pipe coral gorgonian coral arranged into fan shapes soft sponges from syria isis coral from the malucca islands sea pen coral wonderful coral from the genus virgilaria from the waters of norway various coral of the genus umbrellularia alcyonarian coral then a whole series of those medropores that my mentor professor milne edwards has so shrewdly classified into divisions and among which i noted the wonderful genus flabellina as well as the genus oculina from reunion island plus a neptune's chariot from the caribbean sea every superb variety of coral and in short every species of these unusual polyparies that congregate to form entire islands that will one day turn into continents among the echinoderms notable for being covered with spines starfish feather stars sea lilies free swimming crinoids brittle stars sea urchins sea cucumbers etc represented a complete collection of the individuals in this group an excitable conchologist would surely have fainted dead away before other more numerous glass cases in which were classified specimens from the mollusk branch there i saw a collection of incalculable value that i haven't time to describe completely among these exhibits i'll mention just for the record an elegant royal hammer shell from the indian ocean whose evenly spaced white spots stood out sharply against a base of red and brown an imperial spiny oyster brightly colored bristling with thorns a specimen rare to european museums whose value i estimated at twenty thousand francs a common hammer shell from the seas near queensland very hard to come by exotic cockles from senegal fragile white bivalve shells that a single breath could pop like a soap bubble several varieties of watering pot shell from java a sort of limestone tube fringed with leafy folds and much fought over by collectors a whole series of top shell snails greenish yellow ones fished up from american seas others colored reddish-brown that patronized the waters off queensland 
the former coming from the gulf of mexico and notable for their overlapping shells the latter some sun carrier shells found in southernmost seas finally and rarest of all the magnificent spurred star shell from new zealand then some wonderful peppery furrow shells several valuable species of cytherea clams and venus clams the trellis wendel trap snail from trunk bar on india's eastern shore a marbled turban snail gleaming with mother-of-pearl green parrot shells from the seas of china the virtually unknown cone snail from the genus coenotilus every variety of cowrie used as money in india and africa a glory of the seas the most valuable shell in the east indies finally common periwinkles delphinula snails turret snails violet snails european cowries volute snails olive shells mitre shells helmet shells murex snails whelks harp shells spiky periwinkles triton snails horn shells spindle shells conch shells spider conchs limpets grass snails sea butterflies every kind of delicate fragile seashell that science has baptized with its most delightful names aside and in special compartments strings of supremely beautiful pearls were spread out the electric light flecking them with little fiery sparks pink pearls pulled from saltwater fan shells in the red sea green pearls from the rainbow abalone yellow blue and black pearls the unusual handiwork of various mollusks from every ocean and of certain mussels from rivers up north in short several specimens of incalculable worth that had been oozed by the rarest of shellfish some of these pearls were bigger than a pigeon egg they more than equaled the one that the explorer tavernier sold the shah of persia for three million francs and they surpassed that other pearl owned by the imam of muscat which i had believed to be unrivaled in the entire world consequently to calculate the value of this collection was i should say impossible captain nemo must have spent millions in acquiring these different specimens and i was wondering what financial resources he tapped to satisfy his collector's fancies when these words interrupted me you're examining my shells professor they are indeed able to fascinate a naturalist but for me they have an added charm since i've collected every one of them with my own two hands and not a sea on the globe has escaped my investigations i understand captain i understand your delight at strolling in the midst of this wealth you are a man who gathers his treasure in person no museum in europe owns such a collection of exhibits from the ocean but if i exhaust all my wonderment on them i'll have nothing left for the ship that carries them i have absolutely no wish to probe those secrets of yours but i confess that my curiosity is aroused to the limit by this nautilus the motor power it contains the equipment enabling it to operate the ultra-powerful force that brings it to life i see some instruments hanging on the walls of this lounge whose purposes are unknown to me may i learn professor aronnax captain nemo answered me i've said you'd be free aboard my vessel so no part of the nautilus is off limits to you you may inspect it in detail and i'll be delighted to act as your guide i don't know how to thank you sir but i won't abuse your good nature i would only ask you about the uses intended for these instruments of physical measure professor these same instruments are found in my stateroom where i'll have the pleasure of explaining their functions to you but beforehand come inspect the cabin set aside for you you need to learn how you'll be lodged aboard the nautilus i followed captain nemo who via one of the doors cut into the lounge's canted corners led me back down the ship's gangways he took me to the bow and there i found not just a cabin but an elegant stateroom with a bed a washstand and various other furnishings i could only thank my host your stateroom adjoins mine he told me opening a door and mine leads into that lounge we've just left i entered the captain's stateroom 
it had an austere almost monastic appearance an iron bedstead a work table some washstand fixtures subdued lighting no luxuries just the bare necessities captain nemo showed me to a bench kindly be seated he told me i sat and he began speaking as follows end of chapter eleven Part 1, Chapter 12 of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, An Underwater Tour of the World by Jules Verne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Chapter 12 Everything Through Electricity. Sir, Captain Nemo said, showing me the instruments hanging on the walls of his stateroom. These are the devices needed to navigate the Nautilus. Here, as in the lounge, I always have them before my eyes, and they indicate my position and exact heading in the midst of the ocean. You're familiar with some of them, such as the thermometer, which gives the temperature inside the Nautilus. The barometer, which measures the heaviness of the outside air and forecasts changes in the weather. The humidistat, which indicates the degree of dryness in the atmosphere. The storm glass, whose mixture decomposes to foretell the arrival of tempests. The compass, which steers my course. The sextant, which takes the sun's altitude and tells me my latitude. Chronometers, which allow me to calculate my longitude. And finally, spyglasses for both day and night enabling me to scrutinize every point of the horizon once the nautilus has risen to the surface of the waves these are the normal navigational instruments i replied and i'm familiar with their uses but no doubt these others answer pressing needs unique to the nautilus that dial i see there with the needle moving across it isn't it a pressure gauge it is indeed a pressure gauge it's placed in contact with the water and it indicates the outside pressure on our hull which in turn gives me the depth at which my submersible is sitting and these are some new breed of sounding line they are thermometric sounding lines that report water temperatures in the different strata and these other instruments whose functions i can't even guess here professor i need to give you some background information captain nemo said so kindly hear me out he fell silent for some moments then he said there is a powerful obedient swift and effortless force that can be bent to any use and which reigns supreme aboard my vessel it does everything it lights me it warms me it is the soul of my mechanical equipment this force is electricity electricity i exclaimed in some surprise yes sir but captain you have a tremendous speed of movement that doesn't square with the strength of electricity until now its dynamic potential has remained quite limited capable of producing only small amounts of power professor captain nemo replied my electricity isn't the run-of-the-mill variety and with your permission i'll leave it at that i won't insist sir and i'll rest content with simply being flabbergasted at your results i would ask one question however which you needn't answer if it's indiscreet the electric cells you use to generate this marvelous force must be depleted very quickly their zinc component for example how do you replace it since you no longer stay in contact with the shore that question deserves an answer captain nemo replied first off i'll mention that at the bottom of the sea there exist veins of zinc iron silver and gold whose mining would quite certainly be feasible but i've tapped none of these land-based metals and i wanted to make demands only on the sea itself for the sources of my electricity the sea itself yes professor and there was no shortage of such sources in fact by establishing a circuit between two wires immersed to different depths 
i'd be able to obtain electricity through the diverging temperatures they experience but i preferred to use a more practical procedure and that is you're familiar with the composition of salt water in 1000 grams one finds 96.5 percent water and about 2.66 percent sodium chloride then small quantities of magnesium chloride potassium chloride magnesium bromide sulfate of magnesia calcium sulfate and calcium carbonate hence you observe that sodium chloride is encountered there in significant proportions now then it's this sodium that i extract from salt water and with which i compose my electric cells sodium yes sir mixed with mercury it forms an amalgam that takes the place of zinc in bunsen cells the mercury is never depleted only the sodium is consumed and the sea itself gives me that beyond this i'll mention that sodium batteries have been found to generate the greater energy and their electromotor strength is twice that of zinc batteries captain i fully understand the excellence of sodium under the conditions in which you're placed the sea contains it fine but it still has to be produced in short extracted and how do you accomplish this obviously your batteries could do the extracting but if i'm not mistaken the consumption of sodium needed by your electric equipment would be greater than the quantity you'd extract it would come about then that in the process of producing your sodium you'd use up more than you'd make accordingly professor i don't extract it with batteries quite simply i utilize the heat of coal from the earth from the earth i said my voice going up on the word we'll say coal from the seafloor if you prefer captain nemo replied and you can mine these veins of underwater coal you'll watch me work them professor aronnax i only ask a little patience of you since you'll have ample time to be patient just remember one thing i owe everything to the ocean it generates electricity and electricity gives the nautilus heat light motion and in a word life itself but not the air you breathe oh i could produce the air needed on board but it would be pointless since i can rise to the surface of the sea whenever i like however even though electricity doesn't supply me with breathable air it at least operates the powerful pumps that store it under pressure in special tanks which if need be allows me to extend my stay in the lower strata for as long as i want captain i replied i'll rest content with marveling you've obviously found what all mankind will surely find one day the true dynamic power of electricity i'm not so certain they'll find it captain nemo replied icily but be that as it may you're already familiar with the first use i've found for this valuable force it lights us and with a uniformity and continuity not even possessed by sunlight now look at that clock it's electric it runs with an accuracy rivaling the finest chronometers i've had it divided into 24 hours like italian clocks since neither day nor night sun nor moon exist for me but only this artificial light that i import into the depths of the seas see right now it's 10 o'clock in the morning that's perfect another use for electricity that dial hanging before your eyes indicates how fast the nautilus is going an electric wire puts it in contact with the patent log this needle shows me the actual speed of my submersible and hold on just now we're proceeding at a moderate pace of 15 miles an hour it's marvelous i replied and i truly see captain how right you are to use this force it's sure to take the place of wind water and steam but that's not all professor aronnax captain nemo said standing up and if you'd care to follow me we'll inspect the nautilus's stern in essence i was already familiar with the whole forward part of this underwater boat and here are its exact subdivisions going from amidships to its spur 
the dining room five meters long and separated from the library by a watertight bulkhead in other words it couldn't be penetrated by the sea the library five meters long the main lounge ten meters long separated from the captain's stateroom by a second watertight bulkhead the aforesaid stateroom five meters long mine 2.5 meters long and finally air tanks 7.5 meters long and extending to the stem post total a length of 35 meters doors were cut into the watertight bulkheads and were shut hermetically by means of india rubber seals which ensured complete safety aboard the nautilus in the event of a leak in any one section i followed captain nemo down gangways located for easy transit and i arrived amidships there i found a sort of shaft heading upward between two watertight bulkheads an iron ladder clamped to the wall led to the shaft's upper end i asked the captain what this ladder was for it goes to the skiff he replied what you have a skiff i replied in some astonishment surely an excellent longboat light and unsinkable which is used for excursions and fishing trips but when you want to set out don't you have to return to the surface of the sea by no means the skiff is attached to the top side of the nautilus's hull and is set in a cavity expressly designed to receive it it's completely decked over absolutely watertight and held solidly in place by bolts this ladder leads to a manhole cut into the nautilus's hull and corresponding to a comparable hole cut in the side of the skiff i insert myself through this double opening into the longboat my crew close up the hole belonging to the nautilus i close up the one belonging to the skiff simply by screwing it into place i undo the bolts holding the skiff to the submersible and the longboat rises with prodigious speed to the surface of the sea i then open the deck paneling carefully closed until that point i up mast and hoist sail or i take out my oars and i go for a spin but how do you return to the ship i don't professor aranax the nautilus returns to me at your command at my command an electric wire connects me to the ship i fire off a telegram and that's that right i said tipsy from all these wonders nothing to it after passing the well of the companionway that led to the platform i saw a cabin two meters long in which conseil and ned land enraptured with their meal were busy devouring it to the last crumb then a door opened into the galley three meters long and located between the vessel's huge storage lockers there even more powerful and obedient than gas electricity did most of the cooking arriving under the stoves wires transmitted to platinum griddles a heat that was distributed and sustained with perfect consistency it also heated a distilling mechanism that via evaporation supplied excellent drinking water next to this gallery was a bathroom conveniently laid out with faucets supplying hot or cold water at will after the galley came the crew's quarters five meters long but the door was closed and i couldn't see its accommodations which might have told me the number of men it took to operate the nautilus at the far end stood a fourth watertight bulkhead separating the crew's quarters from the engine room a door opened and i stood in the compartment where captain nemo indisputably a world-class engineer had set up his locomotive equipment brightly lit the engine room measured at least 20 meters in length it was divided by function into two parts the first contained the cells for generating electricity the second that mechanism transmitting movement to the propeller right off i detected an odor permeating the compartment that was sui generis editor's note latin phrase meaning in a class by itself captain nemo noticed the negative impression it made on me that he told me is a gaseous discharge caused by our use of sodium but it's only a mild inconvenience in any event every morning we sanitize the ship by ventilating it in the open air meanwhile i examined the nautilus's engine with a fascination easy to imagine 
you observe captain nemo told me that i use bunsen cells not rumkorff cells the latter would be ineffectual one uses fewer bunsen cells but they're big and strong and experience has proven their superiority the electricity generated here makes its way to the stern where electromagnets of huge size activate a special system of levers and gears that transmit movement to the propeller's shaft the latter has a diameter of six meters a pitch of seven point five meters and can do up to one hundred and twenty revolutions per minute and that gives you a speed of fifty miles per hour there lay a mystery but i didn't insist on exploring it how could electricity work with such power where did this nearly unlimited energy originate was it in the extraordinary voltage obtained from some new kind of induction coil could its transmission have been immeasurably increased by some unknown system of levers this was the point i couldn't grasp author's note and sure enough there is now talk of such a discovery in which a new set of levers generates considerable power did its inventor meet up with captain nemo captain nemo i said i'll vouch for the results and not try to explain them i've seen the nautilus at work out in front of the abraham lincoln and i know where i stand on its speed but it isn't enough just to move we have to see where we're going we must be able to steer right or left up or down how do you reach the lower depths where you meet an increasing resistance that's assessed in hundreds of atmospheres how do you rise back to the surface of the ocean finally how do you keep your ship at whatever level suits you am i indiscreet in asking you all these things not at all professor the captain answered me after a slight hesitation since you'll never leave this underwater boat come into the lounge it's actually our workroom and there you'll learn the full story about the nautilus end of chapter twelve part one chapter thirteen of twenty thousand leagues under the sea an underwater tour of the world by jules verne this librivox recording is in the public domain recorded by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana chapter thirteen some figures a moment later we were seated on a couch in the lounge cigars between our lips the captain placed before my eyes a working drawing that gave the ground plan cross section and side view of the nautilus then he began his description as follows here professor aronnax are the different dimensions of this boat now transporting you it's a very long cylinder with conical ends it noticeably takes the shape of a cigar a shape already adopted in london for several projects of the same kind the length of this cylinder from end to end is exactly seventy meters and its maximum breadth of beam is eight meters so it isn't quite built on the ten to one ratio of your high-speed steamers but its lines are sufficiently long and their tapering gradual enough so that the displaced water easily slips past and poses no obstacle to the ship's movements these two dimensions allow you to obtain via a simple calculation the surface area and volume of the nautilus its surface area totals one thousand eleven point four five square meters its volume is one thousand five hundred and seven point two cubic meters which is tantamount to saying that when it's completely submerged it displaces fifteen hundred cubic meters of water or weighs fifteen hundred metric tons in drawing up plans for a ship meant to navigate underwater i wanted it when floating on the waves to lie nine-tenths below the surface and to emerge only one-tenth consequently under these conditions it needed to displace only nine-tenths of its volume hence one thousand three hundred and fifty six point forty eight cubic meters in other words it was to weigh only that same number of metric tons so i was obliged not to exceed this weight while building it to the aforesaid dimensions 
the nautilus is made up of two hulls one inside the other between them joining them together are iron t-bars that give this ship the utmost rigidity in fact thanks to this cellular arrangement it has the resistance of a stone block as if it were completely solid its plating can't give way it's self-adhering and not dependent on the tightness of its rivets and due to the perfect union of its materials the solidarity of its construction allows it to defy the most violent seas the two hulls are manufactured from boilerplate steel whose relative density is seven point eight times that of water the first hull has a thickness of no less than five centimeters and weighs three hundred and ninety four point nine six metric tons my second hull the outer cover includes a keel fifty centimeters high by twenty five wide which by itself weighs sixty two metric tons this hull the engine the ballast the various accessories and accommodations plus the bulkheads and interior braces have a combined weight of nine hundred and sixty one point five two metric tons which when added to three hundred and ninety four point nine six metric tons gives us the desired total of one thousand three hundred and fifty six point four eight metric tons clear clear i replied so the captain went on when the nautilus lies on the waves under these conditions one-tenth of it does emerge above water now then if i provide some ballast tanks equal in capacity to that one-tenth hence able to hold a hundred and fifty point seventy two metric tons and if i fill them with water the boat then displaces one thousand five hundred and seven point two metric tons or it weighs that much and it would be completely submerged that's what comes about professor these ballast tanks exist within easy access in the lower reaches of the nautilus i open some stopcocks the tanks fill the boat sinks and it's exactly flush with the surface of the water fine captain but now we come to a genuine difficulty if you're able to lie flush with the surface of the ocean that i understand but lower down while diving beneath that surface isn't your submersible going to encounter a pressure and consequently undergo an upward thrust that must be assessed at one atmosphere per every thirty feet of water hence at about one kilogram per each square centimeter precisely sir then unless you fill up the whole nautilus i don't see how you can force it down into the heart of these liquid masses professor captain nemo replied static objects mustn't be confused with dynamic ones or will be open to serious error comparatively little effort is spent in reaching the ocean's lower regions because all objects have a tendency to become sinkers follow my logic here i'm all ears captain when i wanted to determine the increase in weight the nautilus needed to be given in order to submerge i had only to take note of the proportionate reduction in volume that salt water experiences in deeper and deeper strata that's obvious i replied now then if water isn't absolutely incompressible at least it compresses very little in fact according to the most recent calculations this reduction is only point zero 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 four three six per atmosphere or per every thirty feet of depth for instance to go one thousand meters down i must take into account the reduction in volume that occurs under a pressure equivalent to that from a one thousand meter column of water in other words under a pressure of one hundred atmospheres in this instance the reduction would be point zero zero four three six consequently i'd have to increase my weight from one thousand five hundred and two point two metric tons to one thousand five hundred and thirteen point seven seven so the added weight would be only six point five seven metric tons that's all that's all professor aranax and the calculation is easy to check now then i have supplementary ballast tanks capable of shipping one hundred metric tons of water so i can descend to considerable depths when i want to rise again and lie flush with the surface 
all i have to do is expel the water and if i desire that the nautilus emerge above the waves to one-tenth of its total capacity i empty all the ballast tanks completely this logic backed up by figures left me without a single objection i accept your calculations captain i replied and i'd be ill-mannered to dispute them since your daily experience bears them out but at this juncture i have a hunch that we're still left with one real difficulty what's that sir when you're at a depth of one thousand meters the nautilus's plating bears a pressure of one hundred atmospheres if at this point you want to empty the supplementary ballast tanks in order to lighten your boat and rise to the surface your pumps must overcome that pressure of one hundred atmospheres which is one hundred kilograms per each square centimeter this demands a strength that electricity alone can give me captain nemo said swiftly sir i repeat the dynamic power of my engines is nearly infinite the nautilus's pumps have prodigious strength as you must have noticed when their water spouts swept like a torrent over the abraham lincoln besides i use my supplementary ballast tanks only to reach an average depth of fifteen hundred to two thousand meters and that with a view to conserving my machinery accordingly when i have a mind to visit the ocean depths two or three vertical leagues beneath the surface i use maneuvers that are more time-consuming but no less infallible what are they captain i asked here i'm naturally led to telling you how the nautilus is maneuvered i can't wait to find out in order to steer this boat to port or starboard in short to make turns on a horizontal plane i use an ordinary wide-bladed rudder that's fastened to the rear of the stern post and worked by a wheel and tackle but i can also move the nautilus upward and downward on a vertical plane by the simple method of slanting its two fins which are attached to its sides at the center of flotation these fins are flexible able to assume any position and can be operated from inside by means of powerful levers if these fins stay parallel with the boat the latter moves horizontally if they slant the nautilus follows the angle of that slant and under its propeller's thrust either sinks on a diagonal as steep as it suits me or rises on that diagonal and similarly if i want to return more swiftly to the surface i throw the propeller in gear and the water's pressure makes the nautilus rise vertically as an air balloon inflated with hydrogen lifts swiftly into the skies bravo captain i exclaimed but in the midst of the waters how can your helmsman follow the course you've given him my helmsman is stationed behind the windows of the pilot house which protrudes from the top side of the nautilus's hull and is fitted with biconvex glass is glass capable of resisting such pressures perfectly capable though fragile on impact crystal can still offer considerable resistance in 1864 during experiments on fishing by electric light in the middle of the north sea glass panes less than seven millimeters thick were seen to resist a pressure of sixteen atmospheres all the while letting through strong heat generating rays whose warmth was unevenly distributed now then i use glass windows measuring no less than twenty one centimeters at their centers in other words they are thirty times the thickness fair enough captain but if we're going to see we need light to drive away the dark and in the midst of the murky waters i wonder how your helmsman can set astern of the pilot house is a powerful electric reflector whose rays light up the sea for a distance of half a mile oh bravo bravo three times over captain that explains the phosphorescent glow from this so-called narwhal that so puzzled us scientists pertinent to this i'll ask you if the nautilus is running afoul of the scotia which caused such a great uproar was the result of an accidental encounter entirely accidental sir i was navigating two meters beneath the surface of the water when the collision occurred however i could see that it had no dire consequences none sir but as for your encounter with the abraham lincoln professor that troubled me because it's one of the best ships in the gallant american navy but they attacked me and i had to defend myself 
all the same i was content simply to put the frigate in a condition where it could do me no harm it won't have any difficulty getting repairs at the nearest port ah commander i exclaimed with conviction your nautilus is truly a marvelous boat yes professor captain nemo replied with genuine excitement and i love it as if it were my own flesh and blood aboard a conventional ship facing the ocean's perils danger lurks everywhere on the surface of the sea your chief sensation is the constant feeling of an underlying chasm as the dutchman jansen so aptly put it but below the waves aboard the nautilus your heart never fails you there are no structural deformities to worry about because the double hull of this boat has a rigidity of iron no rigging to be worn out by rolling and pitching on the waves no sails for the wind to carry off no boilers for steam to burst open no fires to fear because this submersible is made of sheet iron not wood no coal to run out of since electricity is its mechanical force no collisions to fear because it navigates the watery deep all by itself no storms to brave because just a few meters beneath the waves it finds absolute tranquility there sir there's the ideal ship and if it's true that the engineer has more confidence in a craft than a builder and the builder more than the captain himself you can understand the utter abandon with which i place my trust in this nautilus since i'm its captain builder and engineer all in one captain nemo spoke with winning eloquence the fire in his eyes and the passion in his gestures transfigured him yes he loved his ship the same way a father loves his child but one question perhaps indiscreet naturally popped up and i couldn't resist asking it you're an engineer then captain nemo yes professor he answered me i studied in london paris and new york back in the days when i was a resident of the earth's continents but how were you able to build this wonderful nautilus in secret each part of it professor aronnax came from a different spot on the globe and reached me at a cover address its keel was forged by Crusoe in france its propeller shaft by penn and company in london the sheet iron plates for its hull by laird's in liverpool its propeller by scott's in glasgow its tanks were manufactured by kale and company in paris its engine by krupp in persia its spurs by Motala workshops in sweden its precision instruments by hart brothers in new york etc and each of these suppliers received my specifications under a different name but i went on once these parts were manufactured didn't they have to be mounted and adjusted professor i set up my workshops on a deserted islet in mid-ocean there our nautilus was completed by me and my workmen in other words by my gallant companions whom i've molded and educated then when the operation was over we burned every trace of our stay on that islet which if i could have i'd have blown up from all this may i assume that such a boat costs a fortune an iron ship professor aronnax runs one thousand one hundred and twenty five francs per metric ton now then the nautilus has a burden of one thousand five hundred metric tons consequently it cost one million six hundred and eighty seven thousand francs hence two million including its accommodations and four million francs or five million francs with all the collections and works of art it contains one last question captain nemo ask professor you're rich then infinitely rich sir and without any trouble i could pay off the ten billion franc french national debt i gaped at the bizarre individual who had just spoken these words was he playing on my credulity time would tell end of chapter thirteen part one chapter fourteen of twenty thousand leagues under the sea an underwater tour of the world by jules verne this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana chapter fourteen the black current 
the part of the planet earth that the seas occupy has been assessed at three million eight hundred and thirty two thousand five hundred and fifty eight square myriameters hence more than thirty eight billion hectares this liquid mass totals two billion two hundred and fifty million cubic miles and could form a sphere with a diameter of sixty leagues whose weight would be three quintillion metric tons to appreciate such a number we should remember that a quintillion is to a billion what a billion is to one in other words there are as many billions in a quintillion as ones in a billion now then this liquid mass nearly equals the total amount of water that has poured through all the earth's rivers for the past forty thousand years during prehistoric times an era of fire was followed by an era of water at first there was ocean everywhere then during the silurian period the tops of mountains gradually appeared above the waves islands emerged disappeared beneath temporary floods rose again refused to form continents and finally the earth's geography settled into what we have today solid matter had wrested from liquid matter some thirty seven million six hundred and fifty seven thousand square miles hence twelve billion nine hundred and sixteen million hectares the outlines of the continents allow the seas to be divided into five major parts the frozen arctic and antarctic oceans the indian ocean the atlantic ocean and the pacific ocean the pacific ocean extends north to south between the two polar circles and east to west between america and asia over an expanse of 145 degrees of longitude it's the most tranquil of the seas its currents are wide and slow moving its tides moderate its rainfall abundant and this was the ocean that i was first destined to cross under these strangest of auspices if you don't mind professor captain nemo told me we'll determine our exact position and fix the starting point of our voyage it's fifteen minutes before noon i'm going to rise to the surface of the water the captain pressed an electric bell three times the pumps began to expel water from the ballast tanks on the pressure gauge a needle marked the decreasing pressures that indicated the nautilus's upward progress then the needle stopped here we are the captain said i made my way to the central companionway which led to the platform i climbed its metal steps passed through the open hatches and arrived topside on the nautilus the platform emerged only 80 centimeters above the waves. The Nautilus's bow and stern boasted that spindle-shaped outline that had caused the ship to be compared appropriately to a long cigar. I noted the slight overlap of its sheet iron plates, which resembled the scales covering the bodies of our big land reptiles. So I had a perfectly natural explanation for why, despite the best spyglasses, this boat had always been mistaken for a marine animal. Near the middle of the platform, the skiff was half set in the ship's hull, making a slight bulge. Fore and aft stood two cupolas of moderate height, their sides slanting and partly inset with heavy biconvex glass, one reserved for the helmsman steering the Nautilus, the other for the brilliance of the powerful electric beacon lighting his way. The sea was magnificent the skies clear this long aquatic vehicle could barely feel the broad undulations of the ocean a mild breeze out of the east rippled the surface of the water free of all mist the horizon was ideal for taking sights there was nothing to be seen not a reef not an islet no more abraham lincoln a deserted immenseness raising his sextant captain nemo took the altitude of the sun which would give him his latitude he waited for a few minutes until the orb touched the rim of the horizon while he was taking his sights he didn't move a muscle and the instrument couldn't have been steadier in hands made out of marble noon he said professor whenever you're ready i took one last look at the sea a little yellowish near the landing places of japan 
and I went below again to the main lounge. There the captain fixed his position and used a chronometer to calculate his longitude, which he double-checked against his previous observations of our angles. Then he told me, Professor Aronnax, we're in longitude 137 degrees, 15 minutes west. West of which meridian? I asked quickly, hoping the captain's reply might give me a clue to his nationality. Sir, he answered me, I have chronometers variously set to the meridians of Paris, Greenwich, and Washington, D.C., but in your honor I'll use the one for Paris. This reply told me nothing. I bowed, and the commander went on. We're in longitude 137 degrees, 15 minutes west of the meridian of Paris, and latitude 30 degrees, 7 minutes north, in other words, about 300 miles from the shores of Japan. At noon on this day of November the 8th, we hereby begin our voyage of exploration under the waters. May God be with us, I replied. And now, Professor, the captain added, I'll leave you to your intellectual pursuits. I've set our course east-northeast at a depth of 50 meters. Here are some large-scale charts on which you'll be able to follow that course. The lounge is at your disposal, and with your permission, I'll take my leave. Captain Nemo bowed. I was left to myself, lost in my thoughts. They all centered on the Nautilus's commander. Would I ever learn the nationality of this eccentric man who had boasted of having none? his sworn hate for humanity, a hate that perhaps was bent on some dreadful revenge. What had provoked it? Was he one of those unappreciated scholars, one of those geniuses embittered by the world, as Conseil expressed it, a latter-day Galileo? Or maybe one of those men of science, like America's Commander Maori, whose careers were ruined by political revolutions? I couldn't say yet. As for me, whom fate had just brought aboard his vessel, whose life he had held in the balance, he had received me coolly but hospitably. Only, he never took the hand I extended to him. He never extended his own. For an entire hour I was deep in these musings, trying to probe this mystery that fascinated me so. Then my eyes focused on a huge world map displayed on the table, and I put my finger on the very spot where our just-determined longitude and latitude intersected. Like the continents, the sea has its rivers. These are exclusive currents that can be identified by their temperature and color, the most remarkable being the one called the Gulf Stream. Science has defined the global paths of five chief currents, one in the North Atlantic, a second in the South Atlantic, a third in the North Pacific, a fourth in the South Pacific, and a fifth in the Southern Indian Ocean. Also, it's likely that a sixth current used to exist in the northern Indian Ocean, when the Caspian and Aral Seas joined up with certain large Asian lakes to form a single uniform expanse of water. Now then, at the spot indicated on the world map, one of these seagoing rivers was rolling by, the Kurushio of the Japanese, the Black Current. Heated by perpendicular rays from the tropical sun, it leaves the Bay of Bengal, crosses the Strait of Malacca, goes up the shores of Asia, and curves into the North Pacific as far as the Aleutian Islands, carrying along trunks of camphor trees and other local items, the pure indigo of its warm waters sharply contrasting with the ocean's waves. It was this current the Nautilus was about to cross. I watched it on the map with my eyes, I saw it lose itself in the immenseness of the Pacific, and I felt myself swept along with it when Ned Land and Conseil appeared in the lounge doorway. My two gallant companions stood petrified at the sight of the wonders on display. "'Where are we?' the Canadian exclaimed. "'In the Quebec Museum?' "'Begging master's pardon,' Conseil answered, "'but this seems more like the Sommerard Artifacts Exhibition.' My friends, I replied, signaling them to enter, you're in neither Canada nor France, but securely aboard the Nautilus, fifty meters below sea level. If Master says so, then so be it, Conseil answered. But in all honesty, this lounge is enough to astonish even someone Flemish like myself. 
indulge your astonishment my friend and have a look because there's plenty of work here for a classifier of your talents conseil needed no encouraging bending over the glass cases the gallant lad was already muttering choice words from the naturalist's vocabulary class gastropoda family buchanoidea genus cowrie species cyprea madagascariensis etc meanwhile ned land less dedicated to conchology questioned me about my interview with captain nemo had i discovered who he was where he came from where he was heading how deep he was taking us in short a thousand questions i had no time to answer i told him everything i knew or rather everything i didn't know and i asked him what he had seen or heard on his part haven't seen or heard a thing the canadian replied i haven't even spotted the crew of this boat by any chance could they be electric too electric oh we gods i'm half tempted to believe it but back to you professor aronnax ned land said still hanging on to his ideas can't you tell me how many men are on board ten twenty fifty a hundred i'm unable to answer you mr land and trust me on this for the time being get rid of these notions of taking over the nautilus or escaping from it this boat is a masterpiece of modern technology and i'd be sorry to have missed it many people would welcome the circumstances that have been handed us just to walk in the midst of these wonders so keep calm and let's see what's happening around us see the harpooner exclaimed there's nothing to see nothing we'll ever see from this sheet-iron prison we're simply running around blindfolded ned land was just pronouncing these last words when we were suddenly plunged into darkness utter darkness the ceiling lights went out so quickly my eyes literally ached just as if we had experienced the opposite sensation of going from the deepest gloom to the brightest sunlight we stood stock still not knowing what surprise was waiting for us whether pleasant or unpleasant but a sliding sound became audible you could tell that some panels were shifting over the nautilus's sides it's the beginning of the end ned land said order hydromedusa conseil muttered suddenly through two oblong openings daylight appeared on both sides of the lounge the liquid masses came into view brightly lit by the ship's electric outpourings we were separated from the sea by two panes of glass initially i shuddered at the thought that these fragile partitions could break but strong copper bands secured them giving them nearly infinite resistance the sea was clearly visible for a one mile radius around the nautilus what a sight what pen could describe it who could portray the effects of this light through these translucent sheets of water the subtlety of its progressive shadings into the ocean's upper and lower strata the transparency of salt water has long been recognized its clarity is believed to exceed that of spring water the mineral and organic substances it holds in suspension actually increase its translucency in certain parts of the caribbean sea you could see the sandy bottom with startling distinctiveness as deep as a hundred and forty five meters down and the penetrating power of the sun's rays seems to give out only at a depth of three hundred meters but in this fluid setting traveled by the nautilus our electric glow was being generated in the very heart of the waves it was no longer illuminated water it was liquid light if we accept the hypothesis of the microbiologist ehrenberg who believes these underwater depths are lit up by phosphorescent organisms nature has certainly saved one of her most prodigious sites for the residents of the sea and i could judge for myself from the thousandfold play of the light on both sides i had windows opening over these unexplored depths the darkness in the lounge enhanced the brightness outside and we stared as if this clear glass were the window of an immense aquarium the nautilus seemed to be standing still this was due to the lack of landmarks but streaks of water parted by the ship's spur sometimes threaded before our eyes with extraordinary speed in wonderment we leaned on our elbows before these show windows and our stunned silence remained unbroken until conseil said 
you wanted to see something, Ned, my friend. Well, now you have something to see. How unusual, the Canadian put in, setting aside his tantrums and getaway schemes while submitting to this irresistible allure. A man would have to go an even greater distance just to stare at such a sight. Ah, I exclaimed, I see our captain's way of life. He's found himself a separate world that saves its most astonishing wonders just for him. But where are the fish? The Canadian ventured to observe. I don't see any fish. Why would you care, Ned, my friend? Conseil replied. Since you have no knowledge of them. Me? A fisherman? Ned Land exclaimed. And on this subject a dispute arose between the two friends, since both were knowledgeable about fish, but from totally different standpoints. Everyone knows that fish make up the fourth and last class in the vertebrate branch. They have been quite aptly defined as, quote, cold-blooded vertebrates with a double circulatory system, breathing through gills, and designed to live in the water, end quote. They consist of two distinct series, the series of bony fish, in other words, those whose spines have vertebra made of bone, and cartilaginous fish, in other words, those whose spines have vertebra made of cartilage. Possibly the Canadian was familiar with this distinction, but Conseil knew far more about it, and since he and Ned were now fast friends, he just had to show off. So he told the harpooner, Ned, my friend, you're a slayer of fish, a highly skilled fisherman. You've caught a large number of these fascinating animals, but I'll bet you don't know how they're classified. Sure I do, the harpooner replied in all seriousness. They're classified into fish we eat and fish we don't eat. Spoken like a true glutton, Conseil replied. But tell me, are you familiar with the differences between bony fish and cartilaginous fish? Just maybe, Conseil. And how about the subdivisions of these two large classes? I haven't the foggiest notion, the Canadian replied. All right, listen and learn, Ned, my friend. Bony fish are subdivided into six orders. Primo, the Acanthopterygians, whose upper jaw is fully formed and free-moving, and whose gills take the shape of a comb. This order consists of fifteen families, in other words, three-quarters of all known fish. Example, the common perch. Pretty fair eating, Ned Land replied. Segundo, Conseil went on, the abdominals, whose pelvic fins hang under the abdomen to the rear of the pectorals, but aren't attached to the shoulder bone, an order that's divided into five families and makes up the great majority of freshwater fish. Examples, carp, pike. Ugh, the Canadian put in with distinct scorn. You can keep the freshwater fish. Tertio, Conseil said. The Sabrachians, whose pelvic fins are attached under the pectorals and hang directly from the shoulder bone. This order contains four families. Examples, flatfish, such as sole, turbot, daub, plaice, brill, etc. Excellent! Really excellent! The harpooner exclaimed, interested in fish only from an edible viewpoint. Quarto, Conseil went on unabashed, the apods, with long bodies that lack pelvic fins and are covered by a heavy, often glutinous skin, an order consisting of only one family. Examples, common eels and electric eels. So-so, just so-so, Ned Land replied. Quinto, Conseil said, the Lophobranchians which have fully formed, free-moving jaws, but whose gills consist of little tufts arranged in pairs along their gill arches. This order includes only one family. Examples, seahorses and dragonfish. Bad, very bad, the harpooner replied. Sexto, and last, Conseil said, the plectognaths, whose maxillary bone is firmly attached to the side of the intermaxillary that forms the jaw, and whose palate arch is locked to the skull by sutures that render the jaw immovable, an order lacking true pelvic fins, and which consists of two families. Examples, puffers and moonfish. 
they're an insult to a frying pan the canadian exclaimed are you grasping all this ned my friend asked the scholarly conseil not a lick of it conseil my friend the harpooner replied but keep going because you fill me with fascination as for cartilaginous fish conseil went on unflappably they consist of only three orders good news ned put in primo the cyclostomes whose jaws are fused into a flexible ring and whose gill openings are simply a large number of holes an order consisting of only one family example the lamprey an acquired taste ned land replied segundo the salacians with gills resembling those of the cyclostomes but whose lower jaw is free-moving this order which is the most important in the class consists of two families examples the ray and the shark what ned land exclaimed rays and man-eaters in the same order well conseil my friend on behalf of the rays i wouldn't advise you to put them in the same fish tank tertio conseil replied the sturionians whose gill opening is the usual single slit adorned with a gill cover an order consisting of four genera example the sturgeon ah conseil my friend you saved the best for last in my opinion anyhow and that's all of them yes my gallant ned conseil replied and note well even when one has grasped all this one still knows next to nothing because these families are subdivided into genera subgenera species varieties all right conseil my friend the harpooner said leaning toward the glass panel here come a couple of your varieties now yes fish conseil exclaimed one would think he was in front of an aquarium no i replied because an aquarium is nothing more than a cage and these fish are as free as birds in the air well conseil my friend identify them start naming them ned land exclaimed me conseil replied i'm unable to that's my employer's bailiwick and in truth although the fine lad was a classifying maniac he was no naturalist and i doubt he could tell a bonita from a tuna in short he was the exact opposite of the canadian who knew nothing about classification but could instantly put a name to any fish a triggerfish i said it's a chinese triggerfish ned land replied genus balistes family scleroderma order plectognatha conseil muttered assuredly ned and conseil in combination added up to one outstanding naturalist the canadian was not mistaken cavorting around the nautilus was a school of triggerfish with flat bodies grainy skins armed with stings on their dorsal fins and with four prickly rows of quills quivering on both sides of their tails nothing could have been more wonderful than the skin covering them white underneath gray above with spots of gold sparkling in the dark eddies of the waves around them rays were undulating like sheets flapping in the wind and among these i spotted much to my glee a chinese ray yellowish on its top side a dainty pink on its belly and armed with three stings behind its eyes a rare species whose very existence was still doubted in lockapede's day since that pioneering classifier of fish had seen one only in a portfolio of japanese drawings for two hours a whole aquatic army escorted the nautilus in the midst of their leaping and cavorting while they competed with each other in beauty radiance and speed i could distinguish some green wrasse bewhiskered mullet marked with pairs of black lines white gobies from the genus eleotris with curved caudal fins and violet spots on the back wonderful japanese mackerel from the genus scomber with blue bodies and silver heads glittering azure goldfish whose name by itself gives their full description several varieties of porgy or gilt head some banded gilt head with fins variously blue and yellow some with horizontal heraldic bars and enhanced by a black strip around their caudal area some with color zones and elegantly corseted in their six waistbands 
trumpet fish with flute-like beaks that looked like genuine seafaring woodcocks and were sometimes a meter long japanese salamanders serpentine moray eels from the genus echidna that were six feet long with sharp little eyes and a huge mouth bristling with teeth etc our wonderment stayed at an all-time fever pitch our exclamations were endless ned identified the fish conseil classified them and as for me i was in ecstasy over the verve of their movements and the beauty of their forms never before had i been given the chance to glimpse these animals alive and at large in their native element given such a complete collection from the seas of japan and china i won't mention every variety that passed before our dazzled eyes more numerous than birds in the air these fish raced right up to us no doubt attracted by the brilliant glow of our electric beacon suddenly daylight appeared in the lounge the sheet iron panels slid shut the magical vision disappeared but for a good while i kept dreaming away until the moment my eyes focused on the instruments hanging on the wall the compass still showed our heading as east northeast the pressure gauge indicated a pressure of five atmospheres corresponding to a depth of fifty meters and the electric log gave our speed as fifteen miles per hour i waited for captain nemo but he didn't appear the clock marked the hour of five ned land and conseil returned to their cabin as for me i repaired to my stateroom there i found dinner ready for me it consisted of turtle soup made from the daintiest hawksbill a red mullet with white slightly flaky flesh whose liver when separately prepared makes delicious eating plus loin of imperial angelfish whose flavor struck me as even better than salmon i spent the evening in reading writing and thinking then drowsiness overtook me i stretched out on my eelgrass mattress and fell into a deep slumber while the nautilus glided through the swiftly flowing black current end of chapter fourteen part one chapter fifteen of twenty thousand leagues under the sea an underwater tour of the world by jules verne this librivox recording is in the public domain recorded by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana chapter fifteen an invitation in writing the next day november the ninth i woke up only after a long twelve-hour slumber Conseil, a creature of habit, came to ask how Master's night went, and to offer his services. He had left his Canadian friend sleeping like a man who had never done anything else. I let the gallant lad babble as he pleased, without giving him much in the way of a reply. I was concerned about Captain Nemo's absence during our session the previous afternoon, and I hoped to see him again today. Soon I had put on my clothes which were woven from strands of seashell tissue. More than once their composition provoked comments from Conseil. I informed him that they were made from the smooth, silken filaments with which the fan mussel, a type of seashell quite abundant along Mediterranean beaches, attaches itself to rocks. In olden times, fine fabrics, stockings, and gloves were made from such filaments because they were both very soft and very warm so the nautilus's crew could dress themselves at little cost without needing a thing from cotton growers sheep or silkworms on shore as soon as i was dressed i made my way to the main lounge it was deserted i dove into studying the conchological treasures amassed inside the glass cases i also investigated the huge plant albums that were filled with the rarest marine herbs which although they were pressed and dried still kept their wonderful colors among these valuable water plants i noted various seaweed some cladostephus verticillitus peacock's tails fig-leafed colerpa grain-bearing beauty bushes delicate rose tangle tinted scarlet sea colander arranged into fan shapes mermaids cups that looked like the caps of squat mushrooms and for years had been classified among the zoophytes in short a complete series of algae the entire day passed without my being honored by a visit from captain nemo 
the panels in the lounge didn't open perhaps they didn't want us to get tired of these beautiful things the nautilus kept to an east northeasterly heading a speed of 12 miles per hour and a depth between 50 and 60 meters next day november 10 the same neglect the same solitude i didn't see a soul from the crew ned and conseil spent the better part of the day with me they were astonished at the captain's inexplicable absence was this eccentric man ill did he want to change his plans concerning us but after all as conseil noted we enjoyed complete freedom we were daintily and abundantly fed our host had kept to the terms of his agreement we couldn't complain and moreover the very uniqueness of our situation had such generous rewards in store for us we had no grounds for criticism that day i started my diary of these adventures which has enabled me to narrate them with the most scrupulous accuracy and one odd detail i wrote it on paper manufactured from marine eelgrass early in the morning on november eleventh fresh air poured through the nautilus's interior informing me that we had returned to the surface of the ocean to renew our oxygen supply i headed for the central companionway and climbed onto the platform it was six o'clock i found the weather overcast the sea gray but calm hardly a billow i hoped to encounter captain nemo there would he come i saw only the helmsman imprisoned in his glass-windowed pilot-house seated on the ledge furnished by the hull of the skiff i inhaled the sea's salty aroma with great pleasure little by little the mists were dispersed under the action of the sun's rays the radiant orb cleared the eastern horizon under its gaze the sea caught on fire like a trail of gunpowder scattered on high the clouds were colored in bright wonderful shaded hues and numerous lady fingers warned of day-long winds author's note lady fingers are small thin white clouds with ragged edges but what were mere winds to this nautilus which no storms could intimidate so i was marveling at this delightful sunrise so life-giving and cheerful when i heard someone climbing onto the platform i was prepared to greet captain nemo but it was his chief officer who appeared whom i had already met during our first visit with the captain he advanced over the platform not seeming to notice my presence a powerful spyglass to his eye he scrutinized every point of the horizon with utmost care then his examination over he approached the hatch and pronounced a phrase whose exact wording follows below i remember it because every morning it was repeated under the same circumstances it ran like this natron respach lorni virch what it meant i was unable to say these words pronounced the chief officer went below again i thought the nautilus was about to resume its underwater navigating so i went down the hatch and back through the gangways to my stateroom five days passed in this way with no change in our situation every morning i climbed onto the platform the same phrase was pronounced by the same individual captain nemo did not appear i was pursuing the policy that we had seen the last of him when on november sixteenth while re-entering my stateroom with ned and conseil i found a note addressed to me on the table i opened it impatiently it was written in a script that was clear and neat but a bit old english in style its characters reminding me of german calligraphy the note was worded as follows professor aronnax aboard the nautilus november sixteenth eighteen sixty seven captain nemo invites professor aronnax on a hunting trip that will take place tomorrow morning in his crespo island forests he hopes nothing will prevent the professor from attending and he looks forward with pleasure to the professor's companions joining him captain nemo commander of the nautilus a hunting trip ned land exclaimed and in his forests on crespo island conseil added but does this mean the old boy goes ashore ned land went on that seems to be the gist of it i said rereading the letter well we've got to accept the canadian answered 
Once we're on solid ground, we'll figure out a course of action. Besides, it wouldn't pain me to eat a couple slices of fresh venison. Without trying to reconcile the contradictions between Captain Nemo's professed horror of continents or islands and his invitation to go hunting in a forest, I was content to reply. First, let's look into this Crespo Island. I consulted the world map, and in latitude 32 degrees 40 minutes north and longitude 167 degrees 50 minutes west, I found an islet that had been discovered in 1801 by Captain Crespo, which old Spanish charts called Roca de la Plata, in other words, Silver Rock. So we were about 1,800 miles from our starting point, and by a slight change of heading, the Nautilus was bringing us back toward the southeast. I showed my companions this small, stray rock in the middle of the North Pacific. If Captain Nemo does sometimes go ashore, I told them, at least he only picks desert islands. Ned Land shook his head without replying. Then he and Conseil left me. After supper was served me by the mute and emotionless steward, I fell asleep, but not without some anxieties. When I woke up the next day, November 17, I sensed that the Nautilus was completely motionless. I dressed hurriedly and entered the main lounge. Captain Nemo was there waiting for me. He stood up, bowed, and asked if it suited me to come along. Since he made no allusion to his absence the past eight days, I also refrained from mentioning it, and I simply answered that my companions and I were ready to go with him. Only, sir, I added, I'll take the liberty of addressing a question to you. Address away, Professor Aronnax, and if I'm able to answer, I will. Well then, Captain, how is it that you've severed all ties with the shore, yet you own forests on Crespo Island? Professor, the captain answered me, these forests of mine don't bask in the heat and light of the sun. They aren't frequented by lions, tigers, panthers, or other quadrupeds. They are known only to me. They grow only for me. These forests aren't on land. They are actual underwater forests. Underwater forests, I exclaimed. Yes, Professor. And you're offering to take me to them? Precisely on foot without getting your feet wet while hunting while hunting rifles in hand rifles in hand i stared at the nautilus's commander with an air anything but flattering to the man assuredly i said to myself he's contracted some mental illness he's had a fit that's lasted eight days and isn't over even yet what a shame I liked him better eccentric than insane. These thoughts were clearly readable on my face, but Captain Nemo remained content with inviting me to follow him, and I did so like a man resigned to the worst. We arrived at the dining room where we found breakfast served. Professor Aronnax, the captain told me, I beg you to share my breakfast without formality. We can chat while we eat because, although I promised you a stroll in my forests, I made no pledge to arrange for your encountering a restaurant there. Accordingly, eat your breakfast like a man who'll probably eat dinner only when it's extremely late. I did justice to this meal. It was made up of various fish and some slices of sea cucumber, that praiseworthy zoophyte, all garnished with such highly appetizing seaweed as the Porphyra lacinata and the Laurentia prima fatida. Our beverage consisted of clear water, to which, following the captain's example, I added some drops of a fermented liqueur extracted by the Kamkatka process from the seaweed known by the name Rhodimenia palmata. At first, Captain Nemo ate without pronouncing a single word. Then he told me, Professor, when I proposed that you go hunting in my Crespo forests, you thought I was contradicting myself. When I informed you that it was an issue of underwater forests, you thought I'd gone insane. Professor, you must never make snap judgments about your fellow man. But, Captain, believe me. Kindly listen to me, and you'll see if you have grounds for accusing me of insanity or self-contradiction. I'm all attention. 
professor you know as well as i do that a man can live under water so long as he carries with him his own supply of breathable air for underwater work projects, the workman wears a waterproof suit with his head imprisoned in a metal capsule, while he receives air from above by means of force pumps and flow regulators. That's the standard equipment for a diving suit, I said. Correct, but under such conditions, the man has no freedom. He's attached to a pump that sends him air through an India rubber hose. It's an actual chain that fetters him to the shore. And if we were to be bound in this way to the Nautilus, we couldn't go far either. Then how do you break free? I asked. We use the Ruquayral Deniru's device, invented by two of your fellow countrymen, but refined by me for my own special uses, thereby enabling you to risk these new physiological conditions without suffering any organic disorders. It consists of a tank built from heavy sheet iron, in which I store air under pressure of 50 atmospheres. This tank is fastened to the back by means of straps, like a soldier's knapsack. Its top part forms a box, where the air is regulated by a bellows mechanism, and can be released only at its proper tension. In the Ruquayral device that has been in general use, two India rubber hoses leave this box and feed to a kind of tent that imprisons the operator's nose and mouth. One hose is for the entrance of air to be inhaled, the other for the exit of air to be exhaled, and the tongue closes off the former or the latter, depending on the breather's needs. But in my case, since I face considerable pressures at the bottom of the sea, I needed to enclose my head in a copper sphere, like those found on standard diving suits, and the two hoses for inhalation and exhalation now feed to that sphere. That's perfect, Captain Nemo, but the air you carry must be quickly depleted, and once it contains no more than 15% oxygen, it becomes unfit for breathing. Surely, but as I told you, Professor Aronnax, the Nautilus's pumps enable me to store air under considerable pressure, and given this circumstance, the tank on my diving equipment can supply breathable air for nine or ten hours. I've no more objections to raise, I replied. I'll only ask you, Captain, how can you light your way at the bottom of the ocean? With the Rumkorf device, Professor Aronnax, if the first is carried on the back, the second is fastened to the belt. It consists of a Bunsen battery that I activate, not with potassium dichromate, but with sodium. An induction coil gathers the electricity generated and directs it to a specially designed lantern. In this lantern, one finds a glass spiral that contains only a residue of carbon dioxide gas. When the device is operating, this gas becomes luminous and gives off a continuous whitish light. Thus provided for, I breathe and I see. Captain Nemo, to my every objection you give such crushing answers. I'm afraid to entertain a single doubt. However, though I have no choice but to accept both the Ruquayral and Rumkorf devices, I'd like to register some reservations about the rifle with which you'll equip me. But it isn't a rifle that uses gunpowder, the captain replied. Then it's an air gun? Surely. How can I make gunpowder on my ship when I have no saltpeter, sulfur, or charcoal? Even so, I replied, to fire underwater in a medium that's 855 times denser than air, you'd have to overcome considerable resistance. That doesn't necessarily follow. There are certain Fulton-style guns perfected by the Englishmen, Philippe Coles and Burley, the Frenchman, Fursey, and the Italian, Landy. They are equipped with a special system of airtight fastenings and can fire in underwater conditions. But I repeat, having no gunpowder, I've replaced it with air at high pressure, which is abundantly supplied me by the Nautilus's pumps. But this air must be swiftly depleted. Well, in a pinch, can't my Ruquayral tank supply me with more? All I have to do is draw it from an ad hoc spigot. Editor's note, Latin, a spigot just for that purpose. 
besides professor aronnax you'll see for yourself that during these underwater hunting trips we make no great expenditure of either air or bullets but it seems to me that in this semi-darkness amid this liquid that's so dense in comparison to the atmosphere a gunshot couldn't carry far and would prove fatal only with difficulty on the contrary sir with this rifle every shot is fatal and as soon as the animal is hit no matter how lightly it falls as if struck by lightning why because this rifle doesn't shoot ordinary bullets but little glass capsules invented by the austrian chemist lenaibruck and i have a considerable supply of them these glass capsules are covered with a strip of steel and weighted with a lead base they are genuine little laden jars charged with high voltage electricity they go off at the slightest impact and the animal no matter how strong drops dead i might add that these capsules are no bigger than number four shot and the chamber of any ordinary rifle could hold ten of them i'll quit debating i replied getting up from the table and all that's left is for me to shoulder my rifle so where you go i'll go captain nemo led me to the nautilus's stern and passing by ned and conseil's cabin i summoned my two companions who instantly followed us then we arrived at a cell located within easy access of the engine room in this cell we were to get dressed for our stroll end of chapter 15 part 1 chapter 16 of 20000 leagues under the sea an underwater tour of the world by jules verne this librivox recording is in the public domain Recorded by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Chapter 16 Strolling the Plains. This cell, properly speaking, was the Nautilus's arsenal and wardrobe. Hanging from its walls, a dozen diving outfits were waiting for anybody who wanted to take a stroll. After seeing these, Ned Land exhibited an obvious distaste for the idea of putting one on. But my gallant Ned, I told him, the forests of Crespo Island are simply underwater forests. Oh, great, put in the disappointed harpooner, watching his dreams of fresh meat fade away. And you, Professor Aronnax, are you going to stick yourself inside these clothes? It has to be, Mr. Ned. Have it your way, sir, the harpooner replied, shrugging his shoulders. But speaking for myself, I'll never get into those things unless they force me no one will force you mr land captain nemo said and is conseil going to risk it ned asked where master goes i go conseil replied at the captain's summons two crewmen came to help us put on these heavy waterproof clothes made from seamless india rubber and expressly designed to bear considerable pressures they were like suits of armor that were both yielding and resistant you might say these clothes consisted of jacket and pants the pants ended in bulky footwear adorned with heavy lead soles the fabric of the jacket was reinforced with copper mail that shielded the chest protected it from the water's pressure and allowed the lungs to function freely the sleeves ended in supple gloves that didn't impede hand movements these perfected diving suits it was easy to see were a far cry from such misshapen costumes as the cork breastplates leather jumpers sea-going tunics barrel helmets etc invented and acclaimed in the eighteenth century conseil and i were soon dressed in these diving suits as were captain nemo and one of his companions a herculean type who must have been prodigiously strong all that remained was to encase one's head in its metal sphere but before proceeding with this operation i asked the captain for permission to examine the rifles set aside for us one of the nautilus's men presented me with a streamlined rifle whose butt was boilerplate steel hollow inside and of fairly large dimensions this served as a tank for the compressed air which the trigger operated valve could release into the metal chamber in a groove where the butt was heaviest a cartridge clip held some twenty electric bullets that by means of a spring automatically took their places in the barrel of the rifle as soon as one shot had been fired another was ready to go off 
captain nemo i said this is an ideal easy to use weapon i ask only to put it to the test but how will we reach the bottom of the sea right now professor the nautilus is aground in ten meters of water and we've only to depart but how will we set out you'll see captain nemo inserted his cranium into its spherical headgear conseil and i did the same but not without hearing the canadian toss us a sarcastic happy hunting on top the suit ended in a collar of threaded copper onto which the metal helmet was screwed three holes protected by heavy glass allowed us to see in any direction with simply a turn of the head inside the sphere placed on our backs the roquay rail device went into operation as soon as it was in position and for my part i could breathe with ease the rumcorf lamp hanging from my belt my rifle in hand i was ready to go forth but in all honesty while imprisoned in these heavy clothes and nailed to the deck by my lead soles it was impossible for me to take a single step but this circumstance had been foreseen because i felt myself propelled into a little room adjoining the wardrobe towed in the same way my companions went with me i heard a door with watertight seals close after us and we were surrounded by profound darkness after some minutes a sharp hissing reached my ears i felt a distinct sensation of cold rising from my feet to my chest apparently a stopcock inside the boat was letting in water from outside which overran us and soon filled up the room contrived in the nautilus's side a second door then opened we were lit by a subdued light an instant later our feet were treading the bottom of the sea and now how can i convey the impressions left on me by this stroll under the waters words are powerless to describe such wonders when even the painter's brush can't depict the effects unique to the liquid element how can the writer's pen hope to reproduce them captain nemo walked in front and his companion followed us a few steps to the rear conseil and i stayed next to each other as if daydreaming that through our metal carapaces a little polite conversation might still be possible already i no longer felt the bulkiness of my clothes footwear and air tank nor the weight of the heavy sphere inside which my head was rattling like an almond in its shell once immersed in water all these objects lost a part of their weight equal to the weight of the liquid they displaced and thanks to this law of physics discovered by archimedes i did just fine i was no longer an inert mass and i had comparatively speaking great freedom of movement lighting up the seafloor even thirty feet beneath the surface of the ocean the sun astonished me with its power the solar rays easily crossed this aqueous mass and dispersed its dark colors i could easily distinguish objects one hundred meters away farther on the bottom was tinted with fine shades of ultramarine then off in the distance it turned blue and faded in the midst of a hazy darkness truly this water surrounding me was just a kind of air denser than the atmosphere on land but almost as transparent above me i could see the calm surface of the ocean we were walking on sand that was fine-grained and smooth not wrinkled like beach sand which preserves the impressions left by the waves this dazzling carpet was a real mirror throwing back the sun's rays with startling intensity the outcome an immense vista of reflections that penetrated every liquid molecule will anyone believe me if i assert that at this thirty-foot depth i could see as if it was broad daylight for a quarter of an hour i trod this blazing sand which was strewn with tiny crumbs of seashell looming like a long reef the nautilus's hull disappeared little by little but when night fell in the midst of the waters the ship's beacon would surely facilitate our return on board since its rays carried with perfect distinctness this effect is difficult to understand for anyone who has never seen light beams so sharply defined on shore there the dust that saturates the air gives such rays the appearance of a luminous fog but above water as well as under water shafts of electric light are transmitted with incomparable clarity meanwhile we went ever onward and these vast plains of sand seemed endless 
my hands parted liquid curtains that closed again behind me and my footprints faded swiftly under the water's pressure soon scarcely blurred by their distance from us the forms of some objects took shape before my eyes i recognized the lower slopes of some magnificent rocks carpeted by the finest zoophyte specimens and right off i was struck by an effect unique to this medium by then it was ten o'clock in the morning the sun's rays hit the surface of the waves at a fairly oblique angle decomposing by refraction as though passing through a prism and when this light came in contact with flowers rocks buds seashells and polyps the edges of these objects were shaded with all seven hues of the solar spectrum this riot of rainbow tints was a wonder a feast for the eyes a genuine kaleidoscope of red green yellow orange violet indigo and blue in short the whole palette of a color happy painter if only i had been able to share with conseil the intense sensations rising in my brain competing with him in exclamations of wonderment if only i had known like captain nemo and his companion how to exchange thoughts by means of prearranged signals so for lack of anything better i talked to myself i declaimed inside this copper box that topped my head spending more air on empty words than was perhaps advisable Conseil, like me, had stopped before this splendid sight. Obviously, in the presence of these zoophyte and mollusk specimens, the fine lad was classifying his head off. Polyps and echinoderms abounded on the seafloor, various isis coral, cornelarian coral living in isolation, tufts of virginal genus oculina, formerly known by the name white coral, prickly fungus coral in the shape of mushrooms, sea anemone holding on by their muscular discs providing a literal flower bed adorned by jellyfish from the genus porpita wearing collars of azure tentacles and starfish that spangled the sand including vein-like feather stars from the genus astrophyton that were like fine lace embroidered by the hands of water nymphs their festoons swaying to the faint undulations caused by our walking it filled me with real chagrin to crush underfoot the gleaming mollusk samples that littered the seafloor by the thousands concentric comb shells hammer shells coquina seashells that actually hop around top shell snails red helmet shells angel wing conchs sea hares and so many other exhibits from this inexhaustible ocean but we had to keep walking and we went forward while overhead there scudded schools of portuguese men-o-war that let their ultramarine tentacles drift in their wakes medusas whose milky white or dainty pink parasols were festooned with azure tassels and shaded us from the sun's rays plus jellyfish of the species pelagia panopyra that in the dark would have strewn our path with phosphorescent glimmers all these wonders i glimpsed in the space of a quarter of a mile barely pausing following captain nemo whose gestures kept beckoning me onward soon the nature of the seafloor changed the plains of sand were followed by a bed of that viscous slime americans call ooze which is composed exclusively of seashells rich in limestone or silica then we crossed a prairie of algae open sea plants that the waters hadn't yet torn loose whose vegetation grew in wild profusion soft to the foot these densely textured lawns would have rivaled the most luxuriant carpets woven by the hand of man but while this greenery was sprawling under our steps it didn't neglect us overhead the surface of the water was crisscrossed by a floating arbor of marine plants belonging to that superabundant algae family that numbers more than two thousand known species i saw long ribbons of fucus drifting above me some globular others tubular laurentia cladostephus with the slenderest foliage rhodimenia palmata resembling the fan shapes of cactus i observed that green-colored plants kept closer to the surface of the sea while reds occupied a medium depth which left blacks and browns in charge of designing gardens and flower beds in the ocean's lower strata 
these algae are a genuine prodigy of creation one of the wonders of world flora this family produces both the biggest and smallest vegetables in the world because just as forty thousand near invisible buds have been counted in one five square millimeter space so also have fucus plants been gathered that were over five hundred meters long we had been gone from the nautilus for about an hour and a half it was almost noon i spotted this fact in the perpendicularity of the sun's rays which were no longer refracted the magic of these solar colors disappeared little by little with emerald and sapphire shades vanishing from our surroundings altogether we walked with steady steps that rang on the seafloor with astonishing intensity the tiniest sounds were transmitted with a speed to which the ear is unaccustomed on shore in fact water is a better conductor of sound than air and under the waves noises carry four times as fast just then the seafloor began to slope sharply downward the light took on a uniform hue we reached a depth of one hundred meters by which point we were undergoing a pressure of ten atmospheres but my diving clothes were built along such lines that i never suffered from this pressure i felt only a certain tightness in the joints of my fingers and even this discomfort soon disappeared as for the exhaustion bound to accompany a two-hour stroll in such unfamiliar trappings it was nil helped by the water my movements were executed with startling ease arriving at this three hundred foot depth i still detected the sun's rays but just barely their intense brilliance had been followed by a reddish twilight a midpoint between day and night but we could see well enough to find our way and it still wasn't necessary to activate the rumkorf device just then captain nemo stopped he waited until I joined him, then he pointed a finger at some dark masses outlined in the shadows a short distance away. It's the forest of Crespo Island, I thought, and I was not mistaken. End of chapter 16part one chapter seventeen of twenty thousand leagues under the sea an underwater tour of the world by jules verne this librivox recording is in the public domain recorded by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana chapter seventeen an underwater forest we had finally arrived on the outskirts of this forest surely one of the finest in captain nemo's immense domains he regarded it as his own and had laid the same claim to it that in the first days of the world the first men had to their forests on land besides who else could dispute his ownership of this underwater property what other bolder pioneer would come axe in hand to clear away its dark underbrush this forest was made up of big tree-like plants and when we entered beneath their huge arches my eyes were instantly struck by the unique arrangement of their branches an arrangement that i had never before encountered none of the weeds carpeting the seafloor none of the branches bristling from the shrubbery crept or leaned or stretched on a horizontal plane they all rose straight up towards the surface of the ocean every filament or ribbon no matter how thin stood ramrod straight fucus plants and creepers were growing in stiff perpendicular lines governed by the density of the element that generated them after i parted them with my hands these otherwise motionless plants would shoot right back to their original positions it was the regimen of verticality i soon grew accustomed to this bizarre arrangement likewise to the comparative darkness surrounding us the seafloor in this forest was strewn with sharp chunks of stone that were hard to avoid here the range of underwater flora seemed pretty comprehensive to me as well as more abundant than it might have been in the arctic or tropical zones where such exhibits are less common but for the few minutes i kept accidentally confusing the two kingdoms mistaking zoophytes for water plants animals for vegetables and who hasn't made the same blunder flora and fauna are so closely associated in the underwater world 
i observed that all these exhibits from the vegetable kingdom were attached to the seafloor by only the most makeshift methods they had no roots and didn't care which solid objects secured them sand shells husks or pebbles they didn't ask their hosts for sustenance just a point of purchase these plants are entirely self-propagating and the principle of their existence lies in the water that sustains and nourishes them in place of leaves most of them sprouted blades of unpredictable shape which were confined to a narrow gamut of colors consisting only of pink crimson green olive tan and brown there i saw again but not yet pressed and dried like the nautilus's specimens some peacock's tails spread open like fans to stir up a cooling breeze scarlet rose tangle sea tangle stretching out their young and edible shoots twisting strings of kelp from the genus Nereocystis that bloomed to a height of fifteen meters bouquets of mermaids cups whose stems grew wider at the top and a number of other open sea plants all without flowers it's an odd anomaly in this bizarre element as one witty naturalist puts it the animal kingdom blossoms and the vegetable kingdom doesn't these various types of shrubbery were as big as trees in the temperate zones in the damp shade between them there were clustered actual bushes of moving flowers hedges of zoophytes in which there grew stony coral striped with twisting furrows yellowish sea anemone from the genus caryophylla with translucent tentacles plus anemone with grassy tufts from the genus zoantheria and to complete the illusion minnows flitted from branch to branch like a swarm of hummingbirds while there rose underfoot like a covey of snipe yellowfish from the genus lepisocanthus with bristling jaws and sharp scales flying gurnards and pinecone fish near one o'clock captain nemo gave the signal to halt speaking for myself i was glad to oblige and we stretched out beneath an arbor of winged kelp whose long thin tendrils stood up like arrows this short break was a delight it lacked only the charm of conversation but it was impossible to speak impossible to reply i simply nudged my big copper headpiece against conseil's headpiece i saw a happy gleam in the gallant lad's eyes and to communicate his pleasure he jiggled around inside his carapace in the world's silliest way after four hours of strolling i was quite astonished not to feel any intense hunger what kept my stomach in such a good mood i'm unable to say but in exchange i experienced that irresistible desire for sleep that comes over every diver accordingly my eyes soon closed behind the heavy glass windows and i fell into an uncontrollable doze which until then i had been able to fight off only through the movements of our walking captain nemo and his muscular companion were already stretched out in this clear crystal setting us a fine nap time example how long i was sunk in this torpor i cannot estimate but when i awoke it seemed as if the sun were setting toward the horizon captain nemo was already up and i had started to stretch my limbs when an unexpected apparition brought me sharply to my feet a few paces away a monstrous meter-high sea spider was staring at me with beady eyes poised to spring on me although my diving suit was heavy enough to protect me from this animal's bites i couldn't keep back a shudder of horror just then conseil woke up together with the nautilus's sailor captain nemo alerted his companion to this hideous crustacean which a swing of the rifle butt quickly brought down and i watched the monster's horrible legs writhing in dreadful convulsions this encounter reminded me that other more daunting animals must be lurking in these dark reaches and my diving suit might not be adequate protection against their attacks such thoughts hadn't previously crossed my mind and i was determined to keep on my guard meanwhile i had assumed this rest period would be the turning point in our stroll but i was mistaken and instead of heading back to the nautilus captain nemo continued his daring excursion the seafloor kept sinking and its significantly steeper slope took us to greater depths it must have been nearly three o'clock when we reached a narrow valley gorged between high vertical walls and located a hundred and fifty meters down 
thanks to the perfection of our equipment we had thus gone 90 meters below the limit that nature had until then set on man's underwater excursions i say 150 meters although i had no instruments for estimating this distance but i knew that the sun's rays even in the clearest seas could reach no deeper so at precisely this point the darkness became profound not a single object was visible past ten paces consequently i had begun to grope my way when suddenly i saw the glow of an intense white light captain nemo had just activated his electric device his companion did likewise conseil and i followed suit by turning a switch i established contact between the induction coil and the glass spiral and the sea lit up by our four lanterns was illuminated for a radius of twenty-five meters captain nemo continued to plummet into the dark depths of this forest whose shrubbery grew even more sparse i observed that vegetable life was disappearing more quickly than animal life the open sea plants had already left behind the increasingly arid sea floor where a prodigious number of animals were still swarming zoophytes articulates mollusks and fish while we were walking i thought the lights of our rumkorff devices would automatically attract some inhabitants of these dark strata but if they did approach us at least they kept at a distance regrettable from the hunter's standpoint several times i saw captain nemo stop and take aim with his rifle then after sighting down its barrel for a few seconds he would straighten up and resume his walk finally at around four o'clock this marvelous excursion came to an end a wall of superb rocks stood before us imposing in its sheer mass a pile of gigantic stone blocks an enormous granite cliffside pitted with dark caves but not offering a single gradient we could climb up this was the underpinning of crespo island this was land the captain stopped suddenly a gesture from him brought us to a halt and however much i wanted to clear this wall i had to stop here ended the domains of captain nemo he had no desire to pass beyond them farther on lay a part of the globe he would no longer tread underfoot our return journey began captain nemo resumed the lead in our little band always heading forward without hesitation i noted that we didn't follow the same path in returning to the nautilus this new route very steep and hence very arduous quickly took us close to the surface of the sea but this return to the upper strata wasn't so sudden that decompression took place too quickly which could have led to serious organic disorders and given us those internal injuries so fatal to divers with great promptness the light reappeared and grew stronger and the refraction of the sun already low on the horizon again ringed the edges of various objects with the entire color spectrum at a depth of ten meters we walked amid a swarm of small fish from every species more numerous than birds in the air more agile too but no aquatic game worthy of a gunshot had yet been offered to our eyes just then i saw the captain's weapon spring to his shoulder and track a moving object through the bushes a shot went off i heard a faint hissing and an animal dropped a few paces away literally struck by lightning it was a magnificent sea otter from the genus in hydra the only exclusively marine quadruped one and a half meters long this otter had to be worth a good high price its coat chestnut brown above and silver below would have made one of those wonderful fur pieces so much in demand in the russian and chinese markets the fineness and luster of its pelt guaranteed that it would go for at least two thousand francs i was full of wonderment at this unusual mammal with its circular head adorned by short ears its round eyes its white whiskers like those on a cat its webbed and clawed feet its bushy tail hunted and trapped by fishermen this valuable carnivore has become extremely rare and it takes refuge chiefly in the northernmost parts of the pacific where in all likelihood its species will soon be facing extinction captain nemo's companion picked up the animal loaded it on his shoulder and we took to the trail again 
for an hour plains of sand unrolled before our steps often the seafloor rose to within two meters of the surface of the water i could then see our images clearly mirrored on the underside of the waves but reflected upside down above us there appeared an identical band that duplicated our every movement and gesture in short a perfect likeness of the quartet near which it walked but with heads down and feet in the air another unusual effect heavy clouds passed above us forming and fading swiftly but after thinking it over i realized that these so-called clouds were caused simply by the changing densities of the long ground swells and i even spotted the foaming white caps that their breaking crests were proliferating over the surface of the water lastly i couldn't help seeing the actual shadows of large birds passing over our heads swiftly skimming the surface of the sea on this occasion i witnessed one of the finest gunshots ever to thrill the marrow of a hunter a large bird with a wide wingspan quite clearly visible approached and hovered over us when it was just a few meters above the waves captain nemo's companion took aim and fired the animal dropped electrocuted and its descent brought it within reach of our adroit hunter who promptly took possession of it it was an albatross of the finest species a wonderful specimen of these open sea fowl this incident did not interrupt our walk for two hours we were sometimes led over plains of sand sometimes over prairies of seaweed that were quite arduous to cross in all honesty i was dead tired by the time i spotted a hazy glow half a mile away cutting through the darkness of the waters it was the nautilus's beacon within twenty minutes we would be on board and there i could breathe easy again because my tank's current air supply seemed to be quite low in oxygen but i was reckoning without an encounter that slightly delayed our arrival i was lagging behind some twenty paces when i saw captain nemo suddenly come back toward me with his powerful hands he sent me buckling to the ground while his companion did the same to conseil at first i didn't know what to make of this sudden assault but i was reassured to observe the captain lying motionless beside me i was stretched out on the seafloor directly beneath some bushes of algae when i raised my head and spied two enormous masses hurtling by throwing off phosphorescent glimmers my blood turned cold in my veins i saw that we were under threat from a fearsome pair of sharks they were blue sharks dreadful man-eaters with enormous tails dull glassy stares and phosphorescent matter oozing from holes around their snouts they were like monstrous fireflies that could thoroughly pulverize a man in their iron jaws i don't know if conseil was busy with their classification but as for me i looked at their silver bellies their fearsome mouths bristling with teeth from a viewpoint less than scientific more as a victim than as a professor of natural history luckily these voracious animals have poor eyesight they went by without noticing us grazing us with their brownish fins and miraculously we escaped a danger greater than encountering a tiger deep in the jungle half an hour later guided by its electric trail we reached the nautilus the outside door had been left open and captain nemo closed it after we re-entered the first cell then he pressed a button i heard pumps operating within the ship i felt the water lowering around me and in a few moments the cell was completely empty the inside door opened and we passed into the wardrobe there our diving suits were removed not without difficulty and utterly exhausted faint from lack of food and rest i repaired to my stateroom full of wonder at this startling excursion on the bottom of the sea End of chapter 17part one chapter eighteen of twenty thousand leagues under the sea an underwater tour of the world by jules verne this librivox recording is in the public domain recorded by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana chapter eighteen four thousand leagues under the pacific by the next morning november the eighteenth 
i was fully recovered from my exhaustion of the day before and i climbed onto the platform just as the nautilus's chief officer was pronouncing his daily phrase it then occurred to me that these words either referred to the state of the sea or that they meant quote, there's nothing in sight end quote. and in truth the ocean was deserted not a sail on the horizon the tips of crespo island had disappeared during the night the sea absorbing every color of the prism except its blue rays reflected the latter in every direction and sported a wonderful indigo tint the undulating waves regularly took on the appearance of watered silk with wide stripes i was marveling at this magnificent ocean view when captain nemo appeared he didn't seem to notice my presence and began a series of astronomical observations then his operations finished he went and leaned his elbows on the beacon housing his eyes straying over the surface of the ocean meanwhile some twenty of the nautilus's sailors all energetic well-built fellows climbed onto the platform they had come to pull up the nets left in our wake during the night these seamen obviously belonged to different nationalities although indications of european physical traits could be seen in them all and if i'm not mistaken i recognized some irishmen some frenchmen a few slavs and a native of either greece or crete even so these men were frugal of speech and used among themselves only that bizarre dialect whose origin i couldn't even guess so i had to give up any notions of questioning them the nets were hauled on board they were a breed of trawl resembling those used off the normandy coast huge pouches held half open by a floating pole and a chain laced through the lower meshes trailing in this way from these iron glove makers the resulting receptacles scoured the ocean floor and collected every marine exhibit in their path that day they gathered up some unusual specimens from these fish-filled waterways anglerfish whose comical movements qualified them for the epithet clowns black commerson anglers equipped with their antennas undulating triggerfish encircled by little red bands bloated puffers whose venom is extremely insidious some olive-hued lampreys snipefish covered with silver scales cutlass fish whose electrocuting power equals that of the electric eel and the electric ray scaly featherbacks with brown crosswise bands greenish codfish several varieties of goby etc finally some fish of larger proportions a one meter jack with a prominent head several fine bonito from the genus scomber decked out in the colors blue and silver and three magnificent tuna whose high speeds couldn't save them from our trawl i estimate that this cast of the net brought in more than one thousand pounds of fish it was a fine catch but not surprising in essence these nets stayed in our wake for several hours incarcerating an entire aquatic world in prisons made of thread so we were never lacking in provisions of the highest quality which the nautilus's speed and the allure of its electric light could continually replenish these various exhibits from the sea were immediately lowered down the hatch in the direction of the storage lockers some to be eaten fresh others to be preserved after its fishing was finished and its air supply renewed i thought the nautilus would resume its underwater excursion and i was getting ready to return to my stateroom when captain nemo turned to me and said without further preamble look at this ocean professor doesn't it have the actual gift of life doesn't it experience both anger and affection last evening it went to sleep just as we did and there it is waking up after a peaceful night no hellos or good mornings for this gent you would have thought this eccentric individual was simply continuing a conversation we'd already started see he went on it's waking up under the sun's caresses it's going to relive its daily existence what a fascinating field of study lies in watching the play of its organism it owns a pulse and arteries it has spasms 
and i side with the scholarly commander maury who discovered that it has a circulation as real as the circulation of blood in animals i'm sure that captain nemo expected no replies from me and it seemed pointless to pitch in with ah yes exactly or how right you are rather he was simply talking to himself with long pauses between sentences he was meditating out loud yes he said the ocean owns a genuine circulation and to start it going the creator of all things has only to increase its heat salt and microscopic animal life in essence heat creates the different densities that leads to currents and countercurrents evaporation which is nil in the high arctic regions and very active in equatorial zones brings about a constant interchange of tropical and polar waters what's more i've detected those falling and rising currents that make up the ocean's true breathing i've seen a molecule of salt water heat up at the surface sink into the depths reach maximum density at minus two degrees centigrade then cool off grow lighter and rise again at the poles you'll see the consequences of this phenomenon and through this law of far-seeing nature you'll understand why water can freeze only at the surface as the captain was finishing his sentence i said to myself the pole is this brazen individual claiming he'll take us even to that location meanwhile the captain fell silent and stared at the element he had studied so thoroughly and unceasingly then going on salts he said fill the sea in considerable quantities professor and if you removed all its dissolved saline content you'd create a mass measuring four million five hundred thousand cubic leagues which if it were spread all over the globe would form a layer more than ten meters high and don't think that the presence of these salts is due merely to some whim of nature no they make ocean water less open to evaporation and prevent winds from carrying off excessive amounts of steam which when condensing would submerge the temperate zones salts play a leading role the role of stabilizer for the general ecology of the globe captain nemo stopped straightened up took a few steps along the platform and returned to me as for those billions of tiny animals he went on those infusoria that live by the millions in one droplet of water eight hundred thousand of which are needed to weigh one milligram their role is no less important they absorb the marine salts they assimilate the solid elements in the water and since they create coral and madrepores they're the true builders of limestone continents and so after they've finished depriving our water drop of its mineral nutrients the droplet gets lighter rises to the surface there absorbs more salts left behind through evaporation gets heavier sinks again and brings those tiny animals new elements to absorb the outcome a double current rising and falling constant movement constant life more intense than on land more abundant more infinite such life blooms in every part of this ocean an element fatal to man they say but vital to myriads of animals and to me when captain nemo spoke in this way he was transfigured and he filled me with extraordinary excitement there he added out there lies true existence and i can imagine the founding of nautical towns clusters of underwater households that like the nautilus would return to the surface of the sea to breathe each morning free towns if ever there were independent cities then again who knows whether some tyrant captain nemo finished his sentence with a vehement gesture then addressing me directly as if to drive away an ugly thought professor aronnax he asked me do you know the depth of the ocean floor at least captain i know what the major soundings tell us could you quote them to me so i can double check them as the need arises here i replied are a few of them that stick in my memory 
if i'm not mistaken an average depth of eight thousand two hundred meters was found in the north atlantic and two thousand five hundred meters in the mediterranean the most remarkable soundings were taken in the south atlantic near the 35th parallel and they gave twelve thousand meters fourteen thousand ninety one meters and fifteen thousand one hundred and forty nine meters all in all it's estimated that if the sea bottom were made level its average depth would be about seven kilometers well professor captain nemo replied we'll show you better than that i hope as for the average depth of this part of the pacific i'll inform you that it's a mere four thousand meters this said captain nemo headed to the hatch and disappeared down the ladder i followed him and went back to the main lounge the propeller was instantly set in motion and the log gave our speed as twenty miles per hour over the ensuing days and weeks captain nemo was very frugal with his visits i saw him only at rare intervals his chief officer regularly fixed the positions i found reported on the chart and in such a way that i could exactly plot the nautilus's course conseil and land spent the long hours with me conseil had told his friend about the wonders of our undersea stroll and the canadian was sorry he hadn't gone along but i hoped an opportunity would arise for a visit to the forests of oceana almost every day the panels in the lounge were open for some hours and our eyes never tired of probing the mysteries of the underwater world the nautilus's general heading was southeast and it stayed at a depth between one hundred and one hundred and fifty meters however from lord knows what whim one day it did a diagonal dive by means of its slanting fins reaching strata located two thousand meters under water the thermometer indicated a temperature of four point two five degrees centigrade which at this depth seemed to be a temperature common to all latitudes on november twenty sixth at three o'clock in the morning the nautilus cleared the tropic of cancer at longitude one hundred and seventy two degrees on the twenty seventh it passed in sight of the hawaiian islands where the famous captain cook met his death on february fourteenth seventeen seventy nine by then we had fared four thousand eight hundred and sixty leagues from our starting point when i arrived on the platform that morning i saw the island of hawaii two miles to leeward the largest of the seven islands making up this group i could clearly distinguish the tilled soil on its outskirts the various mountain chains running parallel with its coastline and its volcanoes crowned by mauna kea whose elevation is five thousand meters above sea level among other specimens from these waterways our nets brought up some peacock-tailed flabellarian coral polyps flattened into stylish shapes and unique to this part of the ocean the nautilus kept on its southeasterly heading on december first it cut the equator at longitude one hundred and forty two degrees and on the fourth of the same month after a quick crossing marked by no incident we raised the marquesas islands three miles off in latitude eight degrees fifty seven minutes south and longitude one hundred and thirty nine degrees thirty two minutes west i spotted martin point on nuku hiva chief member of this island group that belongs to france i could make out only its wooded mountains on the horizon because captain nemo hated to hug shore there our nets brought up some fine fish samples dolphin fish with azure fins gold tails and flesh that's unrivaled in the entire world wrasse from the genus holocomnosis that were nearly denuded of scales but exquisite in flavor knife jaws with bony beaks yellowish albacore that were as tasty as bonita all fish worth classifying in the ship's pantry after leaving these delightful islands to the protection of the french flag the nautilus covered about two thousand miles from december four to the eleventh its navigating was marked by an encounter with an immense school of squid unusual mollusks that are near neighbors of the cuttlefish french fishermen give them the name cuckold fish and they belong to the class cephalopoda family dibranchiata consisting of themselves together with cuttlefish and argonauts 
the naturalists of antiquity made a special study of them and these animals furnished many ribald figures of speech for soapbox orators in the greek marketplace as well as excellent dishes for the tables of rich citizens if we're to believe athenaeus a greek physician predating galen it was during the night of December 9, 10, that the Nautilus encountered this army of distinctly nocturnal mollusks. They numbered in the millions. They were migrating from the temperate zones toward zones still warmer, following the itineraries of herring and sardines. We stared at them through the thick glass windows. They swam backward with tremendous speed, moving by means of their locomotive tubes, chasing fish and mollusks, eating the little ones, eaten by the big ones, and tossing in indescribable confusion the ten feet that nature had rooted in their head like a hairpiece of pneumatic snakes. Despite its speed, the Nautilus navigated for several hours in the midst of this school of animals, and its nets brought up an incalculable number, among which I recognized all nine species that Professor Orbigny had classified as native to the Pacific Ocean. During this crossing, the sea continually lavished us with the most marvelous sights. Its variety was infinite. It changed its settings and decor for the mere pleasure of our eyes, and we were called upon not simply to contemplate the works of our Creator in the midst of the liquid element, but also to probe the ocean's most daunting mysteries. During the day of December 11, I was busy reading in the main lounge. Ned Land and Conseil were observing the luminous waters through the gaping panels. The Nautilus was motionless. Its ballast tanks full, it was sitting at a depth of 1,000 meters in a comparatively unpopulated region of the ocean, where only larger fish put in occasional appearances. Just then I was studying a delightful book by Jean Massé, The Servants of the Stomach, and savoring its ingenious teachings when Conseil interrupted my reading. Would Master kindly come here for an instant? He said to me in an odd voice. What is it, Conseil? It's something that Master should see. I stood up, went, leaned on my elbows before the window, and I saw it. In the broad electric daylight, an enormous black mass, quite motionless, hung suspended in the midst of the waters. I observed it carefully trying to find out the nature of this gigantic cetacean. Then a sudden thought crossed my mind. A ship! I exclaimed. Yes, the Canadian replied, a disabled craft that's sinking straight down. Ned Land was not mistaken. We were in the presence of a ship whose severed shrouds still hung from their clasps. Its hull looked in good condition, and it must have gone under only a few hours before. The stumps of three masts, chopped off two feet above the deck, indicated a flooding ship that had been forced to sacrifice its masting. But it had heeled sideways, filling completely, and it was listing to port even yet. A sorry sight, this carcass lost under the waves. But sorrier still was the sight on its deck, where, lashed with ropes to prevent their being washed overboard, some human corpses still lay. I counted four of them, four men, one still standing at the helm, then a woman, halfway out of the skylight on the afterdeck, holding a child in her arms. This woman was young. Under the brilliant lighting of the Nautilus's rays, I could make out her features, which the water hadn't yet decomposed. With a supreme effort, she had lifted her child above her head, and the poor little creature's arms were still twined around its mother's neck. The postures of the four seamen seemed ghastly to me, twisted from convulsive movements, as if making a last effort to break loose from the ropes that bound them to their ship. And the helmsman, standing alone, calmer, his face smooth and serious, his grizzled hair plastered to his brow, his hands clutching the wheel, seemed even yet to be guiding his wrecked three-master through the ocean depths. What a scene! We stood dumbstruck, hearts pounding, before this shipwreck caught in the act, as if it had been photographed in its final moments, so to speak, 
and already i could see enormous sharks moving in eyes ablaze drawn by the lure of human flesh meanwhile turning the nautilus made a circle around the sinking ship and for an instant i could read the board on its stern the florida sunderland england end of chapter 18Part 1, Chapter 19 of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, An Underwater Tour of the World by Jules Verne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Chapter 19, Vanacoro. This dreadful sight was the first of a whole series of maritime catastrophes that the Nautilus would encounter on its run. When it plied more heavily traveled seas, we often saw wrecked hulls rotting in midwater, and farther down, cannons, shells, anchors, chains, and a thousand other iron objects rusting away. Meanwhile, continuously swept along by the Nautilus, where we lived in near isolation, we raised the Tuamoto Islands on December 11th, that old, dangerous group associated with the French global navigator, Commander Bougainville. It stretches from Ducey Island to Lazareff Island over an area of 500 leagues from the east-southeast to west-northwest between latitude 13 degrees 30 minutes and 23 degrees 50 minutes south and between longitude 125 degrees 30 minutes and 151 degrees 30 minutes west. This island group covers a surface area of 370 square leagues, and it's made up of some 60 subgroups, among which we noted the Gambier group, which is a French protectorate. These islands are coral formations. Thanks to the work of polyps, a slow but steady upheaval will someday connect these islands to each other. Later on, this new island will be fused to its neighboring island groups, and a fifth continent will stretch from New Zealand and New Caledonia as far as the Marquesas Islands. The day I expounded this theory to Captain Nemo, he answered me coldly, The Earth doesn't need new continents, but new men. Sailor's luck led the Nautilus straight to Rayo Island, one of the most unusual in this group, which was discovered in 1822 by Captain Bell aboard the Minerva. So I was able to study the madreporic process that has created the islands in this ocean. Madrepores, which one must guard against confusing with precious coral, clothe their tissue in a limestone crust, and their variations in structure have led my famous mentor, Professor Milne Edwards, to classify them into five divisions. The tiny microscopic animals that secrete this polypary live by the billions in the depths of their cells. Their limestone deposits build up into rocks, reefs, islets, islands. In some places they form atolls, a circular ring surrounding a lagoon or small inner lake that gaps place in contact with the sea. Elsewhere they take the shape of barrier reefs, such as those that exist along the coasts of New Caledonia and several of the Tuamoto Islands. In still other localities, such as Reunion Island and the island of Mauritius, they build fringing reefs, high, straight walls next to which the ocean's depth is considerable. While cruising along only a few cable lengths from the underpinning of Rayo Island, I marveled at the gigantic piece of work accomplished by these microscopic laborers. These walls were the express achievements of madrepores known by the names fire coral, finger coral, star coral, and stony coral. These polyps grow exclusively in the agitated strata at the surface of the sea, and so it's in the upper reaches that they begin these substructures, which sink little by little together with the secreted rubble binding them. This, at least, is the theory of Mr. Charles Darwin, who thus explains the formation of atolls, a theory superior, in my view, to the one that says these madreporic edifices sit on the summits of mountains or volcanoes submerged a few feet below sea level. 
I could observe these strange walls quite closely. Our sounding lines indicated that they dropped perpendicularly for more than 300 meters, and our electric beams made the bright limestone positively sparkle. In reply to a question Conseil asked me about the growth rates of these colossal barriers, I thoroughly amazed him by saying that scientists put it at an eighth of an inch per biennium. Therefore, he said to me, to build these walls it took... 192,000 years, my gallant Conseil, which significantly extends the biblical days of creation. What's more, the formation of coal, in other words, the petrification of forests swallowed by floods, and the cooling of basaltic rocks likewise call for a much longer period of time. I might add that those days in the Bible must represent whole epochs, and not literally the lapse of time between two sunrises, because according to the Bible itself, the sun doesn't date from the first day of creation. When the Nautilus returned to the surface of the ocean, I could take in Rayo Island over its whole flat wooded expanse. Obviously, its madreporic rocks had been made fertile by tornadoes and thunderstorms. One day, carried off by a hurricane from neighboring shores, some seed fell onto these limestone beds, mixing with decomposed particles of fish and marine plants to form vegetable humus. Propelled by the waves, a coconut arrived on this new coast. Its germ took root. Its tree grew tall, catching steam off the water. A brook was born. Little by little, vegetation spread. Tiny animals, worms, insects rode ashore on tree trunks, snatched from the islands to windward. Turtles came to lay their eggs. Birds nested in the young trees. In this way, animal life developed, and drawn by the greenery and fertile soil, man appeared. And that's how these islands were formed, the immense achievement of microscopic animals. Near evening, Rayo Island melted into the distance, and the Nautilus noticeably changed course. After touching the Tropic of Capricorn at longitude 135 degrees, it headed west-northwest, going back up the whole intertropical zone. Although the summer sun lavished its rays on us, we never suffered from the heat, because 30 or 40 meters underwater, the temperature didn't go over 10 degrees to 12 degrees centigrade. By December 15th, we had left the alluring Society Islands in the west, likewise elegant Tahiti, Queen of the Pacific. In the morning, I spotted this island's lofty summits a few miles to leeward. Its waters supplied excellent fish for the tables on board. Mackerel, bonito, albacore, and a few varieties of that sea serpent named the moray eel. The Nautilus had cleared 8,100 miles. We logged 9,720 miles when we passed between the Tonga Islands, where crews from the Argo, Port-au-Prince, and Duke of Portland had perished, and the island group of Samoa, scene of the slaying of Captain de Langle, friend of that long-lost navigator, the Count de la Perouse. Then we raised the Fiji Islands, where savages slaughtered sailors from the Union, as well as Captain Bureau, commander of the darling Josephine out of Nantes, France. Extending over an expanse of 100 leagues north to south and over 90 leagues east to west, this island group lies between latitude 2 degrees and 6 degrees south and between longitude 174 degrees and 179 degrees west. It consists of a number of islands, islets, and reefs, among which we noted the islands of Viti Levu, Vanua Levu, and Kadavu. It was the Dutch navigator Tasman who discovered this group in 1643, the same year the Italian physicist Torricelli invented the barometer and King Louis XIV ascended the French throne. I'll let the reader decide which of these deeds was more beneficial to humanity. Coming later, Captain Cook in 1774 Rear Admiral D'Entre Casteaux in 1793, and finally Captain Dumont d'Urville in 1827, untangled the whole chaotic geography of this island group. 
the nautilus drew near whalea bay an unlucky place for england's captain dillon who was the first to shed light on the long-standing mystery surrounding the disappearance of ships under the count de la perouse this bay repeatedly dredged furnished a huge supply of excellent oysters as the roman playwright seneca recommended we opened them right at our table then stuffed ourselves these mollusks belonged to the species known by the name Austrea lamellosa, whose members are quite common off Corsica. The Wailea oyster bank must have been extensive, and for certain, if they hadn't been controlled by numerous natural checks, these clusters of shellfish would have ended up jam-packing the bay, since as many as two million eggs have been counted in a single individual and if mr ned land did not repent of his gluttony at our oyster fest it's because oysters are the only dish that never causes indigestion in fact it takes no less than sixteen dozen of these headless mollusks to supply the three hundred and fifteen grams that satisfy one man's minimum daily requirement for nitrogen on December 25th, the Nautilus navigated amid the island group of New Hebrides, which the Portuguese seafarer Queiroz discovered in 1606, which Commander Bougainville explored in 1768, and to which Captain Cook gave its current name in 1773. This group is chiefly made up of nine large islands and forms a 120-league strip from the north-northwest to the south-southeast, lying between latitude 2 degrees and 15 degrees south and between longitude 164 degrees and 168 degrees. At the moment of our noon sights, we passed fairly close to the island of Oru, which looked to me like a mass of green woods crowned by a peak of great height. That day it was Yuletide, and it struck me that Ned Land badly missed celebrating Christmas, that genuine family holiday where Protestants are such zealots. I hadn't seen Captain Nemo for over a week, when, on the morning of the 27th, he entered the main lounge, as usual acting as if he'd been gone for just five minutes. I was busy tracing the Nautilus's course on the world map. The captain approached, placed a finger over a position on the chart, and pronounced just one word. Vanacoro. This name was magic. It was the name of those islets where vessels under the Count de la Perouse had miscarried. I straightened suddenly. The Nautilus is bringing us to Vanacoro? I asked. Yes, Professor, the captain replied. And I'll be able to visit those famous islands where the compass and the astrolabe came to grief? If you like, Professor. When will we reach Vanacoro? We already have, Professor. Followed by Captain Nemo, I climbed onto the platform, and from there my eyes eagerly scanned the horizon. In the northeast there emerged two volcanic islands of unequal size, surrounded by a coral reef whose circuit measured forty miles. We were facing the island of Vanacoro proper, to which Captain Dumont d'Urville had given the name Island of the Search. We lay right in front of the little harbor of Vanna, located in latitude 16 degrees 4 minutes south and longitude 164 degrees 32 minutes east. Its shores seemed covered with greenery from its beaches to its summits inland, crowned by Mount Capogo, which is 476 fathoms high. After clearing the outer belt of rocks via a narrow passageway, the Nautilus lay inside the breakers where the sea had a depth of thirty to forty fathoms. Under the green shade of some tropical evergreens, I spotted a few savages who looked extremely startled at our approach. In this long, blackish object advancing flush with the water, didn't they see some fearsome cetacean that they were obliged to view with distrust? Just then, Captain Nemo asked me what I knew about the shipwreck of the Count de la Perouse. What everybody knows, Captain, I answered him. And could you kindly tell me what everybody knows? He asked me in a gently ironic tone. Very easily. I related to him what the final deeds of Captain Dumont d'Urville had brought to light. These described here in this heavily condensed summary of the whole matter. In 1785, the Count de la Perouse and his subordinate, Captain Lalangue, were sent by King Louis XVI of France on a voyage to circumnavigate the globe. 
they boarded two sloops of war the compass and the astrolabe which were never seen again in 1791, justly concerned about the fate of these two sloops of war, the French government fitted out two large cargo boats, the Search and the Hope, which left Brest on September 28th under orders from Rear Admiral Bruni dantre Castot. Two months later, testimony from a certain Commander Bowen aboard the Albemarle alleged that rubble from shipwrecked vessels had been seen on the coast of New Georgia. But, D'Entrecasteaux was unaware of this news, which seemed a bit dubious anyhow, and headed toward the Admiralty Islands, which had been named in a report by one Captain Hunter as the site of the Count de la Perouse's shipwreck. They looked in vain. The hope and the search passed right by Vanacoro without stopping there, and overall this voyage was plagued with misfortune, ultimately costing the lives of Rear Admiral D'Entrecasteaux, two of his subordinate officers, and several seamen from his crew. It was an old hand at the Pacific, the English adventurer Captain Peter Dillon, who was the first to pick up the trail left by castaways from the wrecked vessels. On May 15, 1824, his ship, the St. Patrick, passed by Tacopia Island, one of the New Hebrides. There, a native boatman pulled alongside in a dugout canoe and sold Dillon a silver sword hilt bearing the imprint of characters engraved with the cutting tool known as a burin. Furthermore, this native boatman claimed that during a stay in Vanacoro six years earlier, he had seen two Europeans belonging to ships that had run aground on the island's reefs many years before. Dillon guessed that the ships at issue were those under the Count de la Perouse, ships whose disappearance had shaken the entire world. He tried to reach Vanacoro, where, according to the native boatman, a good deal of rubble from the shipwreck could still be found, but winds and currents prevented his doing so. Dillon returned to Calcutta. There he was able to interest the Asiatic Society and the East India Company in his discovery. A ship named after the search was placed at his disposal, and he departed on January 23, 1827, accompanied by a French deputy. This new search, after putting in at several stops over the Pacific, dropped anchor before Vanacoro on July 7, 1827, in the same harbor of Vanna where the Nautilus was currently floating. There, Dillon collected many relics of the shipwreck, iron utensils, anchors, eyelets from pulleys, swivel guns, an 18-pound shell, the remains of some astronomical instruments, a piece of stern rail, and a bronze bell bearing the inscription made by Bazin, the foundry mark at Brest Arsenal around 1785. There could no longer be any doubt. Finishing his investigations, Dillon stayed at the site of the casualty until the month of October. Then he left Vanacoro, headed toward New Zealand, dropped anchor at Calcutta on April 7, 1828, and returned to France, where he received a very cordial welcome from King Charles X. But just then, the renowned French explorer Captain Dumont d'Urville, unaware of Dillon's activities, had already set sail to search elsewhere for the site of the shipwreck. In essence, a whaling vessel had reported that some metals and a cross of St. Louis had been found in the hands of savages in the Louisade Islands and New Caledonia. So, Captain Dumont d'Urville had put to sea in command of a vessel named after the astrolabe. And just two months after Dillon had left Vanacoro, Dumont d'Urville dropped anchor before Hobart. There he heard about Dillon's findings, and he further learned that a certain James Hobbs, chief officer on the Union out of Calcutta, had put to shore on an island located in latitude 8 degrees 18 minutes south and longitude 156 degrees 30 minutes east, and had noted the natives of those waterways making use of iron bars and red fabrics. Pretty perplexed, Dumont Urville didn't know if he should give credence to these reports, which had been carried in some of the less reliable newspapers. Nevertheless, he decided to start on Dillon's trail. On February 10, 1828, the new astrolabe hove before Tacopa Island, took on a guide and interpreter in the person of a deserter who had settled there, plied a course toward Vanacoro, raised it on February the 12th, 
sailed along its reefs until the 14th, and only on the 20th dropped anchor inside its barrier in the harbor of Vanna. On the 23rd, several officers circled the island and brought back some rubble of little importance. The natives, adopting a system of denial and evasion, refused to guide them to the site of the casualty. This rather shady conduct aroused the suspicion that the natives had mistreated the castaways, and in truth, the natives seemed afraid that Dumont d'Urville had come to avenge the Count de la Perouse and his unfortunate companions. But on the 26th, appeased with gifts and seeing that they didn't need to fear any reprisals, the natives led the chief officer, Mr. Jacquinot, to the site of the shipwreck. At this location, in three or four fathoms of water between the Payu and Vanna reefs, there lay some anchors, cannons, and ingots of iron and lead, all caked with limestone concretions. A launch and whaleboat from the new astrolabe were steered to this locality, and after going to exhausting lengths, their crews managed to dredge up an anchor weighing 1,800 pounds, a cast-iron eight-pounder cannon, a lead ingot, and two copper swivel guns. Questioning the natives, Captain Dumont Irville also learned that after La Perouse's two ships had miscarried on the island's reefs, the Count had built a smaller craft, only to go off and miscarry a second time. Where? Nobody knew. The commander of the new astrolabe then had a monument erected under a tuft of mangrove in memory of the famous navigator and his companions. It was a simple quadrangular pyramid set on a coral base, with no ironwork to tempt the natives' avarice. Then Dumont de Urville tried to depart, but his crews were run down from the fevers raging on these unsanitary shores, and quite ill himself, he was unable to weigh anchor until March 17th. Meanwhile, fearing that Dumont de Urville wasn't abreast of Dillon's activities, the French government sent a sloop of war to Vanacoro, the Bayonnaise under Commander Legorat de Tromelin who had been stationed on the American West Coast. Dropping anchor before Vanacoro a few months after the new astrolabe's departure, the Banis didn't find any additional evidence, but verified that the savages hadn't disturbed the memorial honoring the Count de la Perouse. This is the substance of the account I gave Captain Nemo. So, he said to me, the castaways built a third ship on Vanacoro Island, and to this day nobody knows where it went and perished? Nobody knows. Captain Nemo didn't reply, but signaled me to follow him to the main lounge. The Nautilus sank a few meters beneath the waves, and the panels opened. I rushed to the window and saw crusts of coral. Fungus coral, siphonula coral, alcyon coral, sea anemone from the genus Caryophylla, plus myriads of charming fish, including greenfish, damselfish, sweepers, snappers, and squirrelfish. Underneath this coral covering, I detected some rubble the old dredges hadn't been able to tear free. Iron stirrups, anchors, cannons, shells, tackle from the capstan, a stem post, all objects hailing from the wrecked ships and now carpeted in moving flowers. And as I stared at this desolate wreckage, Captain Nemo told me in a solemn voice, Commander La Perouse set out on December 7, 1785, with his ships, the compass, and the astrolabe. He dropped anchor first at Botany Bay, visited the Tonga Islands and New Caledonia, headed toward the Santa Cruz Islands, and put in at Nomuka, one of the islands in the Hapia group. Then his ships arrived at the unknown reefs of Vanacoro. Traveling in the lead, the compass ran afoul of breakers on the southerly coast. The astrolabe went to its rescue and also ran aground. The first ship was destroyed almost immediately. The second, stranded to leeward, held up for some days. The natives gave the castaways a fair enough welcome. The latter took up residence on the island and built a smaller craft with rubble from the two large ones. A few seamen stayed voluntarily in Vanacoro. The others, weak and ailing, set sail with the Count de la Perouse. They headed to the Solomon Islands, and they perished with all hands on the westerly coast of the chief island in that group, between Cape Deception and Cape Satisfaction. "'And how do you know all this?' I exclaimed." 
here's what i found at the very site of that final shipwreck captain nemo showed me a tin box stamped with the coat of arms of france and all corroded by salt water he opened it and i saw a bundle of papers yellowed but still legible they were the actual military orders given by france's minister of the navy to commander la perouse with notes along the margin in the handwriting of king louis the sixteenth ah what a splendid death for a seaman captain nemo then said a coral grave is a tranquil grave and may heaven grant that my companions and i rest in no other end of chapter nineteen Part 1, Chapter 20 of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, An Underwater Tour of the World by Jules Verne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Chapter 20, The Tories Strait. During the night of December 27-28, the Nautilus left the waterways of Venacoro behind with extraordinary speed. Its heading was southwesterly, and in three days it had cleared the 750 leagues that separated La Perusis Islands from the southeastern tip of Papua. On January 1, 1868, bright and early, Conseil joined me on the platform. Will Master, the gallant lad said to me, allow me to wish him a happy new year? Good heavens, Conseil! It's just like old times in my office at the Botanical Gardens in Paris. I accept your kind wishes, and I thank you for them. Only, I'd like to know what you mean by a happy year under the circumstances in which we're placed. Is it a year that will bring our imprisonment to an end, or a year that will see this strange voyage continue? Ye gods, Conseil replied. I hardly know what to tell, master. We're certainly seeing some unusual things, and for two months we've had no time for boredom. The latest wonder is always the most astonishing, and if this progression keeps up, I can't imagine what its climax will be. In my opinion, we'll never again have such an opportunity. Never, Conseil. Besides, Mr. Nemo really lives up to his Latin name, since he couldn't be less in the way if he didn't exist. True enough, Conseil. Therefore, with all due respect to Master, I think a happy year would be a year that lets us see everything. Everything, Conseil? No year could be that long. But what does Ned Land think about all this? Ned Land's thoughts are exactly the opposite of mine, Conseil replied. He has a practical mind and a demanding stomach. He's tired of staring at fish and eating them day in and day out. This shortage of wine, bread, and meat isn't suitable for an upstanding Anglo-Saxon, a man accustomed to beefsteak and unfazed by regular doses of brandy or gin. For my part, Conseil, that doesn't bother me in the least, and I've adjusted very nicely to the diet on board. So have I. Conseil replied. Accordingly, I think as much about staying as Mr. Land about making his escape. Thus, if this new year isn't a happy one for me, it will be for him, and vice versa. No matter what happens, one of us will be pleased. So, in conclusion, I wish Master to have whatever his heart desires. Thank you, Conseil. Only I must ask you to postpone the question of New Year's gifts and temporarily accept a hearty handshake in their place. That's all I have on me. Master has never been more generous, Conseil replied. And with that, the gallant lad went away. By January 2nd, we had fared 11,340 miles, hence 5,250 leagues, from our starting point in the seas of Japan. Before the Nautilus's spur, there stretched the dangerous waters of the Coral Sea, off the northeast coast of Australia. Our boat cruised along a few miles away from that daunting shoal, where Captain Cook's ships well-nigh miscarried on June 10, 1770. 
the craft that cook was aboard charged into some coral rock and if his vessel didn't go down it was thanks to the circumstance that a piece of coral broke off in the collision and plugged the very hole it had made in the hull i would have been deeply interested in visiting this long 360 league reef against which the ever surging sea broke with the fearsome intensity of thunderclaps but just then the nautilus's slanting fins took us to great depths and i could see nothing of those high coral walls i had to rest content with the various specimens of fish brought up by our nets among others i noted some long finned albacore a species in the genus scomber as big as tuna bluish on the flanks and streaked with crosswise stripes that disappear when the animal dies these fish followed us in schools and supplied our table with very dainty flesh we also caught a large number of yellow-green gillhead half a decimeter long and tasting like dorado plus some flying gurnards authentic underwater swallows that on dark nights alternately streak air and water with their phosphorescent glimmers among mollusks and zoophytes i found in our trawls meshes various species of alcanarian coral sea urchins hammer shells spurred star shells wentle trap snails horn shells glass snails the local flora was represented by fine floating algae sea tangle and kelp from the genus macrocystis saturated with the mucilage their pores perspire from which i selected a wonderful nemostoma gelenoroidea classifying it with the natural curiosities in the museum on january fourth two days after crossing the coral sea we raised the coast of papua on this occasion captain nemo told me that he intended to reach the indian ocean via the torres strait this was the extent of his remarks ned saw with pleasure that this course would bring us once again closer to european seas the torres strait is regarded as no less dangerous for its bristling reefs than for the savage inhabitants of its coasts it separates queensland from the huge island of papua also called new guinea papua is four hundred leagues long by one hundred and thirty leagues wide with a surface area of forty thousand geographical leagues it's located between latitude zero degrees nineteen minutes and ten degrees two minutes south and between longitude one hundred and twenty eight degrees twenty three minutes and one hundred and forty six degrees fifteen minutes at noon while the chief officer was taking the sun's altitude i spotted the summits of the arfak mountains rising in terraces and ending in sharp peaks discovered in 1511 by the portuguese francisco serrano these shores were successively visited by don jorge de menesis in 1526 by juan de grijalva in 1527 by the spanish general alvaro de saavedra in 1528 by inigo ortiz in 1545 by the Dutchman Schouten in 1616, by Nicholas Struck in 1753, by Tasman, Dampier, Fumel, Carteret, Edwards, Bougainville, Cook, McClure, and Thomas Forrest, by Rear Admiral D'Entre Casteau in 1792, by Louis Isidore Duperet in 1823, and by Captain Dumont d'Urville in 1827. It's the heartland of the blacks who occupy all Malaysia, Monsieur de Rienzi has said, and I hadn't the foggiest inkling that sailor's luck was about to bring me face to face with these daunting Andaman aborigines. So the Nautilus hove before the entrance to the world's most dangerous strait, a passageway that even the boldest navigators hesitated to clear, the strait that Louis Vaez de Torres faced on returning from the South Seas in Melanesia, a strait in which sloops of war under Captain Dumont d'Urville ran aground in 1840 and nearly miscarried with all hands, and even the Nautilus, rising superior to every danger in the sea, was about to become intimate with its coral reefs. The Torres Strait is about 34 leagues wide, but it's obstructed by an incalculable number of islands, islets, breakers, and rocks that make it nearly impossible to navigate. 
consequently captain nemo took every desired precaution in crossing it floating flush with the water the nautilus moved ahead at a moderate pace like a cetacean's tail its propeller churned the waves slowly taking advantage of this situation my two companions and i found seats on the ever deserted platform in front of us stood the pilot house and unless i'm extremely mistaken captain nemo must have been inside steering the nautilus himself under my eyes i had the excellent charts of the torres strait that had been surveyed and drawn up by the hydrographer engineer vincendant du Moulin and sub-lieutenant now admiral couvent de bois who were part of dumont d'urville's general staff during his final voyage to circumnavigate the globe these along with the efforts of captain king are the best charts for untangling the snarl of this narrow passageway and i consulted them with scrupulous care around the nautilus the sea was boiling furiously a stream of waves bearing from southeast to northwest at a speed of two and a half miles per hour broke over heads of coral emerging here and there that's one rough sea ned land told me abominable indeed i replied and hardly suitable for a craft like the nautilus that damned captain the canadian went on must really be sure of his course because if these clumps of coral so much as brush us they'll rip our hull into a thousand pieces the situation was indeed dangerous but as if by magic the nautilus seemed to glide right down the middle of these rampaging reefs it didn't follow the exact course of the zealous and the new astrolabe which had proved so ill-fated for captain dumont d'urville it went more to the north hugged the murray islands and returned to the southwest near cumberland passage i thought it was about to charge wholeheartedly into this opening but it went up to the northwest through a large number of little-known islands and islets and steered toward towned island and the bad channel i was already wondering if captain nemo rash to the point of sheer insanity wanted his ship to tackle the narrows where dumont d'urville's two sloops of war had gone aground when he changed direction a second time and cut straight to the west heading toward guiberoa island by then it was three o'clock in the afternoon the current was slacking off it was almost full tide the nautilus drew near this island which i can see to this day with its remarkable fringe of screw ponds we hugged it from less than two miles out a sudden jolt threw me down the nautilus had just struck a reef and it remained motionless listing slightly to port when i stood up i saw captain nemo and his chief officer on the platform they were examining the ship's circumstances exchanging a few words in their incomprehensible dialect here is what those circumstances entailed two miles to starboard lay guiberoa island its coastline curving north to west like an immense arm to the south and east heads of coral were already on display left uncovered by the ebbing waters we had run aground at full tide and in one of those seas whose tides are moderate an inconvenient state of affairs for floating the nautilus off however the ship hadn't suffered in any way so solidly joined was its hull but although it could neither sink nor split open it was in serious danger of being permanently attached to these reefs and that would have been the finish of captain nemo's submersible i was mulling this over when the captain approached cool and calm forever in control of himself looking neither alarmed nor annoyed an accident i said to him no an incident he answered me but an incident i replied that may oblige you to become a resident again of these shores you avoid captain nemo gave me an odd look and gestured no which told me pretty clearly that nothing would ever force him to set foot on a land mass again then he said no professor aronnax the nautilus isn't consigned to perdition it will still carry you through the midst of the ocean's wonders our voyage is just beginning and i've no desire to deprive myself so soon of the pleasure of your company 
even so captain nemo i went on ignoring his ironic turn of phrase the nautilus has run aground at a moment when the sea is full now then the tides aren't strong in the pacific and if you can't unballast the nautilus which seems impossible to me i don't see how it will float off you're right professor the pacific tides aren't strong captain nemo replied but in the torres strait one still finds a meter and a half difference in level between high and low seas today is january fourth and in five days the moon will be full now then i'll be quite astonished if that good-natured satellite doesn't sufficiently raise these masses of water and do me a favor for which i'll be forever grateful this said captain nemo went below again to the nautilus's interior followed by his chief officer as for our craft it no longer stirred staying as motionless as if these coral polyps had already walled it in with their indestructible cement well sir ned land said to me coming up after the captain's departure well ned my friend we'll serenely wait for the tide on the ninth because it seems the moon will have the good nature to float us away as simple as that as simple as that so our captain isn't going to drop his anchors put his engines on the chains and do anything to haul us off since the tide will be sufficient conseil replied simply the canadian stared at conseil then he shrugged his shoulders the seaman in him was talking now sir he answered you can trust me when i say this hunk of iron will never navigate again on the seas or under them it's only fit to be sold for its weight so i think it's time we give captain nemo the slip ned my friend i replied unlike you i haven't given up on our valiant nautilus and in four days we'll know where we stand on these pacific tides besides an escape attempt might be timely if we were in sight of the coasts of england or provence but in the waterways of papua it's another story and we'll always have that as a last resort if the nautilus doesn't right itself which i'd regard as a real calamity but couldn't we at least get the lay of the land ned went on here's an island on this island there are trees under those trees land animals loaded with cutlets and roast beef which i'd be happy to sink my teeth into in this instance our friend ned is right conseil said and i side with his views couldn't master persuade his friend captain nemo to send the three of us ashore if only so our feet don't lose the knack of treading on the solid parts of our planet i can ask him i replied but he'll refuse let master take the risk conseil said and we'll know where we stand on the captain's affability much to my surprise captain nemo gave me the permission i asked for and he did so with grace and alacrity not even exacting my promise to return on board but fleeing across the new guinea territories would be extremely dangerous and i wouldn't have advised ned land to try it better to be prisoners aboard the nautilus than to fall into the hands of papuan natives the skiff was put at our disposal for the next morning i hardly needed to ask whether captain nemo would be coming along i likewise assumed that no crewman would be assigned to us that ned land would be in sole charge of piloting the longboat besides the shore lay no more than two miles off and it would be child's play for the canadian to guide that nimble skiff through those rows of reefs so ill-fated for big ships the next day january fifth after its deck paneling was opened the skiff was wrenched from its socket and launched to sea from the top of the platform two men were sufficient for this operation the oars were inside the longboat and we had only to take our seats at eight o'clock armed with rifles and axes we pulled clear of the nautilus the sea was fairly calm a mild breeze blew from shore in place by the oars conseil and i rowed vigorously and ned steered us into the narrow lanes between the breakers the skiff handled easily and sped swiftly ned land couldn't conceal his glee he was a prisoner escaping from prison and never dreaming he would need to re-enter it meat he kept repeating now we'll eat red meat actual game a real mess call by thunder i'm not saying fish aren't good for you but we mustn't overdo em 
and a slice of fresh venison grilled over live coals will be a nice change from our standard fare you glutton conseil replied you're making my mouth water it remains to be seen i said whether these forests do contain game and if the types of game aren't of such size that they can hunt the hunter fine professor aronnax replied the canadian whose teeth seemed to be as honed as the edge of an axe but if there is no other quadruped on this island i'll eat tiger tiger sirloin our friend ned grows disturbing conseil replied whatever it is ned land went on any animal having four feet without feathers or two feet with feathers will be greeted by my very own one-gun salute oh good i replied the reckless mr land is at it again don't worry professor aronnax just keep rowing the canadian replied i only need twenty-five minutes to serve you one of my own special creations by eight thirty the nautilus's skiff had just run gently aground on a sandy strand after successfully clearing the ring of coral that surrounds guiboroa island end of chapter twenty part one chapter twenty one of twenty thousand leagues under the sea an underwater tour of the world by jules verne this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Chapter 21 Some Days Ashore Stepping ashore had an exhilarating effect on me. Ned Land tested the soil with his foot as if he were laying claim to it. Yet it had been only two months since we had become, as Captain Nemo expressed it, passengers on the Nautilus in other words the literal prisoners of its commander in a few minutes we were a gunshot away from the coast the soil was almost entirely madreporic but certain dry stream beds were strewn with granite rubble proving that this island was of primordial origin the entire horizon was hidden behind a curtain of wonderful forests enormous trees sometimes as high as two hundred feet were linked to each other by garlands of tropical creepers genuine natural hammocks that swayed in a mild breeze there were mimosas banyan trees beefwood teakwood hibiscus screw pines palm trees all mingling in wild profusion and beneath the shade of their green canopies at the feet of their gigantic trunks there grew orchids leguminous plants and ferns meanwhile ignoring all these fine specimens of papuan flora the canadian passed up the decorative in favor of the functional he spotted a coconut palm beat down some of its fruit broke them open and we drank their milk and ate their meat with a pleasure that was a protest against our standard fare on the nautilus excellent ned land said exquisite conseil replied and i don't think the canadian said that your nemo would object to us dashing a cargo of coconuts aboard his vessel i imagine not i replied but he won't want to sample them too bad for him conseil said and plenty good for us ned land shot back there'll be more left over a word of caution mr land i told the harpooner who was about to ravage another coconut palm coconuts are admirable things but before we stuff the skiff with them it would be wise to find out whether this island offers other substances just as useful some fresh vegetables would be well received in the nautilus's pantry master is right conseil replied and i propose that we set aside three places in our longboat one for fruit another for vegetables and a third for venison of which i still haven't glimpsed the tiniest specimen don't give up so easily conseil the canadian replied so let's continue our excursion i went on but keep a sharp lookout this island seems uninhabited but it still might harbor certain individuals who aren't so finicky about the sort of game they eat he he ned put in with a meaningful movement of his jaws ned oh horrors conseil exclaimed ye gods the canadian shot back i'm starting to appreciate the charms of cannibalism 
ned ned don't say that conseil answered you a cannibal why i'll no longer be safe next to you i who share your cabin does this mean i'll wake up half devoured one fine day i'm awfully fond of you conseil my friend but not enough to eat you when there's better food around then i daren't delay conseil replied the hunt is on we absolutely must bag some game to placate this man-eater or one of these mornings master won't find enough pieces of his manservant to serve him while exchanging this chit-chat we entered beneath the dark canopies of the forest and for two hours we explored it in every direction we couldn't have been luckier in our search for edible vegetation, and some of the most useful produce in the tropical zones supplied us with a valuable foodstuff missing on board. I mean the breadfruit tree, which is quite abundant on Guibaroa Island, and there I chiefly noted the seedless variety that in Malaysia is called Rima. This tree is distinguished from other trees by a straight trunk forty feet high to the naturalist's eye its graceful rounded crown formed of big multi-lobed leaves was enough to denote the arctocarpus that has been so successfully transplanted to the mascarene islands east of madagascar from its mass of greenery huge globular fruit stood out a decimeter wide and furnished on the outside with creases that assumed a hexangular pattern it's a handy plant that nature gives to regions lacking in wheat without needing to be cultivated it bears fruit eight months out of the year ned land was on familiar terms with this fruit he had already eaten it on his many voyages and knew how to cook its edible substance so the very sight of it aroused his appetite and he couldn't control himself sir he told me i'll die if i don't sample a little breadfruit pasta sample some ned my friend sample all you like we're here to conduct experiments let's conduct them it won't take a minute the canadian replied equipped with a magnifying glass he lit a fire of dead wood that was soon crackling merrily meanwhile conseil and i selected the finest arctocarpus fruit some still weren't ripe enough and their thick skins covered white slightly fibrous pulps but a great many others were yellowish and gelatinous just begging to be picked this fruit contained no pits Conseil brought a dozen of them to Ned Land, who cut them into thick slices and placed them over a fire of live coals, all the while repeating, You'll see, sir, how tasty this bread is. Especially since we've gone without baked goods for so long, Conseil said. It's more than just bread, the Canadian added. It's a dainty pastry. You've never eaten any, sir? No, Ned. All right. Get ready for something downright delectable. If you don't come back for seconds, I'm no longer the king of harpooners. After a few minutes, the parts of the fruit exposed to the fire were completely toasted. On the inside, there appeared some white pasta, a sort of soft bread center whose flavor reminded me of artichoke. This bread was excellent, I must admit, and I ate it with great pleasure. Unfortunately, I said, this pasta won't stay fresh, so it seems pointless to make a supply for on board by thunder ned land exclaimed there you go talking like a naturalist but meantime i'll be acting like a baker conseil harvest some of this fruit to take with us when we go back and how will you prepare it i asked the canadian i'll make a fermented batter from its pulp that'll keep indefinitely without spoiling when i want some i'll just cook it in the galley on board it'll have a slightly tart flavor but you'll find it excellent so mr ned i see that this bread is all we need not quite professor the canadian replied we need some fruit to go with it or at least some vegetables then let's look for fruit and vegetables when our breadfruit harvesting was done we took to the trail to complete this dry land dinner we didn't search in vain and near noontime we had an ample supply of bananas this delicious produce from the torrid zones ripens all year round and malaysians who give them the name paisang eat them without bothering to cook them in addition to bananas we gathered some enormous jackfruit with a very tangy flavor some tasty mangoes and some pineapples of unbelievable size but this foraging took up a good deal of our time which even so we had no cause to regret 
conseil kept ned under observation the harpooner walked in the lead and during his stroll through this forest he gathered with sure hands some excellent fruit that should have completed his provisions so conseil asked you have everything you need ned my friend huh the canadian put in what you're complaining all this vegetation doesn't make a meal ned replied just side dishes dessert but where's the soup course where's the roast right i said ned promised us cutlets which seems highly questionable to me sir the canadian replied our hunting not only isn't over it hasn't even started patience we're sure to end up bumping into some animal with either feathers or fur if not in this locality then in another and if not today then tomorrow because we mustn't wander too far off conseil added that's why i propose we return to the skiff what already ned exclaimed we ought to be back before nightfall i said but what hour is it then the canadian replied two o'clock at least conseil replied how time flies on solid ground exclaimed ned land with a sigh of regret off we go conseil replied so we returned through the forest and we completed our harvest by making a clean sweep of some palm cabbages that had to be picked from the crowns of their trees some small beans that i recognized as the abru of the malaysians and some high quality yams we were overloaded when we arrived at the skiff however ned land still found these provisions inadequate but fortune smiled on him just as we were boarding he spotted several trees twenty-five to thirty feet high belonging to the palm species as valuable as the actocarpus these trees are justly ranked among the most useful produce in malaysia they were sago palms vegetation that grows without being cultivated like mulberry trees they reproduce by means of shoots and seeds ned land knew how to handle these trees taking his axe and wielding it with great vigor he soon stretched out on the ground two or three sago palms whose maturity was revealed by the white dust sprinkled over their palm fronds i watched him more as a naturalist than as a man in hunger he began by removing from each trunk an inch thick strip of bark that covered a network of long hopelessly tangled fibers that were puttied with a sort of gummy flower this flower was the starch-like sago an edible substance chiefly consumed by the melanesian peoples for the time being ned land was content to chop these trunks into pieces as if he were making firewood later he would extract the flower by sifting it through cloth to separate it from its fibrous ligaments let it dry out in the sun and leave it to harden inside molds finally at five o'clock in the afternoon laden with all our treasures we left the island beach and half an hour later pulled alongside the nautilus nobody appeared on our arrival the enormous sheet-iron cylinder seemed deserted our provisions loaded on board i went below to my stateroom there i found my supper ready i ate and then fell asleep the next day january sixth nothing new on board not a sound inside not a sign of life the skiff stayed alongside in the same place we had left it we decided to return to guibaroa island ned land hoped for better luck in his hunting than on the day before and he wanted to visit a different part of the forest by sunrise we were off carried by an inbound current the longboat reached the island in a matter of moments we disembarked and thinking it best to abide by the canadian's instincts we followed ned land whose long legs threatened to outpace us ned land went westward up the coast then fording some stream beds he reached open plains that were bordered by wonderful forests some kingfishers lurked along the watercourses but they didn't let us approach their cautious behavior proved to me that these winged creatures knew where they stood on bipeds of our species and i concluded that if this island wasn't inhabited at least human beings paid it frequent visits after crossing a pretty lush prairie we arrived on the outskirts of a small wood enlivened by the singing and soaring of a large number of birds still they are merely birds conseil said but some are edible the harpooner replied wrong ned my friend conseil answered 
because I see only ordinary parrots here. Conseil, my friend, Ned replied in all seriousness, parrots are like pheasants to people with nothing else on their plates. And I might add, I said, that when these birds are properly cooked, they're at least worth a stab of the fork. Indeed, under the dense foliage of this wood, a whole host of parrots fluttered from branch to branch, needing only the proper upbringing to speak human dialects. At present, they were cackling in chorus with parakeets of every color, with solemn cockatoos that seemed to be pondering some philosophical problem, while bright red lorries passed by like pieces of bunting borne on the breeze, in the midst of kaleo parrots raucously on the wing. Papuan lorries painted the subtlest shades of azure, and a whole variety of delightful winged creatures, none terribly edible. However, one bird unique to these shores, which never passes beyond the boundaries of the Aru and Papuan Islands, was missing from this collection, but I was given a chance to marvel at it soon enough. After crossing through a moderately dense thicket, we again found some plains obstructed by bushes. There I saw some magnificent birds soaring aloft, the arrangement of their long feathers causing them to head into the wind. Their undulating flight, the grace of their aerial curves, and the play of their colors allured and delighted the eye. I had no trouble identifying them. Birds of paradise, I exclaimed. Order Passeriforma, Division Clystomora, Conseil replied. Partridge family? Ned Land asked. I doubt it, Mr. Land. Nevertheless, I'm counting on your dexterity to catch me one of these delightful representatives of tropical nature. I'll give it a try, Professor, though I'm handier with a harpoon than a rifle. Malaysians, who do a booming business in these birds with the Chinese, have various methods for catching them that we couldn't use. Sometimes they set snares on the tops of the tall trees that the bird of paradise prefers to inhabit. At other times, they capture it with a tenacious glue that paralyzes its movements. They will even go so far as to poison the springs where the fowl habitually drink. But in our case, all we could do was fire at them on the wing, which left us little chance of getting one. And in truth, we used up a good part of our ammunition in vain. Near eleven o'clock in the morning, we cleared the lower slopes of the mountains that form the island's center, and we still hadn't bagged the thing hunger spurred us on the hunters had counted on consuming the proceeds of their hunting and they had miscalculated luckily and much to his surprise conseil pulled off a right and left shot and ensured our breakfast he brought down a white pigeon and a ring dove which were briskly plucked hung from a spit and roasted over a blazing fire of dead wood while these fascinating animals were cooking ned prepared some bread from the arctocarpus then the pigeon and ring dove were devoured to the bones and declared excellent. Nutmeg, on which these birds habitually gorge themselves, sweetens their flesh and makes it delicious eating. They taste like chicken stuffed with truffles, Conseil said. All right, Ned, I asked the Canadian. Now what do you need? Game with four paws, Professor Aronnax, Ned Land replied. All these pigeons are only appetizers, snacks. So till I've bagged an animal with cutlets, I won't be happy. Nor I, Ned, until I've caught a bird of paradise. Then let's keep hunting, Conseil replied. But while heading back to the sea, we've arrived at the foothills of these mountains, and I think we'll do better if we return to the forest regions. It was good advice, and we took it. After an hour's walk, we reached a genuine sago palm forest. A few harmless snakes fled underfoot. Birds of paradise stole off at our approach, and I was in real despair of catching one, when Conseil, walking in the lead, stooped suddenly, gave a triumphant shout, and came back to me, carrying a magnificent bird of paradise. "'Oh, bravo, Conseil!' I exclaimed. "'Master is too kind,' Conseil replied. "'Not at all, my boy. That was a stroke of genius. Catching one of these live birds with your bare hands?' If Master will examine it closely, he'll see that I deserve no great praise. And why not, Conseil? Because this bird is as drunk as a lord. Drunk? Yes, Master. 
drunk from the nutmegs it was devouring under that nutmeg tree where i caught it see ned my friend see the monstrous results of intemperance damnation the canadian shot back considering the amount of gin i've had in these past two months you've got nothing to complain about meanwhile i was examining this unusual bird conseil was not mistaken tipsy from that potent juice our bird of paradise had been reduced to helplessness it was unable to fly it was barely able to walk but this didn't alarm me and i just let it sleep off its nutmeg this bird belonged to the finest of the eight species credited to papua and its neighboring islands it was a great emerald one of the rarest birds of paradise it measured three decimeters long its head was comparatively small and its eyes placed near the opening of its beak were also small but it offered a wonderful mixture of hues a yellow beak brown feet and claws hazel wings with purple tips pale yellow head and scruff of the neck emerald throat and belly and chest maroon to brown two strands made of a horn substance covered with down rose over its tail which was lengthened by long very light feathers of wonderful fineness and they completed the costume of this marvelous bird that the islanders have poetically named the sunbird how i wished i could take this superb bird of paradise back to paris to make a gift of it to the zoo at the botanical gardens which doesn't own a single live specimen so it must be a rarity or something the canadian asked in a tone of a hunter who from the viewpoint of his art gives the game a pretty low rating a great rarity my gallant comrade and above all very hard to capture alive and even after they're dead there's still a major market for these birds so the natives have figured out how to create fake ones like people create fake pearls or diamonds what conseil exclaimed they make counterfeit birds of paradise yes conseil and is master familiar with how the islanders go about it perfectly familiar during the easterly monsoon season birds of paradise lose the magnificent feathers around their tails that naturalists call below the wing feathers these feathers are gathered by the fowl forgers and skillfully fitted onto some poor previously mutilated parakeet then they paint over the suture varnish the bird and ship the fruits of their unique labors to museums and collectors in europe good enough ned land put in if it isn't the right bird it's still the right feathers and so long as the merchandise isn't meant to be eaten i see no great harm but if my desires were fulfilled by the capture of this bird of paradise those of our canadian huntsmen remained unsatisfied luckily near two o'clock ned land brought down a magnificent wild pig of the type the natives call bari outang this animal came in the nick of time for us to bag some real quadruped meat and it was warmly welcomed ned land proved himself quite gloriously with his gunshot hitched by an electric bullet the pig dropped dead on the spot the canadian properly skinned and cleaned it after removing half a dozen cutlets destined to serve as the grilled meat course of our evening meal then the hunt was on again and once more would be marked by the exploits of ned and conseil in essence beating the bushes the two friends flushed a herd of kangaroos that fled by bounding away on their elastic paws but these animals didn't flee so swiftly that our electric capsules couldn't catch up with them oh professor shouted ned land whose hunting fever had gone to his brain what excellent game especially in a stew what a supply for the nautilus two three five down and just think how we'll devour all this meat ourselves while those numbskulls on board won't get a shred in his uncontrollable glee i think the canadian might have slaughtered the whole horde if he hadn't been so busy talking but he was content with a dozen of these fascinating marsupials which made up the first order of aplacental mammals as conseil just had to tell us these animals were small in stature they were a species of those rabbit kangaroos that usually dwell in the hollows of trees and are tremendously fast but although of moderate dimensions they at least furnish a meat that's highly prized 
we were thoroughly satisfied with the results of our hunting a gleeful ned proposed that we return the next day to this magic island which he planned to depopulate of its every edible quadruped but he was reckoning without events by six o'clock in the evening we were back on the beach the skiff was aground in its usual place the nautilus looking like a long reef emerged from the waves two miles offshore without further ado ned land got down to the important business of dinner he came wonderfully to terms with its entire cooking grilling over the coals those cutlets from the barry outang soon gave off a succulent aroma that perfumed the air but i catch myself following in the canadian's footsteps look at me in ecstasy over freshly grilled pork please grant me a pardon as i've already granted one to mr land and on the same grounds in short dinner was excellent two ring doves rounded out this extraordinary menu sago pasta bread from the articarpus mangoes half a dozen pineapples and the fermented liquor from certain coconuts heightened our glee i suspect that my two fine companions weren't quite as clear-headed as one could wish what if we don't return to the nautilus this evening conseil said what if we never return to it ned land added just then a stone whizzed toward us landed at our feet and cut short the harpooner's proposition End of chapter 21part one chapter twenty two of twenty thousand leagues under the sea an underwater tour of the world by jules verne this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana chapter twenty two the lightning bolts of captain nemo without standing up we stared in the direction of the forest my hand stopping halfway to my mouth ned lands completing its assignment stones don't fall from the sky conseil said or else they deserve to be called meteorites a second well-polished stone removed a tasty ring dove leg from conseil's hand giving still greater relevance to his observation we all three stood up rifles to our shoulders ready to answer any attack apes maybe ned land exclaimed nearly conseil replied savages head for the skiff i said moving toward the sea indeed it was essential to beat a retreat because some twenty natives armed with bows and slings appeared barely a hundred paces off on the outskirts of a thicket that masked the horizon to our right the skiff was aground ten fathoms away from us the savages approached without running but they favored us with a show of the greatest hostility it was raining stones and arrows ned land was unwilling to leave his provisions behind and despite the impending danger he clutched his pig on one side his kangaroos on the other and scampered off with respectable speed in two minutes we were on the strand loading provisions and weapons into the skiff pushing it to sea and positioning its two oars were the work of an instant we hadn't gone two cable lengths when a hundred savages howling and gesticulating entered the water up to their waists i looked to see if their appearance might draw some of the nautilus's men onto the platform but no lying well out that enormous machine still seemed completely deserted twenty minutes later we boarded ship the hatches were open after mooring the skiff we re-entered the nautilus's interior i went below to the lounge from which some cords were wafting captain nemo was there leaning over the organ deep in a musical trance captain i said to him he didn't hear me captain i went on touching him with my hand he trembled and turning around ah it's you professor he said to me well did you have a happy hunt was your herb gathering a success yes captain i replied but unfortunately we've brought back a horde of bipeds whose proximity worries me what sort of bipeds savages savages captain nemo replied in an ironic tone you set foot on one of the shores of this globe professor and you're surprised to find savages there where aren't there savages 
and besides are they any worse than men elsewhere these people you call savages but captain speaking for myself sir i've encountered them everywhere well then i replied if you don't want to welcome them aboard the nautilus you'd better take some precautions easy professor no cause for alarm but there are a large number of these natives what's your count at least a hundred professor aronnax replied captain nemo whose fingers took their places again on the organ keys if every islander in papua were to gather on that beach the nautilus would still have nothing to fear from their attacks the captain's fingers then ran over the instrument's keyboard and i noticed that he touched only its black keys which gave his melodies a basically scottish color soon he had forgotten my presence and was lost in a reverie that i no longer tried to dispel i climbed onto the platform night had already fallen because in this low latitude the sun sets quickly without any twilight i could see guiboroa island only dimly but numerous fires had been kindled on the beach attesting that the natives had no thoughts of leaving it for several hours i was left to myself sometimes musing on the islanders but no longer fearing them because the captain's unflappable confidence had won me over and sometimes forgetting them to marvel at the splendors of this tropical night my memories took wing toward france in the wake of those zodiacal stars due to twinkle over it in a few hours the moon shone in the midst of the constellations at their zenith i then remembered that this loyal good-natured satellite would return to this same place the day after tomorrow to raise the tide and tear the nautilus from its coral bed near midnight seeing that all was quiet over the darkened waters as well as under the waterside trees i repaired to my cabin and fell into a peaceful sleep the night passed without mishap no doubt the papuans had been frightened off by the mere sight of this monster aground in the bay because our hatches stayed open offering easy access to the nautilus's interior at six o'clock in the morning january eighth i climbed onto the platform the morning shadows were lifting the island was soon on view through the dissolving mists first its beaches then its summits the islanders were still there in greater numbers than on the day before perhaps five hundred or six hundred of them taking advantage of the low tide some of them had moved forward over the heads of coral to within two cable lengths of the nautilus i could easily distinguish them they obviously were true papuans men of fine stock athletic in build forehead high and broad nose large but not flat teeth white their woolly red-tinted hair was in sharp contrast to their bodies which were black and glistening like those of nubians beneath their pierced distended earlobes there dangled strings of beads made from bone generally these savages were naked i noted some women among them dressed from hip to knee in grass skirts held up by belts made of vegetation some of the chieftains adorned their necks with crescents and with necklaces made from beads of red and white glass armed with bows arrows and shields nearly all of them carried from their shoulders a sort of net which held those polished stones their slings hurl with such dexterity one of these chieftains came fairly close to the nautilus examining it with care he must have been a mado of high rank because he paraded in a mat of banana leaves that had ragged edges and was accented with bright colors i could easily have picked off this islander he stood at such close range but i thought it best to wait for an actual show of hostility between europeans and savages it's acceptable for europeans to shoot back but not to attack first during this whole time of low tide the islanders lurked near the nautilus but they weren't boisterous i often heard them repeat the word assay and from their gestures i understood they were inviting me to go ashore an invitation i felt obliged to decline 
so the skiff didn't leave shipside that day much to the displeasure of mr land who couldn't complete his provisions the adroit canadian spent his time preparing the meat and flour products he had brought from guiboria island as for the savages they went back to shore near eleven o'clock in the morning when the heads of coral began to disappear under the waves of the rising tide but i saw their numbers swell considerably on the beach it was likely that they had come from neighboring islands or from the mainland of papua proper however i didn't see one local dugout canoe having nothing better to do i decided to dredge these beautiful clear waters which exhibited a profusion of shells zoophytes and open sea plants besides it was the last day the nautilus would spend in these waterways if tomorrow it still floated off to open sea as captain nemo had promised so i summoned conseil who brought me a small light dragnet similar to those used in oyster fishing what about these savages conseil asked me with all due respect to master they don't strike me as very wicked they're cannibals even so my boy a person can be both a cannibal and a decent man conseil replied just as a person can be both gluttonous and honorable the one doesn't exclude the other fine conseil and i agree that there are honorable cannibals who decently devour their prisoners however i'm opposed to being devoured even in all decency so i'll keep on my guard especially since the nautilus's commander seems to be taking no precautions and now let's get to work for two hours our fishing proceeded energetically but without bringing up any rarities our dragnet was filled with midas abalone harp shells obelisk snails and especially the finest hammer shells i had seen to that day we also gathered in a few sea cucumbers some pearl oysters and a dozen small turtles that we saved for the ship's pantry but just when i least expected it i laid my hands on a wonder a natural deformity i'd have to call it something very seldom encountered conseil had just made a cast of the dragnet and his gear had come back up loaded with a variety of fairly ordinary seashells when suddenly he saw me plunge my arms swiftly into the net pull out a shelled animal and give a conchological yell in other words the most piercing yell a human throat can produce hey what happened to master conseil asked very startled did master get bitten no my boy but i'd gladly have sacrificed a finger for such a find what find this shell i said displaying the subject of my triumph but that's simply an olive shell of the tent olive species genus oliva order pectinobranchia class gastropoda branch mollusca yes yes conseil but instead of coiling from right to left this olive shell rolls from left to right it can't be conseil exclaimed yes my boy it's a left-handed shell a left-handed shell conseil repeated his heart pounding look at its spiral oh master can trust me on this conseil said taking the valuable shell in trembling hands but never have i felt such excitement and there was good reason to be excited in fact as naturalists have ventured to observe dexterality is a well-known law of nature in their rotational and orbital movements stars and their satellites go from right to left man uses his right hand more often than his left and consequently his various instruments and equipment staircases locks watch springs etc are designed to be used in a right to left manner now then nature has generally obeyed this law in coiling her shells they're right-handed with only rare exceptions and when by chance a shell's spiral is left-handed collectors will pay its weight in gold for it so conseil and i were deep in the contemplation of our treasure and i was solemnly promising myself to enrich the paris museum with it when an ill-timed stone hurled by one of the islanders whizzed over and shattered the valuable object in conseil's hands i gave a yell of despair conseil pounced on his rifle and aimed at the savage swinging a sling just ten meters away from him i tried to stop him but his shot went off and shattered a bracelet of amulets dangling from the islander's arm conseil i shouted conseil hey what didn't master see 
that this man-eater initiated the attack a shell isn't worth a human life i told him oh the rascal conseil exclaimed i'd rather he cracked my shoulder conseil was in dead earnest but i didn't subscribe to his views however the situation had changed in only a short time and we hadn't noticed now some twenty dugout canoes were surrounding the nautilus hollowed from tree trunks these dugouts were long narrow and well designed for speed keeping their balance by means of two bamboo poles that floated on the surface of the water they were maneuvered by skillful half-naked paddlers and i viewed their advance with definite alarm it was obvious these papuans had already entered into relations with europeans and knew their ships but this long iron cylinder lying in the bay with no masts or funnels what were they to make of it nothing good because at first they kept it at a respectful distance however seeing that it stayed motionless they regained confidence little by little and tried to become more familiar with it now then it was precisely this familiarity that we needed to prevent since our weapons made no sound when they went off they would have only a moderate effect on these islanders who reputedly respect nothing but noisy mechanisms without thunderclaps lightning bolts would be much less frightening although the danger lies in the flash not the noise just then the dugout canoes drew nearer to the nautilus and a cloud of arrows burst over us fire and brimstone it's hailing conseil said and poisoned hail perhaps we've got to alert captain nemo i said re-entering the hatch i went below to the lounge i found no one there i ventured a knock at the door opening into the captain's stateroom the word enter answered me i did so and found captain nemo busy with calculations in which there was no shortage of x and other algebraic signs am i disturbing you i said out of politeness correct professor aronnax the captain answered me but i imagine you have pressing reasons for looking me up very pressing native dugout canoes are surrounding us and in a few minutes we're sure to be assaulted by several hundred savages ah captain nemo put in serenely they've come in their dugouts yes sir well sir closing the hatches should do the trick precisely and that's what i came to tell you nothing easier captain nemo said and he pressed an electric button transmitting an order to the crew's quarters there sir all under control he told me after a few moments the skiff is in place and the hatches are closed i don't imagine you're worried that these gentlemen will stave in walls that shells from your frigate couldn't breach no captain but one danger still remains what's that sir tomorrow at about this time we'll need to reopen the hatches to renew the nautilus's air no argument sir since our craft breathes in the manner favored by cetaceans but if these papuans are occupying the platform at that moment i don't see how you can prevent them from entering then sir you assume they'll board the ship i'm certain of it well sir let them come aboard i see no reason to prevent them deep down they're just poor devils these papuans and i don't want my visit to guiboroa island to cost the life of a single one of these unfortunate people on this note i was about to withdraw but captain nemo detained me and invited me to take a seat next to him he questioned me with interest on our excursions ashore and on our hunting but seemed not to understand the canadian's passionate craving for red meat then our conversation skimmed various subjects and without being more forthcoming captain nemo proved more affable among other things we came to talk of the nautilus's circumstances aground in the same strait where captain dumont d'urville had nearly miscarried then pertinent to this he was one of your great seamen the captain told me one of your shrewdest navigators that d'urville he was the frenchman's captain cook a man wise but unlucky braving the ice banks of the south pole the coral of oceania the cannibals of the pacific only to perish wretchedly in a train wreck if that energetic man was able to think about his life in its last seconds imagine what his final thoughts must have been as he spoke captain nemo seemed deeply moved an emotion i felt was to his credit then chart in hand 
we returned to the deeds of the french navigator his voyages to circumnavigate the globe his double attempt at the south pole which led to his discovery of the adelie coast and the louis philippe peninsula finally his hydrographic surveys of the chief islands in oceania what yer de urville did on the surface of the sea captain nemo told me i've done in the ocean's interior but more easily more completely than he constantly tossed about by hurricanes the zealous and the new astrolabe couldn't compare with the nautilus a quiet workroom truly at rest in the midst of the waters even so captain i said there is one major similarity between dumont d'urville's sloops of war and the nautilus what's that sir like them the nautilus has run aground the nautilus is not aground sir captain nemo replied icily the nautilus was built to rest on the ocean floor and i don't need to undertake the arduous labors the maneuvers d'urville had to attempt in order to float off his sloops of war the zealous and the new astrolabe well nigh perished but my nautilus is in no danger Tomorrow, on the day stated and at the hour stated the tide will peacefully lift it off and it will resume its navigating through the seas captain i said i don't doubt tomorrow captain nemo added standing up tomorrow at two forty in the afternoon the nautilus will float off and exit the tory strait undamaged pronouncing these words in an extremely sharp tone captain nemo gave me a curt bow this was my dismissal, and I re-entered my stateroom. There I found Conseil, who wanted to know the upshot of my interview with the captain. "'My boy,' I replied, "'when I expressed the belief that these Papuan natives were a threat to his Nautilus, the captain answered me with great irony. So I've just one thing to say to you. Have faith in him and sleep in peace.' "'Master has no need for my services?' "'No, my friend.' what's ned land up to begging master's indulgence conseil replied but our friend ned is concocting a kangaroo pie that will be the eighth wonder i was left to myself i went to bed but slept pretty poorly i kept hearing noises from the savages who were stamping on the platform and letting out deafening yells the night passed in this way without the crew ever emerging from their usual inertia they were no more disturbed by the presence of these man-eaters than soldiers in an armored fortress are troubled by ants running over the armor plate i got up at six o'clock in the morning the hatches weren't open so the air inside hadn't been renewed but the air tanks were kept full for any eventuality and would function appropriately to shoot a few cubic meters of oxygen into the nautilus's thin atmosphere I worked in my stateroom until noon without seeing Captain Nemo even for an instant. Nobody on board seemed to be making any preparations for departure. I still waited for a while, then I made my way to the main lounge. Its timepiece marked 2.30. In ten minutes the tide would reach its maximum elevation, and if Captain Nemo hadn't made a rash promise, the Nautilus would immediately break free. If not, many months might pass before we could leave its coral bed but some preliminary vibrations could soon be felt over the boat's hull i heard its plating grind against the limestone roughness of that coral base at two thirty five captain nemo appeared in the lounge we're about to depart he said ah i put in i've given orders to open the hatches what about the papuans what about them captain nemo replied with a light shrug of his shoulders won't they come inside the nautilus how will they manage that by jumping down the hatches you're about to open professor aronnax captain nemo replied serenely the nautilus's hatches aren't to be entered in that fashion even when they're open i gaped at the captain you don't understand he said to me not in the least well come along and you'll see i headed to the central companionway there very puzzled ned land and conseil watched the crewmen opening the hatches while a frightful clamor and furious shouts resounded outside 
the hatch lids fell back onto the outer plating twenty horrible faces appeared but when the first islander laid hands on the companionway railing he was flung backward by some invisible power lord knows what he ran off howling in terror and wildly prancing around ten of his companions followed him all ten met the same fate conseil was in ecstasy carried away by his violent instincts ned land leaped up the companionway but as soon as his hands seized the railing he was thrown backward in his turn damnation he exclaimed i've been struck by a lightning bolt these words explained everything to me it wasn't just a railing that led to the platform it was a metal cable fully charged with the ship's electricity anyone who touched it got the fearsome shock and such a shock would have been fatal if captain nemo had thrown the full current from his equipment into this conducting cable it could honestly be said that he had stretched between himself and his assailants a network of electricity no one could clear with impunity meanwhile crazed with terror the unhinged papuans beat a retreat as for us half laughing we massaged and comforted poor ned land who was swearing like one possessed but just then lifted off by the tide's final undulations the nautilus left its coral bed at exactly that fortieth minute pinpointed by the captain its propeller churned the waves with lazy majesty gathering speed little by little the ship navigated on the surface of the ocean and safe and sound it left behind the dangerous narrows of the tories strait end of chapter twenty two Part 1, Chapter 23 of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, An Underwater Tour of the World by Jules Verne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Chapter 23. Agri Somnia. Editor's Note, Latin for Troubled Dreams. The following day, January 10th, the Nautilus resumed its travels in mid-water, but at a remarkable speed that I estimated to be at least 35 miles per hour. The propeller was going so fast, I could neither follow nor count its revolutions. I thought about how this marvelous electric force not only gave motion, heat, and light to the Nautilus, but even protected it against outside attack transforming it into a sacred ark no profane hand could touch without being blasted my wonderment was boundless and it went from the submersible itself to the engineer who had created it we were traveling due west and on january eleven we doubled cape wessel located in longitude one thirty five degrees and latitude ten degrees north the western tip of the gulf of carpentaria reefs were still numerous but more widely scattered and were fixed on the chart with the greatest accuracy the nautilus easily avoided the money breakers to the port and the victoria reefs to starboard positioned at longitude one hundred and thirty degrees on the tenth parallel which we went along rigorously on january thirteenth arriving in the time more sea captain nemo raised the island of that name at longitude one hundred and twenty two degrees this island whose surface area measures one thousand six hundred and twenty five square leagues is governed by rajahs these aristocrats deem themselves the sons of crocodiles in other words descendants with the most exalted origins to which a human being can lay claim accordingly their scaly ancestors infest the island's rivers and are the subjects of special veneration they are sheltered nurtured flattered pampered and offered a ritual diet of nubile maidens and woe to the foreigner who lifts a finger against these sacred saurians but the nautilus wanted nothing to do with these nasty animals timor island was visible for barely an instant at noon while the chief officer determined his position i also caught only a glimpse of little roti island part of this same group whose women have a well-established reputation for beauty in the malaysian marketplace after our position fix the nautilus's latitude bearings were modulated to the southwest our prow pointed to the indian ocean 
where would captain nemo's fancies take us would he head up to the shores of asia would he pull nearer to the beaches of europe unlikely choices for a man who avoided populated areas so would he go down south would he double the cape of good hope then cape horn and push on to the antarctic pole finally would he return to the seas of the pacific where his nautilus could navigate freely and easily time would tell after cruising along the cartier hibernia seringapatam and scott reefs the solid elements last exertions against the liquid element we were beyond all sight of shore by january fourteenth the nautilus slowed down in an odd manner and very unpredictable in its ways it sometimes swam in the midst of the waters sometimes drifted on their surface during this phase of our voyage captain nemo conducted interesting experiments on the different temperatures in various strata of the sea under ordinary conditions such readings are obtained using some pretty complicated instruments whose findings are dubious to say the least whether their thermometric sounding lines whose glass often shatters under the water's pressure or those devices based on the varying resistance of metals to electric currents the results so obtained can't be adequately double-checked by contrast captain nemo would seek the sea's temperature by going himself into its depths and when he placed his thermometer in contact with the various layers of liquid he found the sought-for degree immediately and with certainty and so by loading up its ballast tanks or by sinking obliquely with its slanting fins the nautilus successively reached depths of three thousand four thousand five thousand seven thousand nine thousand and ten thousand meters and the ultimate conclusion from these experiments was that in all latitudes the sea had a permanent temperature of four point five degrees centigrade at a depth of one thousand meters i watched these experiments with the most intense fascination captain nemo brought a real passion to them i often wondered why he took these observations were they for the benefit of his fellow man it was unlikely because sooner or later his work would perish with him in some unknown sea unless he intended the results of his experiments for me but that meant this strange voyage of mine would come to an end and no such end was in sight be that as it may captain nemo also introduced me to the different data he had obtained on the relative densities of the water in our globe's chief seas from this news i derived some personal enlightenment having nothing to do with science it happened the morning of january fifteenth the captain with whom i was strolling on the platform asked me if i knew how salt water differs in density from sea to sea i said no adding that there was a lack of rigorous scientific observations on this subject i've taken such observations he told me and i can vouch for their reliability fine i replied but the nautilus lives in a separate world and the secrets of its scientists don't make their way ashore you're right professor he told me after a few moments of silence this is a separate world it's as alien to the earth as the planets accompanying our globe around the sun and we'll never become familiar with the work of scientists on saturn or jupiter but since fate has linked our two lives i can reveal the results of my observations to you i'm all attention captain you're aware professor that salt water is denser than fresh water but this density isn't uniform in essence if i represent the density of fresh water by one thousand then i find one point o two eight for the waters of the atlantic one point o two six for the waters of the pacific one point o three o for the waters of the mediterranean aha i thought so he ventures into the mediterranean one point o one eight for the waters of the ionian sea and one point o two nine for the waters of the adriatic assuredly the nautilus didn't avoid the heavily traveled seas of europe and from this insight i concluded that the ship would take us back perhaps very soon to more civilized shores i expected ned land to greet this news with unfeigned satisfaction 
for several days our work hours were spent in all sorts of experiments on the degree of salinity in waters of different depths or on their electric properties coloration and transparency and in every instance captain nemo displayed an ingenuity equaled only by his graciousness toward me then i saw no more of him for some days and again lived on board in seclusion on january sixteenth the nautilus seemed to have fallen asleep just a few meters beneath the surface of the water its electric equipment had been turned off and the motionless propeller let it ride with the waves i assumed that the crew were busy with interior repairs required by the engine's strenuous mechanical action my companions and i then witnessed an unusual sight the panels in the lounge were open and since the nautilus's beacon was off a hazy darkness reigned in the midst of the waters covered with heavy clouds the stormy sky gave only the faintest light to the ocean's upper strata i was observing the state of the sea under these conditions and even the largest fish were nothing more than ill-defined shadows when the nautilus was suddenly transferred into broad daylight at first i thought the beacon had gone back on and was casting its electric light into the liquid mass i was mistaken and after a hasty examination i discovered my error the nautilus had drifted into the midst of some phosphorescent strata which in this darkness came off as positively dazzling this effect was caused by myriads of tiny luminous animals whose brightness increased when they glided over the metal hull of our submersible in the midst of these luminous sheets of water i then glimpsed flashes of light like those seen inside a blazing furnace from streams of molten lead or from masses of metal brought to a white heat flashes so intense that certain areas of the light became shadows by comparison in a fiery setting from which every shadow would seemingly have been banished no this was no longer the calm emission of our usual lighting this light throbbed with unprecedented vigor and activity you sensed that it was alive in essence it was a cluster of countless open sea infusoria of noctiluca an eighth of an inch wide actual globules of transparent jelly equipped with a thread-like tentacle up to twenty-five thousand of which have been counted in thirty cubic centimeters of water and the power of their light was increased by those glimmers unique to medusas starfish common jellyfish angel wing clams and other phosphorescent zoophytes which were saturated with grease from organic matter decomposed by the sea and perhaps with mucus secreted by fish for several hours the nautilus drifted in this brilliant tide and our wonderment grew when we saw huge marine animals cavorting in it like the fire-dwelling salamanders of myth in the midst of these flames that didn't burn i could see swift elegant porpoises the tireless pranksters of the seas and sailfish three meters long those shrewd heralds of hurricanes whose fearsome broadswords sometimes banged against the lounge window then smaller fish appeared miscellaneous triggerfish leather jacks unicorn fish and a hundred others that left stripes on this luminous atmosphere in their course some magic lay behind this dazzling sight perhaps some atmospheric condition had intensified this phenomenon perhaps a storm had been unleashed on the surface of the waves but only a few meters down the nautilus felt no tempest's fury and the ship rocked peacefully in the midst of the calm waters and so it went some new wonder constantly delighting us conseil observed and classified his zoophytes articulates mollusks and fish the days passed quickly and i no longer kept track of them ned as usual kept looking for changes of pace from our standard fare like actual snails we were at home in our shell and i can vouch that it's easy to turn into a full-fledged snail so this way of living began to seem simple and natural to us and we no longer envisioned a different lifestyle on the surface of the planet earth when something happened to remind us of our strange circumstances on january eighteenth the nautilus lay in longitude one hundred and five degrees and latitude fifteen degrees south the weather was threatening the sea rough and billowy the wind was blowing a strong gust from the east
the barometer, which had been falling for some days, forecast an approaching struggle of the elements. I had climbed onto the platform just as the chief officer was taking his reading of our angles. Out of habit, I waited for him to pronounce his daily phrase. But that day it was replaced by a different phrase, just as incomprehensible. Almost at once I saw Captain Nemo appear, lift his spyglass, and inspect the horizon. For some minutes the captain stood motionless, rooted to the spot contained within the field of his lens. Then he lowered his spyglass and exchanged about ten words with his chief officer. The latter seemed to be in the grip of an excitement he tried in vain to control. More in command of himself, Captain Nemo remained cool. Furthermore, he seemed to be raising certain objections that his chief officer kept answering with flat assurances. At least, that's what I gathered from their differences in tone and gesture. As for me, I stared industriously in the direction under observation, but without spotting a thing. Sky and water merged into a perfectly clear horizon line. Meanwhile, Captain Nemo strolled from one end of the platform to the other, not glancing at me, perhaps not even seeing me. His step was firm, but less regular than usual. Sometimes he would stop, cross his arms over his chest, and observe the sea. What could he be looking for over that immense expanse? By then, the Nautilus lay hundreds of miles from the nearest coast. The chief officer kept lifting his spyglass and stubbornly examining the horizon, walking up and down, stamping his foot, in his nervous agitation a sharp contrast to his superior. But this mystery would inevitably be cleared up, and soon, because Captain Nemo gave orders to increase speed, at once the engine stepped up its drive power, setting the propeller in swifter rotation. Just then the chief officer drew the captain's attention anew. The latter interrupted his strolling and aimed his spyglass at the point indicated. He observed it a good while. As for me, deeply puzzled, I went below to the lounge and brought back an excellent long-range telescope I habitually used. Leaning my elbows on the beacon housing, which jutted from the stern of the platform, I got set to scour the whole stretch of sky and sea. But no sooner had I peered into the eyepiece than the instrument was snatched from my hands. I spun around. Captain Nemo was standing before me, but I almost didn't recognize him. His facial features were transfigured. Gleaming with dark fire, his eyes had shrunk beneath his frowning brow. His teeth were half bared. His rigid body, clenched fists, and head drawn down between his shoulders all attested to a fierce hate breathing from every pore. He didn't move. My spyglass fell from his hand and rolled at his feet. Had I accidentally caused these symptoms of anger? Did this incomprehensible individual think I had detected some secret forbidden to guests on the Nautilus? No, I wasn't the subject of his hate, because he wasn't even looking at me. His eyes stayed stubbornly focused on that inscrutable point of the horizon. Finally, Captain Nemo regained his self-control. His facial appearance, so profoundly changed, now resumed its usual calm. He addressed a few words to his chief officer in their strange language, then he turned to me. Professor Aranax, he told me in a tone of some urgency, I ask that you now honor one of the binding agreements between us. Which one, Captain? You and your companions must be placed in confinement until I see fit to set you free. You're in command, I answered, gaping at him. But may I address a question to you? You may not, sir. After that, I stopped objecting and started obeying, since resistance was useless. I went below to the cabin occupied by Ned Land and Conseil, and I informed them of the captain's decision. I'll let the reader decide how this news was received by the Canadian. In any case, there was no time for explanations. Four crewmen were waiting at the door, and they led us to the cell where we had spent our first night aboard the Nautilus. Ned Land tried to lodge a complaint, but the only answer he got was a door shut in his face. "'Will Master tell me what this means?' Conseil asked me. I told my companions what had happened. They were as astonished as I was, but no wiser. Then I sank into deep speculation, and Captain Nemo's strange facial seizure kept haunting me. 
i was incapable of connecting two ideas in logical order and i had strayed into the most absurd hypotheses when i was snapped out of my mental struggles by these words from ned land well look here lunch is served indeed a table had been laid apparently captain nemo had given this order at the same time he commanded the nautilus to pick up speed will master allow me to make him a recommendation conseil asked me yes my boy i replied well master needs to eat his lunch it's prudent because we have no idea what the future holds you're right conseil unfortunately ned land said they've only given us the standard menu ned my friend conseil answered what would you say if they'd given us no lunch at all this dose of sanity cut the harpooner's complaints clean off we sat down at the table our meal proceeded pretty much in silence i ate very little conseil everlastingly prudent force-fed himself and despite the menu ned land didn't waste a bite then lunch over each of us propped himself in a corner just then the luminous globe lighting our cell went out leaving us in profound darkness ned land soon dozed off and to my astonishment conseil also fell into a heavy slumber i was wondering what could have caused this urgent need for sleep when i felt a dense torpor saturate my brain i tried to keep my eyes open but they closed in spite of me i was in the grip of anguished hallucinations obviously some sleep-inducing substance had been laced into the food we had just eaten so imprisonment wasn't enough to conceal captain nemo's plans for us sleep was needed as well then i heard the hatches close the sea's undulations which had been creating a gentle rocking motion now ceased had the nautilus left the surface of the ocean was it re-entering the motionless strata deep in the sea i tried to fight off this drowsiness it was impossible my breathing grew weaker i felt a mortal chill freeze my dull nearly paralyzed limbs like little domes of lead my lids fell over my eyes i couldn't raise them a morbid sleep full of hallucinations seized my whole being then the visions disappeared and left me in utter oblivion end of chapter 23part one chapter twenty four of twenty thousand leagues under the sea an underwater tour of the world by jules verne this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana chapter twenty four the coral realm the next day i woke up with my head unusually clear much to my surprise i was in my stateroom no doubt my companions had been put back in their cabin without noticing it any more than i had like me they would have no idea what took place during the night and to unravel this mystery i could count only on some future happenstance i then considered leaving my stateroom was i free or still a prisoner perfectly free i opened my door headed down the gangways and climbed the central companionway hatches that had been closed the day before were now open i arrived on the platform ned land and conseil were there waiting for me i questioned them they knew nothing lost in a heavy sleep of which they had no memory they were quite startled to be back in their cabin as for the nautilus it seemed as tranquil and mysterious as ever it was cruising on the surface of the waves at a moderate speed nothing seemed to have changed on board ned land observed the sea with his penetrating eyes it was deserted the canadians sighted nothing new on the horizon neither sail nor shore a breeze was blowing noisily from the west and disheveled by the wind long billows made the submersible roll very noticeably after renewing its air the nautilus stayed at an average depth of fifteen meters enabling it to return quickly to the surface of the waves and contrary to custom it executed such a maneuver several times during that day of january nineteenth the chief officer would then climb onto the platform and his usual phrase would ring through the ship's interior 
as for captain nemo he didn't appear of the other men on board i saw only my emotionless steward who served me with his usual mute efficiency near two o'clock i was busy organizing my notes in the lounge when the captain opened the door and appeared i bowed to him he gave me an almost imperceptible bow in return without saying a word to me i resumed my work hoping he might give me some explanation of the previous afternoon's events he did nothing of the sort i stared at him his face looked exhausted his reddened eyes hadn't been refreshed by sleep his facial features expressed profound sadness real chagrin he walked up and down sat and stood picked up a book at random discarded it immediately consulted his instruments without taking his customary notes and seemed unable to rest easy for an instant finally he came over to me and said are you a physician professor aronnax this inquiry was so unexpected that i stared at him a good while without replying are you a physician he repeated several of your scientific colleagues took their degrees in medicine such as gatrelet monquin tandon and others that's right i said i am a doctor i used to be on call at the hospitals i was in practice for several years before joining the museum excellent sir my reply obviously pleased captain nemo but not knowing what he was driving at i waited for further questions ready to reply as circumstances dictated professor aronnax the captain said to me would you consent to give your medical attentions to one of my men someone is sick yes i'm ready to go with you come i admit that my heart was pounding lord knows why but i saw a definite connection between this sick crewman and yesterday's happenings and the mystery of those events concerned me at least as much as the man's sickness captain nemo led me to the nautilus's stern and invited me into a cabin located next to the sailors quarters on a bed there lay a man some forty years old with strongly molded features the very image of an anglo-saxon i bent over him not only was he sick he was wounded swathed in blood-soaked linen his head was resting on a folded pillow i undid the linen bandages while the wounded man gazed with great staring eyes and let me proceed without making a single complaint it was a horrible wound the cranium had been smashed open by some blunt instrument leaving the naked brains exposed and the cerebral matter had suffered deep abrasions blood clots had formed in this dissolving mass taking on the color of wine dregs both contusion and concussion of the brain had occurred the sick man's breathing was labored and muscle spasms quivered in his face cerebral inflammation was complete and had brought on a paralysis of movement and sensation i took the wounded man's pulse it was intermittent the body's extremities were already growing cold and i saw that death was approaching without any possibility of my holding it in check after dressing the poor man's wounds i redid the linen bandages around his head and i turned to captain nemo how did he get this wound i asked him that's not important the captain replied evasively the nautilus suffered a collision that cracked one of the engine levers and it struck this man my chief officer was standing beside him this man leaped forward to intercept the blow a brother lays down his life for his brother a friend for his friend what could be simpler that's the law for everyone on board the nautilus but what's your diagnosis of his condition i hesitated to speak my mind you may talk freely the captain told me this man doesn't understand french i took a last look at the wounded man then i replied this man will be dead in two hours nothing can save him nothing captain nemo clenched his fists and tears slid from his eyes which i had thought incapable of weeping 
for a few moments more i observed the dying man whose life was ebbing little by little he grew still more pale under the electric light that bathed his deathbed i looked at his intelligent head furrowed with premature wrinkles that misfortune perhaps misery had etched long before i was hoping to detect the secret of his life in the last words that might escape from his lips you may go professor aronnax captain nemo told me i left the captain in the dying man's cabin and i repaired to my stateroom very moved by this scene all day long i was a quiver with gruesome forebodings that night i slept poorly and between my fitful dreams i thought i heard a distant moaning like a funeral dirge was it a prayer for the dead murmured in that language i couldn't understand the next morning i climbed on deck captain nemo was already there as soon as he saw me he came over professor he said to me would it be convenient for you to make an underwater excursion today with my companions i asked if they're agreeable we're yours to command captain then kindly put on your diving suits as for the dead or dying man he hadn't come into the picture i rejoined ned land and conseil i informed them of the captain's proposition conseil was eager to accept and this time the canadian proved perfectly amenable to going with us it was eight o'clock in the morning by eight thirty we were suited up for this new stroll and equipped with our two devices for lighting and breathing the double door opened and accompanied by captain nemo with a dozen crewmen following we set foot on the firm sea floor where the nautilus was resting ten meters down a gentle slope gravitated to an uneven bottom whose depth was about fifteen fathoms this bottom was completely different from the one i had visited during my first excursions under the waters of the pacific ocean here i saw no fine-grained sand no underwater prairies not one open sea forest i immediately recognized the wondrous region in which captain nemo did the honors that day it was the coral realm in the zoophyte branch class alcyonaria one finds the order garganaria which contains three groups sea fans isidian polyps and coral polyps it's in this last that precious coral belongs an unusual substance that at different times has been classified in the mineral vegetable and animal kingdoms medicine to the ancients jewelry to the moderns it wasn't decisively placed in the animal kingdom until 1694 by pesanel of marseilles a coral is a unit of tiny animals assembled over a polypary that's brittle and stony in nature these polyps have a unique generating mechanism that reproduces them via the budding process and they have an individual existence while also participating in a communal life hence they embody a sort of natural socialism i was familiar with the latest research on this bizarre zoophyte which turns to stone while taking on a tree form as some naturalists have very aptly observed and nothing could have been more fascinating to me than to visit one of these petrified forests that nature has planted on the bottom of the sea we turned on our rumcorf devices and went along a coral shoal in the process of forming which given time will some day close off this whole part of the indian ocean our path was bordered by hopelessly tangled bushes formed from snarls of shrubs all covered with little star-shaped white streaked flowers only contrary to plants on shore these tree forms become attached to rocks on the seafloor by heading from top to bottom our lights produced a thousand delightful effects while playing over these brightly colored boughs i fancied i saw these cylindrical membrane filled tubes trembling beneath the water's undulations i was tempted to gather their fresh petals which were adorned with delicate tentacles some newly in bloom others barely opened while nimble fish with fluttering fins brushed past them like flocks of birds but if my hands came near the moving flowers of these sensitive lively creatures an alarm would instantly sound throughout the colony the white petals retracted in their red sheaths the flowers vanished before my eyes and the bush changed into a chunk of stony nipples sheer chance had placed me in the presence of the most valuable specimens of this zoophyte 
this coral was the equal of those fished up from the mediterranean off the barbary coast or the shores of france and italy with its bright colors it lived up to those poetic names of blood flower and blood foam that the industry confers on its finest exhibits coral sells for as much as five hundred francs per kilogram and in this locality the liquid strata hid enough to make the fortunes of a whole host of coral fishermen this valuable substance often merges with other polyparies forming compact hopelessly tangled units known as macchiota and i noted some wonderful pink samples of this coral but as the bushes shrank the tree forms magnified actual petrified thickets and long alcoves from some fantastic school of architecture kept opening up before our steps captain nemo entered beneath a dark gallery whose gentle slope took us to a depth of one hundred meters the light from our glass coils produced magical effects at times lingering on the wrinkled roughness of some natural arch or some overhang suspended like a chandelier which our lamps flecked with fiery sparks amid these shrubs of precious coral i observed other polyps no less unusual melita coral rainbow coral with jointed outgrowths then a few tufts of genus coralina some green and others red actually a type of seaweed encrusted with limestone salts which after long disputes naturalists have finally placed in the vegetable kingdom but as one intellectual has remarked here perhaps is the actual point where life rises humbly out of slumbering stone but without breaking away from its crude starting point finally after two hours of walking we reached a depth of about three hundred meters in other words the lowermost limit at which coral can begin to form but here it was no longer some isolated bush or a modest grove of low timber it was an immense forest huge mineral vegetation enormous petrified trees linked by garlands of elegant hydras from the genus plumularia those tropical creepers of the sea all decked out in shades and gleams we passed freely under their lofty boughs lost up in the shadows of the waves while at our feet organ pipe coral stony coral star coral fungus coral and sea anemone from the genus caryophilia formed a carpet of flowers all strewn with dazzling gems what an indescribable sight oh if only we could share our feelings why were we imprisoned behind these masks of metal and glass why were we forbidden to talk with each other at least let us lead the lives of the fish that populate this liquid element or better yet the lives of amphibians which can spend long hours either at sea or on shore traveling through their double domain as their whims dictate meanwhile captain nemo had called a halt my companions and i stopped walking and turning around i saw the crewmen form a semicircle around their leader looking with greater care i observed that four of them were carrying on their shoulders an object that was oblong in shape at this locality we stood in the center of a huge clearing surrounded by the tall tree forms of this underwater forest our lamps cast a sort of brilliant twilight over the area making inordinately long shadows on the sea floor past the boundaries of the clearing the darkness deepened again relieved only by little sparks given off by the sharp crests of coral ned land and conseil stood next to me we stared and it dawned on me that i was about to witness a strange scene observing the seafloor i saw that it swelled at certain points from low bulges that were encrusted with limestone deposits and arrayed with a symmetry that betrayed the hand of man in the middle of the clearing on a pedestal of roughly piled rocks there stood a cross of coral extending long arms you would have thought were made of petrified blood at a signal from captain nemo one of his men stepped forward and a few feet from this cross detached a mattock from his belt and began to dig a hole i finally understood this clearing was a cemetery this hole a grave that oblong object the body of the man who must have died during the night captain nemo and his men had come to bury their companion in this communal resting place on the inaccessible ocean floor no my mind was reeling as never before 
never had ideas of such impact raced through my brain i didn't want to see what my eyes saw meanwhile the grave digging went slowly fish fled here and there as their retreat was disturbed i heard the pick ringing on the limestone soil its iron tip sometimes giving off sparks when it hit a stray piece of flint on the sea bottom the hole grew longer wider and soon was deep enough to receive the body then the pallbearers approached wrapped in white fabric made from filaments of the fan muscle the body was lowered into its watery grave captain nemo arms crossed over his chest knelt in a posture of prayer as did all the friends of him who had loved them my two companions and i bowed reverently the grave was then covered over with the rubble dug from the seafloor and it formed a low mound when this was done captain nemo and his men stood up then they all approached the grave sank again on bended knee and extended their hands in a signal of final farewell then the funeral party went back up the path to the nautilus returning beneath the arches of the forest through the thickets along the coral bushes going steadily higher finally the ship's rays appeared their luminous trail guided us to the nautilus by one o'clock we had returned after changing clothes i climbed onto the platform and in the grip of dreadfully obsessive thoughts i sat next to the beacon captain nemo joined me i stood up and said to him so as i predicted that man died during the night yes professor aronnax captain nemo replied and now he rests beside his companions in that coral cemetery yes forgotten by the world but not by us we dig the graves then entrust the polyps with sealing away our dead for eternity and with a sudden gesture the captain hid his face in his clenched fists vainly trying to hold back a sob then he added there lies our peaceful cemetery hundreds of feet beneath the surface of the waves at least captain your dead can sleep serenely there out of reach of sharks yes sir captain nemo replied solemnly of sharks and men end of chapter 24 end of part 1